on uh, the intersection of administrative law and antitrust. Uh, and each in their own right has some interesting topics as well. So the day will be full of uh, conversations both at that intersection and then sort of respectively in administrative law and antitrust as well. Uh, we are excited that all of you are here. Uh, and with that, uh, I hand things over to my friend and colleague, Tad Lipsky. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, is the mic working? Yeah. Great. Let's begin then. Uh, as uh, Josh's brief remarks suggested, anytime you want to talk about public policy or legal issues associated with the Federal Trade Commission, we're uh, enjoying what you might call a target-rich environment. Uh, things are changing in remarkable and, in many respects, uh, totally unexpected ways. And uh, it's the subject of a lot of chatter in uh, scholarly journals and newspapers, and, uh, uh, legislative reports, and so on. So the function of this first panel is just to kind of get a lot of things out on the table and perhaps do a little bit of uh, level setting, uh, talk about some of the range of issues uh, that, uh, that need focus. And uh, of course, we have the usual uh, stellar panel. It's, uh, it's really great. Uh, to be involved in another GAI event and uh, very grateful to the uh, uh, Boyd and Gray Center, uh, uh, which has uh, become one of the real centers of excellence on, on this subject. So I'm going to very briefly introduce the panelists because uh, they, you have their biographies and the materials that are already handed out. They're probably well known to most or all of you. So uh, first is uh, sitting there on the far right, ironically, is uh, Andrew Gavel, who's a professor of law at Howard. I'm on the left University. from their perspective. <laughs> Good point, Good, excellent point. And the, uh, uh, the, uh, basically the, all I want to emphasize about Andy, other than he's the author of, uh, of uh, one of the leading antitrust uh, uh, case books, is his, his experience with the administrative uh, state and with the FTC is, uh, is quite intense and he, has served as the director of the Office of Policy and Planning. So that's a particularly noteworthy credential for today. And then we have uh, Professor Thomas Hazlitt, who is a professor of economics from Clemson University. And uh, in, uh, in that same spirit, I will say, he served as the chief economist of the Federal Communications Commission, so knows something about how an administrative uh, body uh, functions. And finally, uh, sitting right next to me is uh, Barry Nigro. Uh, and in addition to a long and distinguished career in antitrust practice, he's uh, not long since a, a stint in the Department of Justice as the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General uh, of the Antitrust Division. So uh, he knows quite a bit about antitrust. And I'm going to ask uh, Tom to start things out with some brief remarks. Uh, which uh, I have, uh, I hope will focus to some, uh, some great extent on kind of the public discussion about the fundamental economic and legal issues uh, with which we view the whole idea of antitrust and FTC as, uh, as an administrator or as an enforcer of the antitrust laws. Uh, there's been quite a bit of literature uh, about uh, concentration and economic power and and uh, how things are changing and to what those changes are attributable. So uh, Tom, take it away and build a base for us, please. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Tad. Uh, I, I just say that uh, if my performance is not up to snuff today, uh, uh, I apologize. I, I was injured uh, just uh, the other night. I probably should be on the injured reserve today, but uh, I hurt my hand. Uh, when Justin Turner struck out in the uh, L.A. San Diego <laughs> game. I'm, I'm not going to get a lot of uh, sympathy maybe from uh, Professor Wright, uh, who I know hails from San Diego, but uh, unfortunately I'm from Los Angeles. So anyway, um, it's uh, hopefully that, you know, it won't get in the way of the talk today. Uh, and I'm going to try to just do a quick uh, breezy setup. I'm the economist, and so I'll, I'll talk about some of the issues in antitrust generally. Uh, and then the lawyers take over. This is very much in fitting with tradition at uh, George Mason University Law School. Uh, so here we have, I think we have some slides. Let's see if these work. <clears throat> antitrust and flux, how things are changing. Uh, there obviously is a political demand for 
more antitrust, different antitrust. And so there's a, a lot happening. And uh, we know five reasons are right there. Uh, the rise of the large digital platforms, sometimes called GAFM, uh, really have changed the, um, the face of uh, capitalism. And so it's not unusual at times of uh, disruptive change to have a discussion about uh, whether or not the old rules work and whether or not new rules are needed. So that's the sort of just uh, to be expected. And part of this uh, technological change that comes with the uh, uh, economic disruption certainly uh, has a distinct character. Economies of scale are very important. You see this uh, deployed uh, very strategically in the marketplace. Uh, uh, there are great efficiencies, uh, both to those scale economies that are asserted and, of course, to globalization, which has had a profound impact on societies everywhere. In general, it allows uh, the U.S. Uh, marketplace to compete more head-to-head -head with many other uh, rising countries. And you see uh, uh, dramatically, in fact, that, uh, say, uh, wages uh, can be negatively impacted in a country like the U.S. and positively impacted in countries like India and China. And so this has political uh, implications. Uh, just the disruption of old industries um, with, 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 with all the pretty amazing new stuff that comes out, well, that's a threat. That's a challenge, and in fact, that will I invoke some kind of reaction in the marketplace. And so you do see this. You see it on a bipartisan uh, basis. And um, uh, one of my favorite quotes, uh, which I did insert into a piece a couple of years ago on the topic, uh, the president, uh, incoming president in uh, the United States 19, uh, tw uh, in 2016 says, <clears throat> Jeff Bez Bezos is worried about me. He thinks I would go after him for antitrust because he's got a huge antitrust problem because he's controlling so much. Uh, Trump announced uh, his model. The European Union is suing them all of the time. Well, we should be doing this. There are companies. <laughs> I always like that. Uh, it's a fairly, fairly good insight. Uh, if, if you can't sue your own companies, who can you sue? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a couple of papers on this, uh, my co-author and I, Robert Crandall, uh, and uh, one is uh, forthcoming in the Journal of Law and Economics, and then um, uh, the one I'm going to speak mostly about today uh, is uh, forthcoming in the Journal of Who Knows, <laughs> uh, which I, uh, a lot of my publications go there, by the way. Um, you, might, you might sort of characterize this conversation as uh, the, uh, the rebirth of uh, Louis Brandeis and his uh, views on antitrust. Uh, there are many uh, uh, papers that are important to read in this literature, and I'll just cite just a couple of them here. Not, um, uh, not too exciting, but I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, for, uh, for the record, say that th these are all uh, very important insights. The Pulitzer Prize winning book by Thomas McCraw. Um, actually has a couple of chapters on uh, Louis Brandeis uh, opposing the consumer welfare standard and not being impressed with price decreases. In fact, fought price decreases, came out against volume discounts, for example. And this was uh, thought to be a problem because, of course, um, he had an interest in protecting small business at the expense of efficiency. And that was made rather explicitly, and that, that view uh, actually is, is, uh, had something of a renaissance in today's environment. The question, the basic question, is U.S. antitrust policy in particular, looking at the uh, different, uh, you know, the, the, the global market, uh, is the U.S. antitrust policy too lax? Does it need to be tightened, beefed up in fairly, various dimensions? And some of the evidence uh, purporting to support this view uh, are um, the pieces of research suggesting that U.S. markets are becoming more concentrated. And uh, you see this in the uh, aforesighted uh, uh, report of the uh, uh, President of the United States, the, uh, uh, the Council of Economic Advisors, 2016. This was a theme picked up on and by The Economist in 2016, uh, who very reliably said, look at the four firm concentration ratios across the United States. The average has gone up uh, over the last uh, many uh, uh, years. Uh, to uh, from 26% to 32%, the top four firms controlling 32% of the market. Well, when you think about that, that means that there are at least nine other firms in the market uh, having no more than 8%. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of it. So, so that is a, a view of national concentration that really, I believe, is, is, is not so compelling. Uh, profit margins are up in the United States as a percentage of all economic activity. 
Um, some of this has to do certainly with the revolution just discussed. When you have uh, software platforms or uh, technological disruptions that can be um, obtained through upfront sunk investment and then amortized at a low, sometimes zero marginal cost, your profit margins do go up. You're shifting the investment to the upfront research end of things and you're shifting away from operating costs. So that's, that's the nature of that revolution. Uh, the labor share of national income in the United States has fallen over about 40 years from uh, about, uh, say, 61% uh, to 57%. So the falling labor share is thought to be a problem with this increasing concentration. The problem for that argument, again, if you look around the world, the U.S. Is actually ha has a very modest fall in uh, the share of national income going to wages. You look to countries like Australia and Japan and even the European Union, you see much more of a fall in labor share. This is a, uh, an issue in, in all the affluent countries. Uh, also, when you talk about the correlation between concentration and profits, you run smack dab into the extremely uh, important, uh, deep, and influential critique by the late Harold Demsetz that when you see that the, the industries with high profits um, uh, have high concentration, what you may be looking at is entrepreneurship. In some industries, particular firms are particularly efficient. They jump out in the lead. They garner market share, and they make high profits. That's a sign that the system is working, not that the system is restricting output and failing consumers. You see this, obviously, in many U.S. markets, Amazon being one of the obvious examples. It's picked out as a, a characterization of the problem. Well, the fact is that they've brought retailing to a new competitive level. Yes, they have concentration in the sense that they are a very large firm at the center of that industry now, retailing, an online distributor that actually has attacked bricks and mortar and driven prices down. So that's, uh, that's a different sort of uh, antitrust problem, so to speak. Finally, a lot of the big platforms are said to be buying up nascent competitors, and there's a whole list of these. Google bought Android and created, of course, their wireless uh, uh, ecosystem. Uh, Microsoft bought LinkedIn. This is actually the biggest uh, acquisition. It's uh, about number 60 in the top 100 acquisitions of all time. So it's not that high on the list, and in fact, nobody really talks about the LinkedIn monopoly or the Microsoft uh, social, uh, uh, social platform uh, monopoly. But uh, these are, uh, if you look and you go down the, the whole list, fairly innocuous, and in fact, that's what Crandall and I do in our forthcoming paper in the Journal of Law and Economics. Now, there's one uh, acquisition that's uh, also in the top 100, something like 80th um, in U.S. history, and that was uh, 2014 when Instagram was purchased by Facebook. Now, that's being relitigated by the Federal Trade Commission, so maybe that topic will come up today. Uh, there are examples where this more aggressive antitrust policy is kicked in, and uh, um, this is something I wrote uh, just last year, because the, the case that the uh, Trump administration brought against uh, the AT&T Time Warner merger uh, was not successful. The merger took place, unfortunately, for AT&T, because uh, as soon as they had the ability to uh, allegedly, as the um, uh, Depart this is a Department, of Ju uh, Department of Justice case, uh, af after they had allegedly the uh, vertical power to, uh, uh, to hurt competitors, direct competitors to the uh, uh, broadband uh, uh, distribution uh, service of AT&T, uh, they immediately found that it was not worth anything. In fact, it was worth a large negative number, and they ended up unloading Time Warner for about half of what they had paid for it just a few years before. So we've run through that. We've also had a successful policy that some people, uh, particularly states' uh, attorneys general, were uh, 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 very interested in litigating, and in fact did litigate and, and lost the case against the merger in 2019-2020. Uh, uh, T-Mobile did acquire Sprint. We went, uh, by some counts, from a four to a three. Uh, U.S. mobile market, that was supposed to be indicative of uh, excess concentration. And despite the fact that, for example, most EU companies have gone four to three already, uh, but the argument was that T-Mobile acquiring Sprint would become a much more aggressive and successful competitor against the two 
uh, leading firms, AT&T and Verizon, in the industry. And in fact, that's what's happening. So there's a very uh, successful outcome uh, thus far to the, uh, to the liberal policy. You can see this in a lot of ways, but certainly in developing 5G networks, this uh, revitalized and larger T-Mobile, which is now about the same uh, heft in terms of subscribership, and revenues as the two larger, uh, traditionally larger um, uh, carriers in the industry is uh, producing a lot uh, a better quality product than, than they would have been likely to uh, without the merger, and in fact, uh, winning the third party evaluations in terms of best 5G network. So the speed, uh, just showing the speeds and so forth here, uh, that's actually a, a feather in the cap of U.S. antitrust policy. It allowed something that a lot of the new Brandeisians would, uh, would object to, did object to, lost in court. And I think that the antitrust policy that prevailed uh, certainly has some uh, very obvious pro-consumer outcomes uh, to talk about. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks very much, Tom. That was uh, in incredibly well organized and effective. I really appreciate it. Uh, before we uh, go on uh, and pass the floor to uh, somebody else, uh, I guess I'd like to ask the panelists, the other panelists, if they want to, uh, to react uh, to anything that Tom uh, presented. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that I was really hoping uh, in, uh, that we would address and Tom has addressed is this kind of uh, uh, drumbeat that began with the Council of Economic Advisors report in 2016 uh, that came out talking about increased concentration, increased monopoly power and all the other, the profits and, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, to me, uh, it was surprising the speed with which, uh, because of various uh, sympathetic NGO reports and uh, congressional proceedings and, and other contributions by the, by the media, like the Economist article that Tom mentioned, uh, it almost seems to be accepted in the public mind that there's, that there's, uh, that there's some kind of a problem with industrial uh, competition and, and structure uh, in the United States. And uh, I don't think uh, that's a fair characterization. Uh, I, w I wonder if there's anybody on the panel who who wants to defend uh, uh, the other point of view? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll say I, I don't know that it's as accepted as people think it is. There obviously is a lot of noise out there um, calling for radical shift in antitrust policy. But uh, fortunately, the courts are continuing to apply traditional antitrust law, the way it's been applied for the last several decades. And you see that reflected in a number of the recent decisions that the agencies have been confronted with uh, at the FTC with the Jewel case and Illumina Grail and, and on the DOJ side with uh, United Healthcare Change and the Sugar case, uh, the uh, Booz Allen um, case that just came out. Uh, we're still waiting to hear on publishers. Uh, I, I'm, Personally, I'm expecting that that one may be a win for DOJ. We'll see. But, uh, but, but I think the courts are still looking to apply antitrust law the way they always have. And, and, um, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later. But one of the things that the agencies are trying to do now is you know, rewrite the guidelines. And, and, and that somehow that's going to magically uh, change the law and immediately be embraced by the courts. But one of the challenges, and I think you know, Andy um, Gavel mentioned this the other day when we were speaking, is that the courts have actually embraced the, the existing guidelines to some extent. And, um, and, 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 and that didn't happen overnight. It happened because they, um, you know, through, through an iterative process where um, uh, cases were brought and, 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 and based on the facts and the law, the courts um, uh, gradually embraced the guidelines more and more. And I, I, I can't imagine that they're just going to sort of turn on a dime and say, okay, we're, we were wrong. Uh, now that the guidelines have changed, the law must have changed and, 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 and we're off on a new path. So I, I think it's gonna be uh, much more difficult for the agencies to change law through uh, policy. Um, and, and that's because we have fundamentally a law enforcement regime, not, not a regulatory regime. And, and, uh, and, and I think that's, that's a good thing. 
Yeah. Ted, I would add that um, I, th I think it's not a binary yes or no question. I think there are degrees of acceptance of the criticism. And I think one of the challenges of our time is that um, although the loudest voices may be at sort of the extremes, everything's fine, blow everything up, um, there's a lot of disagreement uh, along the spectrum uh, and different views. And uh, two concrete examples, um, John Baker's book, uh, now almost two years ago, um, The Antitrust Paradigm, um, sort of steps away from the concentration debate and says we have a market power problem. Um, and he tries to, um, uh, in his book, he tries to document and support that, that particular view. Um, S2992 is, uh, I think, a very interesting study because that has caused a split among people that you might predict would be in agreement uh, along a spectrum. Um, uh, there are um, people you would associate with stronger antitrust enforcement who are taking the view that we do need to strengthen antitrust enforcement who are concerned about that bill. Um, I'm included in that group. Um, there are others who are um, you know, suggesting that the bill is good and we should pass the bill, it's the best we can do. But when I see that kind of split among people who usually agree with each other and who are agreeing that we need stronger antitrust enforcement, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why I think that's so um, later. Um, but I think that tells you that it's a more nuanced, complex problem than are you for or are you against the, the critique. Um, but the critique is historically interesting to me as well because the critique of the old antitrust that eventually began the process of change in the late 1970s, that, as you said, Tad, that took decades also. Um, uh, and that wasn't like an, uh, you know, a sudden departure from prior antitrust. Um, uh, so that's something I hope we'll, we'll unpack a little bit more as we go along. But I think it's important to see that um, there isn't sort of uh, a clear coalescing of views, and that's part of what's making this period complex. Andy, do you have, um, you, you don't need to answer this if you feel you don't want to, but uh, I'm curious, what is your reaction to uh, Tom's description of the way these uh, merger cases have been proceeding and coming out? I don't know if you, you follow, I, well, I assume you follow all of these cases very closely, but. Oh, very but, closely, but everyone, what, every single one. But whether you, <laughs> but I'd be curious to know if you, if you have any net reaction to kind of the, the way this, uh, this merger enforcement is going in these sectors that Tom has been describing. Um, so if I, if I had a, a blackboard, I would write the word rhetoric greater than reality. Um, and I think that that's um, a part of uh, our time right now. When you look at those cases, um, I think they both illustrate the problem and illustrate um, that there is no problem. Um, they're not especially expansive or creative. For all, uh, for all of the um, criticisms of the so-called Neo-Brandeisians, and I'd like to come back to that because I think that's a catchy title, but it's not really what Brandeis did when he was on the Supreme Court. It may have been what he said, but that's another. But these cases. Um, they're losing relatively conventional cases. There's nothing unconventional about vertical cases. There's nothing totally unconventional <coughs> about some of the cases. But the law has become very demanding. So rather than say we have a concentration problem or a market power problem, my view is we have an antitrust law problem. And the antitrust laws have drifted in a direction of increasingly high expectations of economic precision to the point where burdens of proof, use of presumptions, use of inferences has become um, problematic. And you see it in private cases, every bar that can be raised, burden of pleading, burden of production, burden of proof, class action certification, this has happened again over decades. And it represents a skepticism of antitrust, it represents a skepticism of the private right of action, a skepticism of treble damages, a skepticism of e-discovery. Um, uh, you look in a case like um, uh, Twombly and there's a big footnote about, well, that's the scary cost of discovery that leads us to raise the burden of pleading for everyone. It's a, it's a bigger picture, and I think we do have an antitrust problem 
when it becomes so difficult to win relatively easier cases. Um, so I would say to, to your question, Tad, that um, the losses I'm seeing are not because the agency is, is you know, reaching out for you know, creative, extreme, push the envelope theories. Um, they're, they're doing some of that, but they're losing even unconventional theories because the burdens are so demanding and the evidentiary expectations are so high. Seen, <laughs> couldn't resist. Could um, no, I mean we 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 we've seen <clears throat> this movie before. I mean, with hospitals back 20 years ago, the the FTC had a string of losses in hospital cases. Uh, I can't recall if it was seven, eight, or nine in a row. And and what they did is they stepped back and they said, let's do a 6B study and rethink how we're approaching hospital cases. And so they did a retrospective, got the data, the economists looked at it, worked it. And out of that case came the Evanston Northwestern uh, case that was brought in part three. Um, and following that, you know, that exercise, um, hospital merger enforcement got back on track. And, and it, I think it was a, you know, a product of the learning that occurred by sort of stepping back and, and, and looking at, are we litigating these cases the right way? And I wonder if some of that needs to happen now uh, before we throw the baby out with the bathwater and, 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 and try to address particular concerns with platforms and, 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 and the GAFM, as Tom said, uh, because I, I don't know, I, at least I'm not persuaded that antitrust law is not working with respect to the, the rest of the economy. I understand that, that, that some of the, 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 the tech platforms are, are different, They're, the economics are different, but but I'm not convinced that it's not working with the rest of the economy. And some of the cases that the agencies have lost on, when you, when you go back and look at the facts, um, you know, the, the, there's an argument that it's understandable why the judges had struggled with those cases. So I, I don't know that, that, that the, the situation with the laws is dire as dire uh, as, as, as Andy may think. Um, I, I agree that there's always room for improvement and, and that having these sorts of debates about whether the law needs to be uh, tweaked here and there, I, I think that's a healthy thing. Uh, it, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be stagnant um, and, and, and can benefit from, from, from change over time. But I, I, I'm, I'm worried a bit about the pace of the change and the, and the scope uh, of the change. I don't know that like a seismic shift is needed. I think it's worked you know, pretty well. And, 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 and we can talk separately about, you know, enforcement resources and, and, and whether the agencies, I mean, the agencies, frankly, the staffing hasn't kept pace with an inflation and, and their, their head counts are way down from where they were 20, 30 years ago. So that, that's contributing to uh, some of the challenge that they're facing. No, I think I would agree, I would agree with, with Barry in this. I would say that the, um, the rhetoric for either sinking the ship or completely turning the ship in some major way is wrong. I do think we need some course corrections. Before we leave the sort of general economic background and the, the broad context for what we're going to be talking about in the rest of the panel and the rest of the day, uh, I wanted to pose this very broad question. I think Tom primarily uh, looking for uh, your reaction, but obviously others are, are welcome. Um, I look back at uh, some figures for GDP and notice that in um, uh, the first quarter of 1980, you, the, which was when, uh, I'm sorry, 1981, forgive me, the uh, US GDP stood when Ronald Reagan was inaugurated at about three trillion dollars and the GDP of the nations, the 28 nations that ultimately comprise the European Union, pre-Brexit of course, was also about three trillion dollars. If you look at the inflation adjusted GDP figures for the first quarter of 2020, which was the last quarter before the uh, the COVID shutdowns, the uh, European countries' GDP was 15 trillion. 
So it expanded essentially by a factor of five. And in the United States, the corresponding figure, also inflation adjusted, is 21 trillion. So the US had expanded by a factor of seven. And if I could also, if you, I think you see where I'm going with this, I also would also mention that if you look down any list of the top uh, companies in the technology sector or indeed in any part of the private sector, I'm excluding things like, like uh, sovereign uh, 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 oil companies, uh, you'll, you'll find mostly U.S. companies. You'll, ha you'll have to look down a fairly long way to hit companies from Europe like um, SAP and uh, what have you. But, but my point is uh, we stand in, uh, uh, you know, uh, the U.S. antitrust policy has stood in, in marked distinction to that of the EU uh, over these uh, many years. And of course, I think it would be foolish to attribute uh, all of that or any significant part of that uh, change, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the success of the American economy compared to the EU economy. I think it'd be foolish to attribute uh, that too much to antitrust, but I can't help feeling that there's some element of that that goes into the mix. And, so Tom, you, you, if you see where I'm driving, I'd love to hear your, <laughs> I'd love to hear your, reaction, your reaction other than uh, you'd need a lot more data and a lot more thinking in order to come up with any causal link, but. Just say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, further research is needed. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, it's, it's, a, it's a point that's well taken and uh, the, um, the fact is that um, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of assertions, even by uh, you know, prominent members of the debate, um, that the U.S. is lagging behind, our you know, antitrust has fallen back, and therefore the European Union is doing much better in things like cellular and broadband. Uh, it's just not true. Uh, the U.S. markets are fairly robust. Uh, we've made some mistakes, certainly, and uh, uh, I'd be happy to give you uh, 31 Hazlett references on explaining them in some detail. But, um, you know, the uh, other markets uh, don't, don't do things perfectly either in terms of their uh, uh, policy or, or business strategies. And, um, you know, straight up like this, if you look at the high level numbers, um, you're very impressed by U.S. growth. I mean, there has been U.S. growth. It certainly led the world in terms of the entrepreneurship into the digital era. Uh, if you do um, uh, the uh, there's an annual uh, Silicon Valley report on the top 30 uh, tech firms in the world. Uh, the last one I looked at uh, was a couple of years ago, I think it was pre-COVID. Um, it was striking, the top 30 uh, most valuable tech firms in the world. Uh, no, they're not all U.S., okay? There's, I don't think, seven or eight are Chinese now. And they have, you know, certain other mechanisms for market share that uh, maybe aren't what the rest of us might apply. But the U.S. is certainly dominant. In the entire list, there is one firm based in Europe, and you probably couldn't even guess it. It's, it's uh, number 30, Spotify, <laughs> oh, Spotify. Mm. from Sweden. As we say in South Carolina, bless their heart. Okay, <laughs> so the, the Swedes got one in the top 30. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, so, um, you, you, you know, you, you go to conferences in Europe and you do have Europeans saying, how can we get more investment in research and development, more, more uh, disruptive technology, like the U.S., for example? I mean, that's what the discussion is. Then when it goes to public policy, it's all, well, the U.S. has these bad policies and we, we have our own policies, and then you get on a completely different track. And so there is, there is, a, there is a problem and a disconnect that, that needs to be uh, smoothed over, and certainly in the U.S., uh, we shouldn't have any problem sort of ferret, ferreting these things out and maybe go against the logic. Uh, if they're your companies, <laughs> you ought to spend more time suing them. Great. Well, let's, uh, let's try to transition here. Uh, I've really enjoyed this discussion about the broad background. And uh, uh, I'd like to get us to look at what, what's happening down on the killing floor. Uh, we have had so much activity at the agencies 
some of it may be lightly anticipated in the prior administration, but certainly a huge change as the personnel were replaced uh, following the last election. And Barry, I'm gonna look to you to kind of summarize, rather than make my own list, I'm gonna let you summarize what you'd like. Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I'm the practitioner on the panel and, and I'm still working for a living, so I need to be mindful of that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, uh, um, Working with the agencies now has is, is become a, a bit of a challenge. And, and uh, having recently left the Department of Justice and having served at the FTC, I have a lot of respect for the mission and, and, and understand the importance and, and agree with Jonathan Cantor that, that uh, you know, competition's critical to capitalism, but it's also critical to uh, incentivizing investment and, and taking the risk that result in getting so many companies at the top, top of the list that Tom was, was talking about. And, and, and if we aren't mindful of the um, importance of, of, of that incentive, um, you know, we're, we're, we're gonna compromise that, 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 that advantage that, that this country has when it comes to um, how we apply competition policy in order to uh, stimulate more investment and, and ultimately more, more productive output. Um, so it, it uh, you know, I think it's important how the agencies approach, approach their mission and we're sort of looking at wholesale change um, on the march at, at both agencies. We see the consumer welfare standard is under attack. Uh, there is the executive order that was discussed um, you know, that executive order, it, uh, you know, if you look back at the Sprint T-Mobile case, I mean, one of the, you know, one of the things that happened in that case that doesn't get talked about is the FCC agreed to the party's offer of a price cap. And there were no damages after that. So what's, where's the harm? How do you go in front of a judge and explain the harm? And, and a number of states tried and, and, and were unsuccessful. Uh, so I think part of the goal of the executive order, when I read it, I, I didn't really read it as talking to the FTC or the Department of Justice. I read it as speaking to the agencies. You know, you need to get in line behind the antitrust agencies and support their efforts to bring more cases. And and and, and so I think that's what what that order is is really driving at. And I think that's how it, it 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 could have an impact going forward. Then there's a desire to change the merger guidelines and. And, and combine the horizontal guidelines with the vertical guidelines, um, rewrite them. I'm, you know, the, the, there'll probably be a draft out sometime before the end of the year. I'm expecting, and I think they're going to be radically different from what we've seen in the past. So it'll be interesting to see how that how that moves forward. Um, there's, uh, I think, less value given to efficiencies, which I always viewed as a good thing. I would think we'd want to promote efficiencies. Um, there are questions as to you know, whether there's any, any merit in even investing the time and money to, to try to you know, prove your case based on efficiencies. Uh, so I, 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 it makes me wonder, well, aren't, aren't, aren't efficiencies a good thing? Aren't lower prices a good thing? I mean, if, if we're ultimately trying to benefit consumers through competition, I would think lower prices would be a good thing, but it's, it's not always clear um, what, what the objective is here. Uh, there are, um, I think, increased challenges in responding to uh, requests for information, whether they're uh, second request or, or other forms of compulsory process. Uh, that's become uh, a much more challenging exercise and, and incredibly expensive to the process. Uh, so there's a lot more friction there. Uh, the, you know, the the approach to remedies that that. that you know, we, when, you know, Macon, when he was AAG, um, you know, gave a speech, one of his first speeches preceding the challenge in AT&T Time Warner, where he raised questions about the ability to effectively police um, behavioral decrees um, and some of the challenges there. And, and uh, now we're in a world where I think the policy is we don't like remedies at all. So even straight up, divestiture remedies are, 
not necessarily acceptable in all cases, although I, I, I find it ironic because the FTC just signed off on tractor supply, which is a, a, a huge retail divestiture of 80 some stores, I think. And to the extent the remedy policy is based on concern about problems with remedies, all the problems with remedies have been focused on retail divestitures, like, like Dollar Store and Hertz and those sorts of things. So I, would, I was like, wait, we don't like remedies, but we're okay with this one. So I'm wondering, like, is the FTC have a different policy from DOJ or, you know, it, 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 we're sort of in this state where it's, it's a bit confusing as to what the agencies are okay with and what they're not okay with and why. Um, prior approvals, you know, they're, they're now, there's now a big push to put prior approvals in consent decrees. And uh, that was something that was popular the last century. Um, it, 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 the agencies got rid of it for a reason. And it, 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 you know, it's a bit concerning because it's not prior notice. Prior notice, fair enough, if, they're, if you're, you're in a market that's concentrated and you're worried about incremental acquisitions that are not reportable and you want to get some notice of that and have an opportunity to look at it because you think that, 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 that the parties are already at the line. Um, you know, that, that's fair enough. But the prior approval is just what it sounds like. It's totally up to the discretion of the agency whether to give you a thumbs up, thumbs down. There's no timeline associated with it. Um, and, you know, there have been situations in the past where prior approval applications have, have, have been sort of lost in limbo uh, for over a year. Um, one of them resulted in a criminal contempt proceeding because the parties, I, I, I think, at some point gave up. And, uh, uh, and, and, and so, you know, and what's the standard for getting prior approval? Is it a Section 7 standard? I mean, it seems to be totally up to the discretion of the agency. So the, it, it's almost like a whole other regime that's not subject to review in any way. So, you know, it, it, it uh, very different from prior notice, but, but to be expected now in any settlement that results in a decree. And there are warning letters that come out now um, on a regular basis, uh, mostly from the FTC, but, but some from Justice. And you know, people are trying to figure out well, what's the import of a warning letter, what does it mean? Um, I mean, it, it's always been true <coughs> that the agencies uh, could challenge a merger after it was consummated, even after it went through the Hart Scott Redino process. We did that with Parker Hannafin. Something was missed, it was a merger to monopoly. It was addressed, and um, the law is always allowed for that. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, there's, there's, there's a, a process. It seems that warning letters are being issued as a matter of course on, 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 on transactions, and, and it's not clear why. Uh, so parties you know, are now building into merger agreements provisions that say um, that a warning letter doesn't, that, that doesn't compromise uh, any of the closing conditions that you, know, you still have to close to, despite getting a warning letter. There was a temporary suspension of early termination that happened way back at the beginning of the administration and it, it was advertised as temporary and, and it's been over a year and a half. Um, and there's been no discussion about when it will end and why it's still needed. Um, and the thing is, early termination was at the discretion of the agencies to begin with, so it wasn't clear to me how that burdened, uh, created more burden, and it did allow the agency the ability to uh, grant early termination in situations where there were compelling reasons uh, to do so uh, due, due to things beyond the control of the parties. So that, that's no longer available. Um, the agencies are broadening the aperture on Section 2 on, on criminal enforcement. They've talked about bringing Section 2 criminal cases. It's happened in the past. It is in the statute. Um, but it's unclear sort of exactly what they have in mind and, and, and how that's going to be applied. I mean, I, I think the guidance was, we'll look at the past cases, but we're talking about some cases that are fairly dated. So, um, it, you know, some more guidance on that would be, would be welcome. And then, you know, recently, a few weeks ago, Commissioner Bedoya talked about um, 
sort of re, re, reinvigorating the Robinson Patman Act, um, which you know is still alive and well in and, and, and their private Robinson Patman cases. And I think there's some Robinson Patman lawyers out there. I don't know many. And I, I still remember from when I was young looking at Robinson Patman issues and writing memos to clients and, and, and all of that. But, but for the past 20 years, it's really not been of any interest to the agencies. They kind of reached the conclusion that it, it on balance, did more harm than good. So, um, but, but, but it's on the books, and, and, and there are private actions here and there. So it looks like that's something that, 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 that uh, um, firms need to you know, keep you know, keep on, on uh, be more sensitive to, because uh, you know, at some point, I think the agencies are going to be more active there. So, so there's a lot, you know, it, it seems like there's a lot that's happening, and it's all happening at once, and it's, uh, you know, if you go to the websites of the agencies and try to find things, like, like, like the antitrust division manual, it's not there. <laughs> uh, so, it, at least it wasn't when I looked a week ago. Maybe it's there right now. I don't know. But uh, um, so, so we're in this sort of transitional period where um, you know th th there's an effort to make this seismic shift in enforcement and and and, and to use sort of the regulatory machinery to um, change the law and change how it's applied. Uh, and 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 as I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, so far the courts have, you know, been skeptical of some of the recent cases and fairness. Um, you know, some of those Jonathan, uh, you know, had just landed. He hasn't he hasn't even been in this position a year. Um, it's I think it was confirmed in mid November, and so he's coming up on a year. But I, I do <coughs> think that that both the FTC and and the Department of Justice are, are going to you know be climbing a steep hill. Uh, in order to sort of implement some of the policies that they've articulated. And even at the FTC's, um, you know, administrative law judge, Judge Chappell, who's been there for a long, long time and where they frequently prevail, um, they've lost two cases in a row in front of Judge Chappell. So even, even the ALJ at the FTC is, you know, asking questions about some of the, some of the cases that have been brought, so. Well, I'm... Uh, Andy's looking at me because he knows my next question is for him, which is, uh, let, let me put it this way, Andy. Uh, based on this very uh, cogent and complete list that, uh, of, of what's been going on with uh, merger policy, and particularly FTC, and merger practice and procedure and speechifying, uh, I don't think it would be too unfair to say that the FTC, at least, just doesn't like transactions. It just doesn't like corporate acquisitions and wants to discourage them any way it can through hostile changes and substantive, uh, substantive rules, through this long list of little petty procedural changes that are, I suppose, although I don't want to prejudice anybody's lawsuit if they want to challenge them, but I suppose, like, for example, eliminating, uh, you know, making a practice of not granting early terminations is, or, or, or this business about sending you a letter saying, well, we know your waiting period is about to expire, but, but you, you know, don't read anything into that. Uh, it, it's, it seems like uh, that's kind of the, the net net is the, is that they just don't like transactions and are gonna discourage them in any way that's, uh, that's available. And I guess, Part one of the question is, do you agree with that? And part two is, uh, you know, if you do, is that a great idea? Do you support it or something else? Sure. Um, so changing business as usual is disruptive. And lawyers who have practiced in a similar way for a long time view it as disruptive. Clients view it as disruptive. I'm not going to um, go through the list and, and try to, you know, defend or, or um, uh, or oppose any, any of those measures. But I will say this, in 1982 when the new merger guidelines came out, um, the antitrust bar was, was pretty kind of scratching their head, mystified by the hypothetical monopolist test. Um, they wondered about the HHI. 
change faces resistance. And it took a long time. As late as 1990 in Baker Hughes, the DC circuit was saying, we don't, uh, we don't know where you got this entry stuff in your guidelines from, but that's not what the law is. So let's not forget little historical context. Change is difficult. And change when you're trying to ramp up enforcement is a lot more difficult than when you're trying to ramp down. So another difference, I was going to talk about this a little bit later, 1981 versus 2022. Um, uh, there is clearly messages that they're trying to send. And again, I'm not going to defend every little procedural thing that they've done. Um, how they go about it um, concerns me as well. But it is harder to do. It, like I said, if you really think the ship is headed in the wrong direction, and what you want to do is ramp up enforcement. It takes time to develop cases. It takes time to develop new guidelines and theories. Um, uh, and we are not very far into this administration. Um, uh, remember that you know, it was 1984 in the Reagan administration before you started getting this real push with amicus briefs in the Supreme Court that year. Um, in a series of important cases, Jefferson Parish, Copperweld, NCAA, um, where the government really started to have an, an impact on the Supreme Court. These things take time. Um, and so, um, you know, I'll, I'll say flat out, I want the FTC to succeed. I think that we are better off with it than without it. I want Lena Khan to succeed. Um, am I concerned about some of these procedural things? Yes. Um, I actually had a couple of questions for, for Barry. Um, but we are clearly still in a very early period. And it's disruptive for clients and for practicing lawyers when you're being told something very different. And I think Barry's right. There is a message of we're concerned about transactions. They're being very explicit about that. That merger policy has been too permissive, and we want to send a message of a higher level of scrutiny. Whether they're doing it in the best way, I think we could, you know, we could debate that. Um, uh, but I think that they are as clear in their message as Bill Baxter was in saying we're headed in a different direction now. And there was resistance to some of the specifics back then. Um, if I can, I wanted to ask Barry one specific question, which is whether or not he thinks clearance is, is more, less important, less consequential, the same. Um, are you seeing that becoming an issue for, for parties? <clears throat> it's it's, it's uh, ongoing debate, you know, clearance, and sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. So you've got the, 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 the sort of friction and uncertainty associated with it. So that, that's one issue. But um, are you asking whether it matters which agency you're at? Uh, yeah, whether, whether your perception is that because, do, do you really see um, the FTC and the DOJ as um, moving in the identical direction, or are there differences that you think make clearance more consequential than it was before this administration? I think that in some respects it can be consequential, and part of that is related to um, resource constraints. Uh, it also um, I do think there are some differences in how the agencies are approaching merger enforcement. So, you know, I don't know that the tractor supply <laughs> consent decree would get through DOJ right now. Um, but it seemed to have gotten through FTC. There have been a number of consent decree, divestiture uh, decrees coming out of the FTC. I, last time I checked, I don't think there's been a single one out of the DOJ since Jonathan arrived. So, um, you know, there have been deals that have gone through. There have been deals that had uh, divestitures associated with them or were coincident with the deal going through, but no consent decrees. So there are some differences on the margins, and I think whether it matters depends on your particular deal, the industry, and how you think, you know, where you think there, if, if there are issues where you think they are and, and how the agencies will, will deal with them. Because I, I, I think it's going to be very fact specific as to whether you prefer to be at one agency or the other right now. Um. One, one thing I wondered is, um, 
when you're going to the FTC, it's almost like you have multiple constituencies that you have to be prepared to address. And there, there may be you know, divisions between where staff is and it's unclear. It's a different relationship between staff and, and the leadership. Um, how you approach the different commissioners, um, how you approach the ALJ if you've got a part three proceeding, how you prepare a record for the court if what you're doing is kind of giving up and thinking, we're just, you know, they got the three votes, we're gonna lose. Seems to me that that's one of the complications right now is it's almost like you're dealing simultaneously with multiple constituencies. Yeah, there's less of that on the DOJ side, partly yeah. because of just structural reasons. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, there's one decision maker and, and I think Jonathan's assembled a strong litigation team and he, you know, he's, he's been doing this a long time. I practiced with him for a number of years and uh, he, you know, he knows what he's doing. So he's, you know, he, he, and he's got a very strong team. So I, you know, I agree with you that, that uh, it's still early and I, I think his uh, last political spot, I might be wrong about this, but was, I don't know if he has any, any others here or there, but, but was just recently filled. I mean, and Michael Cadis, who used to be at the FTC, mm -hmm. I worked with Mike um, when I was there. Uh, he, he just uh, joined as a deputy not too long ago. Uh, Andy Foreman <coughs> also uh, recently joined. Andy's been with, you know, worked with Jonathan since he was back in 2000 at Freed Frank. So it, it uh, I, I think he's got a very good team, and from what I can tell, they're working well together. And I expect that, um, you know, that some of the challenges that they're facing with the courts, that that's going to, you know, that's going to turn around at, at, at some point, um, you know, given the quality of the litigators that they have and and and, and Jonathan's vision. Um, so I, you know, while, while they. They're, they're dealing with some challenges now. I, I don't think that's the way this is gonna play out long run. But, but you know, institutionally, the FTC is structured very differently with the Bureau and the commissioners. It's, it's uh, you know, at the staff level, both agencies pretty much operate the same. It's what happens after that and where, where the differences um, can, make, can, can be consequential. Tom, I know uh, economists uh, rarely concern themselves with these grubby little details that the lawyers <laughs> are forced to confront, but did, did you have any comment on this part of the conversation? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, More research is needed. <laughs> More research is needed. Uh, yeah, it, it does remind me though that in the, I mentioned the T-Mobile case, I was one of the experts retained. There were a large number of uh, economists retained in the, by the merging parties and I was um, I, I was one of them, uh, but at any rate, uh, I wanted to make that disclosure. Congratulations, well done. <laughs> I'd like to uh, uh, shift the ground now and uh, in the concluding uh, time that we have left, uh, in, in addition to the possibility of audience questions toward the end, uh, as to which I'm not sure what the uh, procedure is, but I do want to kind of uh, uh, introduce an additional degree of freedom to what we're thinking about in the sense that so far I think we've been talking about the development of the Commission and the Commission's antitrust policy within the framework of, the, of existing law and practice and how it's being changed here at least in the short run and starting to think about the long run but of course uh, everybody's aware that there are these uh, massive dramatic proposals pending in Congress for all kinds of changes to antitrust law. Uh, everything from repealing or overruling every Supreme Court case uh, since General Dynamics uh, to uh, you know, changing the uh, merger standard under Section 7 of the Clayton Act. And uh, I'd like to uh, turn the mic over to uh, Andy who's going to describe a little bit about what the world uh, might look like uh, if you consider these uh, broader proposals and maybe talk about the kinds of changes outside our current box that, that would seem advisable. Sure, thank you. Um, so I wanted to start um, this segment by going back to something I alluded to earlier, 2022 versus 1981. Um, um, 
Jonathan Cantor has, has used the word inflection point in, uh, well, that's two words. He's used the words <laughs> inflection point uh, a couple of times in some of his speeches. And so I'd like to start this segment by asking, are we at an inflection point? Um, uh, are we at a point where things are really going to move in a very different direction long term? Um, understanding, as I said earlier, that I think that that's a process that takes time. But is this moment conducive to that kind of change? And I want to draw a little bit of a compare and contrast with um, uh, 1981. So one thing that was really true in 1981 was that there were really at that point decades of criticism of many of the leading antitrust cases, especially the antitrust cases in the 1960s. Um, there is criticism today, um, but it's not decades of criticism and it's not as deep. Um, uh, it, it's, it's in a sense, it's a still forming criticism, but um, Tom reviewed some of it um, uh, and it's being debated, but it still seems like the criticism, the critique of the current law is in relatively earlier stages, but I, as I said earlier, I would count myself in the group of saying I'm not happy with the current state of antitrust law. I think it has drifted in a direction of being far too demanding. But what about the rest of it? Political winds were changing in 1981 in a major way. Um, the Supreme Court had changed in a major way that made it much more receptive to change by the late 70s, even before uh, the Reagan administration took office and into the 1980s. But you had the four Nixon appointees, you had Stevens. Um, uh, the court was a very different court that was receptive to the message. Um, I wrote an article many years ago about Powell's role in Sylvania and Monsanto and I asked one of his clerks if he would characterize Powell as a Chicagoan, and he said, no, not at all, but the Chicago critique resonated with him as a business lawyer. Um, so is this court receptive to the kind of change um, uh, that is being promoted for more progressive antitrust? Um, not really a rhetorical question, because we all know the answer is no. <laughs> um, there was a durable effort there was eight years of the Reagan administration, as we talked about before. They saw, they saw the opening in cases like Sylvania and broadcast music. And even National Society of Professional Engineers, which was a plaintiff's win, but it really emphasized the role of competitive effect. And Sylvania and BMI were emphasizing the role of efficiency. By the way, none of those cases used the phrase consumer welfare. Um, uh, and that's, that's a kind of a separate discussion, but I think that that's a little bit of mixed up conventional wisdom. It's not until Brook Group that a majority decision uses consumer welfare in the way that um, uh, Bork intended it and associated it with um, uh, higher output, lower prices. That's Brook Group. It appears in some dissents before that, and it famously appears in Reader versus Sonotone in 1979, but that's a case about Section 4 of the Clayton Act and consumer injury. Um, uh, and they pluck the quote from Bork from a year earlier and say, well, of course, consumers who pay high prices, by the way, for <coughs> resale price maintenance, which is what that case involved, um, are injured in their business or property. So the, the period of change is long. There were decades of criticism, decades of changes, a receptive court, a change in the political atmosphere, and they were ramping down instead of ramping up. Is that where we are in 2022? And that brings me to the, you know, answering Tad's question about our last segment. Are we really poised for a big change? Are we as an, an, at an inflection point? And I talk about um, sort of two examples to say, I'm skeptical that we're there, even if I think things should change, but I'm skeptical about this sort of big change of direction. Um, the first is the merger guidelines, and, and um, I think as Barry mentioned, we, in our prep call, we were talking about what's different today about changing the merger guidelines. Um, the formal view of merger guidelines since 1968 has always been that they're just about enforcement policy. They're not about the law. They're not about burdens of proof. Um, and, and yet, the success of the guidelines has changed that. Because when you start looking, especially at district court decisions, where the guidelines have been urged as, as more than just guidelines. They have been written into law. Courts use the HHIs. Courts use burden shifting. And they talk about 
market definition, and they talk about market shares, and they use the HHIs, and they, they use the hypothetical monopolist test. The agencies have been using it when they go into court. Are they still trying to use Philadelphia National Bank? Yes, but there's a whole lot more to what's happening in the courts. And so I think at this moment, if we want to ask, is there an inflection point? Can the agencies just announce new guidelines that look more like the 68 guidelines? I think they're going to face uh, a different kind of challenge in doing that, given that the guidelines' success has gotten them written into law. The second point, and I know this is one of the main goals of, of today's conference, is to talk about rulemaking. Um, and regardless of where you come out on whether the FTC has authority for competition rulemaking, MAGMOS, consumer protection rulemaking, some combination, I think that what we're seeing is kind of hybrid rulemaking using the MAGMOS procedures, but including provisions that are justified on competition grounds. Regardless of where you come out on that, this is a particularly inopportune time given cases like AMG Capital, given cases like EPA, um, the West Virginia versus EPA, to be pressing for broader administrative authority. And I know this is gonna be the discussion most of the rest of the day, and so we wanted to set it up a little bit. Um, but it gets to my point of, are we at an inflection point? Um, well, in terms of that, looking at the administrative decisions of the 1970s versus where the court is today, um, I think there's going to be a lot of skepticism, and that's going to be a harder path to go, um, uh, given where the courts are. And so you come around to the big question, I think um, Bill Kovacic will be talking about this. What does a program look like today? If you do want to change the law, if you do want to move in a direction, where do you put your resources? Um, uh, what are the most um, uh, you know, receptive pathways to change if you want that? Um, are we going to get legislation? Right now it's not looking much like legislation. Um, I'd be happy to talk about why I oppose um, uh, so-called ICOA, but the two bills that are getting the most attention are ICOA and the horrible idea that we should let um, save journalism by allowing cartels. <laughs> um, and I find myself, you know, as I said, I believe that we need more progressive antitrust it's uncomfortable for me to say that I don't really like either of those bills. I think they're based on bad bipartisanship, if there is such a thing. Um, uh, the, the interests behind those are, are very troubling to me. So with that, I will invite opening up for more questions about our final segment here. Yeah, well, Andy, you, you always disappoint me when you make so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> but. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just ask the other panelists uh, to react to what's been said, and maybe if you have your own views on all of this legislation that's uh, running around and whether anything is likely to come of it or anything should come of it. And if, if I could just very briefly inject one other uh, facet of the uh, legislative discussion. you know. The, uh, uh, it seems to me a lot of the, of the heat and motion in the antitrust uh, area is generated by the impact of, of GAFAM, the, the, really it was Tom's opening theme. And, and uh, so we have this uh, kind of split that's emerged. We have a number of uh, proposed general revisions to the antitrust statutes, uh, all of which strike me as very bad ideas. Uh, but then you have a, a number of other proposals that are essentially narrowly targeted on perhaps the issues associated with the digital platforms and the GAFAMs and, uh, and so forth. And uh, if, you, if uh, Tom or Barry want to react, if you could comment on this whole notion that maybe, maybe what's really going on here is we're about to give rise, uh, give, give birth to a new specialized uh, regulatory approach to some of the problems of the digital platform. So, so let me turn it to one of you. Volunteers I'm, accepted. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on the legislation. It, uh, I, I haven't read it from front to back or, or studied it in detail, but any time uh, legislation that is, is being passed that, that's as significant as that, it, it makes me a little bit nervous, um, anxious, uh, because you know, the implications may not be fully understood, and, 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 and my general sense is that they haven't been fully studied. Um, that's not to say that there isn't room 
to, to make improvements. So if there are concerns about tech companies acquiring nascent competitors and that that is, you know, if that's a unique uh, an issue that requires special attention and, 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 and you want to make sure that those types of transactions get reviewed by the agencies, you know, maybe take a look at what Germany's done with their lowering the thresholds on tech companies. And, and you know, let's look and see if that's worked over there. Has that helped or hurt? You know, and, and you know, maybe there's room to, to make some adjustments to deal with some of the unique circumstances associated with uh, uh, tech acquisitions. Uh, but, you know, on balance, I, I you know, even, even if you believe that, that there's room for improvement, um, you know, some of that can come through uh, thoughtful enforcement and maybe doing something like the FTC did with the hospitals back in the 6B study, using that more to, to, to make sure that, that, that the decisions are considered and based on, 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 on uh, you know, data where you can actually see where, what were the price effects in particular circumstances and, and, and you know, were there deals that went through that should have been, you know, should have been challenged. Because um, you know, the agencies aren't perfect. They're trying to sort of base enforcement that's supposed to be forward looking, but always relying on historical information because that's what the courts demand. And, and I don't know how you, you know, it's hard to get around that. We use economists sometimes to do it, but you have the you know, competing economists and then the judges kind of throw up their hands and, and uh, not sure who's right or who's wrong because it you know, sometimes is, is over everybody's head. Uh, you know, so I, you know, I, I'm supportive of a more incremental approach to addressing some of the concerns. I'm worried about spillover from passing legislation that seems to be driven by the big tech companies, the GAFAMs, um, that, that, that will necessarily you know, have an impact that's much broader and, and, and could, you know, could be detrimental in some cases. So maybe, 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 it, maybe it's good, maybe it's not, but I, I'm not, I haven't seen anything to persuade me that, 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 uh, that it necessarily makes good, make, makes sense for you know, the, the, the entire economy. Tom, just before you, uh, I turn the floor over to you, I just wanted to, to, to jump in uh, on one point. Uh, Barry, you, you, made the, uh, you, you made the observation that, that, that this thing, that these legislative proposals has not, have not been especially well vetted. And I think that it, I believe it is still true to say, and if it is, it's really something that deserves a lot of emphasis the, the Sherman Act, the critical provisions of the Sherman Act, the key language of the substantive prohibitions, has basically been untouched since 1890. There have been procedural changes, remedial changes, and of course, you know, the practice and the, the fines and, and class actions, that's all evolved. But the substantive provisions are now exactly as they were in 1890. All of the, I believe it's true to say that, that, that none of the current legislative proposals has been the subject of a legislative hearing. There have been informational hearings where people were brought in to complain about the conduct of this, of this firm or the conduct of that firm. There have been markups, but other than that, there has never been the traditional process of proposing specific legislation, putting it in front of experts and panels uh, subject to questioning. And the idea that you would change such a major basic law that has been viewed as adequate for that length of time, essentially you change it in the back room, uh, just kind of uh, surprises and disappoints me. And uh, it's something that I think an aspect of the legislative process, of this legislative process, that uh, deserves more recognition and attention. So that's my two cents. Tom, take it away. Um, thanks. Yeah, there's, there are a lot of wild swings being taken now, uh, not just <laughs> on the baseball field. Uh, and, um, you know, you see, uh, you know, stylized facts develop. Uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the argument against Amazon that's uh, driven so much of this thinking. Uh, 
that they're uh, self-preferencing and uh, they've, they've created this magnificent uh, retail platform, but now that they're, they're, they're moving out the third-party vendors, uh, you just look at the simple data. Uh, Amazon started <clears throat> uh, in 97, 98 uh, at 100% Amazon product. They weren't a manufacturer, but they contracted and they sold Amazon products. Uh, today, they're, they're about 36% Amazon in terms of uh, the actual uh, retail sales. Uh, they are a third-party platform, and that's how uh, Amazon has uh, reaped enormous profits, uh, that plus uh, integration, obviously, into the cloud. And um, it's become a platform for independent competitors to Amazon. That's, that's what the market is telling us. Those third-party vendors go to Amazon. By the way, they could go to eBay, where there is no self-preferencing. And eBay was much larger to start with. Now they're much smaller. <clears throat> they can go to Shopify, <clears throat> by the way, which is a Canadian firm, and it is in the top 30. Um, uh, so uh, you know, when, when you're Europe and you're behind Canada in the top 30, that's, that's something. Uh, the digital regulator idea, I mean, this comes out of the Stigler Report, the University of Chicago, uh, the idea that there should be a new specific industry oversight. Um, this, this goes right in the face of what, what we've learned about rent-seeking and capture, and I, I do want to mention, um, and, uh, you know, um, Andy makes, uh, makes a good point about the, you know, the 1980s weren't obviously a vacuum, and you had, you had a run-up, you had particularly the 1970s, came right before the 80s. Uh, if memory serves, <laughs> and um, you had the deregulation wave of the 1970s, and that was, of course, uh, really not a Chicago phenomenon, and in fact, one of the key players, uh, Fred Kahn, uh, born and died a, a very loyal New Deal Democrat, and this was a learning process. Uh, we saw uh, the behavior of the Interstate Commerce Commission, uh, the Civil Aeronautics Board, uh, these, these uh, government uh, cartel enforcement agencies. And uh, we were able to, to understand, uh, after some lag, what the problem was there and how consumer welfare would be served by moving past that, loosening markets, uh, allowing uh, open competition, <clears throat> eventually abolishing both agencies. And the, and the results have been uh, nothing short of phenomenal. Um, envir environmental uh, aspects of, of, of those deregulations or agency uh, phase out, so to speak, were, were very pronounced as well. Anyway, we, we, you know, when you talk about major reforms in antitrust and you have bills, uh, for example, to try to make it harder for platforms to acquire nascent competitors, well, if you actually look at the, the amount of merger activity amongst these uh, GAF and platforms, it's very, very small as a, 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 in comparison to other tech firms or the, uh, the market as a whole, adjusting for size and, and, and life of the a life of the firms, and the actual examples given as problems. Uh, we, this is what uh, Crandall and I do in our uh, uh, 2022 paper. Um, and, um, you know, one, one of the standard examples is Android. Google acquires Android in 2005. Android is a um, startup, has no actual software platform, has no services and no revenues, had six or seven employees, but uh, Google, thinking ahead about what might happen before the iPhone is released, uh, buys this nub of a competitor. The idea is now, with the legislation you're talking about, driving reform possibly, that this was anti-competitive. That if, you, if Google hadn't gotten in there and bought Android, Android would be a major independent platform, not tied with any other large digital platform. It's entirely fanciful. In fact, Apple comes in in 2007 with its uh, iconic consumer innovation of the iPhone. They introduce the App Store. The following year, they create this great ecosystem. Uh, great's a technical term. And uh, it, 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 it takes the market by storm. In, uh, it, it wipes out the existing uh, competitors in that market, uh, Rim, Blackberry on the one side. <coughs> and uh, Nokia, Symbian, with their software, Symbian, uh, Symbian software platform on the other. And um, Apple's off to the races only to see the rise of Android, i.e. Google, come and, and offer a, um, another great competitor in that space. Now, it was clearly pro-competitive to have Google be able to buy this uh, software and develop it and make it what we call Android today, nothing 
even remotely similar to what it was. And that platform outcompeted, for example, Microsoft. Microsoft made a big run. In fact, in 2005, uh, the big software for mobile phones was Microsoft, mobile Microsoft, my, uh, my, uh, mobile Windows. And uh, Microsoft integrated, they bought uh, Nokia Symbian, which was the leading smartphone platform uh, prior to the iPhone. Microsoft integrates, does what Microsoft does, tries to make it its own platform. Within a couple of years, they're writing off about uh, $8 billion in losses because they couldn't compete with Apple or Google. Okay, so the idea that there was a simple pathway that we can look back and see for this startup Android to be its own independent platform is entirely uncompelling. It was very pro-competitive to allow that sale, that transaction in hindsight. And this is an example. These are the cherry-picked examples. If you go through the whole list, you'll find that there isn't a lot that's more compelling. In fact, in the Android, uh, thing, uh, the Android-Google uh, uh, merger. Uh, so we have to be very careful about these wild swings. Uh, and uh, if you simply examine some of the assertions made in support of the new measures, you'll be, uh, I believe, underwhelmed. Barry, did you re reaction, Andy? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Um, is that your phone buzzing? No, this is my phone. <laughs> I'm getting a call now. Um, <laughs> let, let's just take S2992 and you know, talk about, I want to pick up on some of the um, important things, many important things Tom said. First of all, the bill is kind of an admixture of law enforcement and regulation. So it's, it's a little different in that sense. The provisions look very regulatory. But both agencies and all of the state attorneys general would be authorized to enforce it. Um, that should give us pause um, as to what it might actually produce, because it won't produce uh, a, a coherent um, uh, regulatory scheme. Um, maybe that helps to break down the danger of capture, but in kind of a weird way, given the likelihood that you're going to have very, very different priorities in that group of enforcers as to why to bring a case and what is self-preferencing and, uh, and so forth. Second is, uh, unlike any antitrust bill that I know of um, uh, previously, it is targeted by design at a small group of firms. Um, I don't like that. I think that it would be a mistake to have a bill that's based on market capitalization when everybody knows it's going to be limited to a small group of firms. And that's why it's bipartisan. Well, duh, we should all have some cause for concern when there's agreement about let's get these guys, because the reasons for getting those guys are different across the aisle. Um, and put that together with the um, penalties, which are based on the entire size of the enterprise, not anything calibrated to any actual violation. Put it in the hands of a lot of different people, um, and I think you have a really bad precedent brewing for how we should be doing competition policy. Um, final point I would make about that bill is there's absolutely no concession. This goes, I, I forget who said it, but about the original House report that sort of became the basis for the bill. Um, there's no concession to any consumer value that these companies have delivered. There's no concession to their growth as a result of success and consumer value that they've delivered. There's, there's no concession to the possibility that the, what's being described as discriminatory or self-preferencing was the function of a, a very long-term uh, trail of consumer choices um, uh, for particular kinds of products. Put that all together, and I think it's just a, a bad precedent. And going forward, I would hope there would be some humility on the part of um, some of the folks uh, supporting it about the precedent it sets for future bills targeted at specific companies that are being disfavored by various groups of, of for basically political reasons. Um, so I don't think we need to get beyond that um, uh, to really be concerned about the intended for some and unintended consequences of, of that particular bill. Um, it is not a good idea for antitrust. Does that mean that there's no need for reform? No. Um, I think there were other bills that were 
um, uh, were more open to the general applicable approach of the Sherman and Clayton Act to let's change standards applicable to all firms. And the last thing I would say about that is um, I don't think when you get to the conceptual level, I don't think you can protect all of the rest of the economy from the conceptual um, viewpoint in that bill. Um, uh, what will self-preferencing mean and what will the private bar do with it for other firms? And surely there are firms of smaller overall capital size that actually are larger in particular markets that would fall outside that bill. Um, uh, but the, the thought process for the offenses, the way they're defined, um, will appear, and merger guidelines are not going to be just for the tech firms. Concepts of nation competition, concepts of uh, efficiency for better or worse, if these things change, they will change for everyone. They will change for um, all firms. And so um, I think it's also a mistake to sort of dismiss this, um, uh, this bill as just, a, you know, it's not our problem. It's just about big tech, and they should worry about it, but it's not going to affect us. Um, as a precedent and in terms of its content and theories, it will affect um, many different things, as will new merger guidelines. I, look, I'm worried about getting rid of self-preferencing because every time I go to the grocery store, I buy the generic brand and my wife hates it. And, but, but that's what I like to buy. So if, 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 if it's going to go away, it's going to go away. I mean, we've had self-preferencing for decades in the grocery stores. What's, I, I don't understand. It's, I, I kind of like it. No, the bill's going to apply to you, Barry. You've been expressing <laughs> your self-preference. We have just a very short period of time before. Did you have a question? Or? I have a question. I, moderator's privilege. I get one. OK. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to, I think, direct it at Andy. I think I'm going to direct it at, at Andy and, and Barry, but I, I know from experience I will not be able to stop Tom from answering. Um, we'll let you go the, first. <laughs> the, you know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to run a revolution, you got to win some cases, right? You got you to put some points on the board if you're going to have a revolution or even an inflection point. They're, they're, not, they're not doing that. They're o they're o for a lot uh, on the merger front in, per in particular. And I think... Um, it's pretty interesting because the win rate for the agencies sort of historically, last administration, the administration before that, the administration before that, um, 85 plus at the FTC, upwards of 90 at, at, at points, uh, and, and OFER doesn't, doesn't get you there or, or, or sort of even, even close. I think both uh, Andy and Barry sort of tucked in maybe some hypotheses about what is going on, and, and correct me if, I, if, I, if I'm wrong, but you can think about a bunch of reasons why they're now 04 a, a lot. Um, Barry suggested maybe at the DOJ that will turn around and they've got, they've got sort of good, good personnel, but you can imagine changes in personnel. Maybe it's just random and the, the win rate will sort of jump back up to, to 90, though I'm a, I'm a skeptic. Um, but you know, personnel changes, um, changes in the in the law, I think I heard you suggest, Andy, but I don't know of one on the Section 7 standard that would explain the change between last administration. I mean, it's a dramatic change, and maybe maybe there's something you've got in mind, or there's, there's sort of some other things uh, going on. Could be wild theories. You read the complaints; the theories don't look wild. Could be the gap between the evidence mustered uh, uh, that you can put in front of the court and what's in, in the complaint. But if you just look at the win rates compared to history, um, I, I think it's a really interesting point. I mean, you've got this ambitious agenda, which you guys have sort of uh, done the, 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 the work of discussing sort of all, all corners of it. Why are they losing all their cases? Um, so I think I, I'd start with what I think they would say about that historic win rate, which is that it shows how timid the agencies have been. Um, if you're winning at this high, high rate, it means you're not really trying to push the envelope. You're, you're bringing safe cases. And we know that they, they've said that. So that's their view. We could debate whether that's a valid view, an invalid view. But certainly, if you're losing everything, you go to the other extreme, there, there are some bad signs there. 
So I think one important <coughs> question is what, what characteristics do these cases that both agencies have lost, what characteristics do they have in common? Uh, is it really a pushing the envelope? As I said earlier, I'm not so sure that it's really pushing the envelope. So what is it? Is it bad preparation? Is it you know, weak evidence? Is it bad case selection? Um, what is that? It is still early. Um, uh, you know, if their thinking is, ah, we're, sh we're showing Congress we need legislative change, um, that's a hell of a way to run into a, a wall. Um, uh, Solzhenitsyn once wrote a book called The Ram That Butted the Oak. Um, I don't think it's a good model for <laughs> antitrust agencies in the U.S. Um, good for a dissident, not for... Um, so um, I, I, I share your concern. I want to know, like, what do those cases... Can we as, as you know, practitioners, academics, look at those cases and determine, are there common features that explain and answer your question? Why are they losing? That's a really important question. Um, and, and will it continue? I, so, so I don't think it's just about winning cases. I think if that were the goal, it'd be really easy to win them all. Um, there's more to it, uh, and, and you know, depending on the, the policy goals of, of the administration, um, some cases may be brought in order to push the law, as, as Andy said, and, and that's an incremental process. If you try to take too big a step, it makes it much more challenging. Um, other cases may be brought because there hasn't been any law. There's like regulation by consent decree and the courts really haven't had a chance to opine on it. So you say, Let, let's bring a case and let the courts express a view and let's see where they think the law is. Um, you know, you said that Sherman Act hasn't changed since 1890, but how it's been interpreted and applied has, it's evolved. Um, so, so there's more to it than just bringing cases to win. Um, sometimes cases are brought knowing that, 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 that they're 50-50 at best and but they're important policy objectives that, that the agencies are trying to achieve. Um, and, and, and it's not just moving the law, but also you know, trying to be firm on how they're going to enforce the law. And, and you know, it does help to win the case. It's obviously a lot better to win the case, but, but uh, I think Jonathan, uh, if you ask Jonathan Cantor, you know, he'll tell you that you know, even on some of the no-poach cases where they lost the actual trial, they will say it was a win because the courts recognize that, that no-poach is a per se offense that can be prosecuted criminally, but they lost the trial. So the, you know, the changes are incremental and, and, and not all cases are brought for the sole purpose of, of, of winning. But, but when you lose a lot, it, it, does, you know, it should be examined. And that's what the FTC did back with hospital cases. And they, they learned from it and, 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 and changed how they approached them and, and, and turned the record around. We're a little over time, but okay. did you have a reaction, Tom? Well, I'd, I'd like to ask the, the experts here if I have time to ask a quick question. I mean, as an economist, I've read the uh, Federal Trade Commission complaint against Facebook. That's going to go to trial, I guess, next year. Um, it seems like there's going to be a lot of laughter uh, from the bench when, that, when, when those arguments are made. It, it just doesn't seem like a serious case. And uh, I, I think, well, if you're the federal, and I understand what was brought to, before the current administration came in, but why would, why would you continue that? Well, you might well continue it. I mean, certainly it's a popular target. Um, and uh, <coughs> you, you want to lose that case to tell Congress we need new laws. I mean, we took, we took a shot at your favorite, one of your favorite uh, defendants, uh, got nowhere, we're going to need legislation. Is that a, is, is you know, that I, I'm, I'm, now I'm swinging wildly. You know, <laughs> how, how close does that get? I'm, I'm asking the experts. But not, not very close if the administration, um, uh, if, if Congress shifts. Um, after the election. Um, so if you're counting on losing in order to, you know, incentivize Congress to give you more authority, at a time when Congress is doubtful of how you would use that authority, at least some are, um, that, that's not a very good strategy. Well, so you think the Republicans are more pro-Facebook? No, I mean, that particular case, remember, it was actually a split vote, even though it was the, the prior... Um, um, right. So. I don't want to comment on the, yeah, about the yeah, particulars okay. of the of the case, but 
I think you're right. They're going to face a lot of resistance to challenging mergers from that far ago, uh, that far in the past, and say, we should have somehow been able to evaluate today. I mean, they're not arguing, really, that the FTC is trying to avoid arguing that, oh, we should have opposed it back then. That's not a good argument for the FTC. The question is, now that we've seen the results, um, uh, should we assess the results? And the implications of that case going forward are enormous for revisiting long since settled um, mergers. Um, so I do think that the, you're right, there's going to be resistance. If they win, then the next one's Google Android. Mm -hmm. the, the last thing I'd say about Josh's question is, worse than losing cases is making even worse precedent for yourself to have to live with. Hmm. And that's a consequence of, you know, not even pushing the envelope, but losing cases that maybe were close or winnable, and you actually start building case law against yourself. That worries me. I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, I want to uh, thank the panel. Spectacular expertise, wisdom, and humor. So. <laughs>
This is a mic check. Uh, can you hear me now? Good day, Mr. Paul. Can you hear me? Hello? Okay, so I'm just going to wait for him to come okay. back because my sound is going through him and then come back get, with um, no, that's, okay, that's, just wait. We just wait. Uh -huh. Okay. It's fine. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, that's tell him hold tight. Okay. Um, and then I'll be back over in a second.
Okay, we are going to yes. get started and uh, turn to our second panel of the day on agency independence. And uh, we have uh, gathered a great group. I will uh, have Steve, I will step back from the microphone <laughs> and have Steve Bradbury start us off and introduce the panel. Thank you. Well, Josh, thank you uh, so much. So uh, our panel, uh, panel number two today is going to shift direction from antitrust policy theory uh, to structural questions about the Federal Trade Commission itself, the FTC, and its independence. Everyone knows historically this is sort of a quintessential independent agency structured from way back in the 19 teens from the Wilson administration to be independent from presidential control. Uh, a few features to that. Uh, there's uh, seven-year terms to the appointment of commissioners or five commissioners. They're appointed to staggered terms. Uh, there's a political diversity requirement, no more than three commissioners from uh, the same political party. And then key to our discussion today, there are four cause removal restrictions on the president's authority to remove commissioners. They can only be uh, removed in the language of the statute for inefficiency, neglect of duty, or malfeasance in office. This is the sort of the quintessential for cause removal uh, restrictions. And uh, as we'll discuss, uh, these restrictions came up uh, for uh, consideration before the Supreme Court way back in 1935 in the famous case Humphrey's Executor versus United States. And uh, FDR, President Roosevelt, was trying to fire uh, a commissioner who did, disagreed with his policies or wasn't on board with his policies. And uh, that commissioner, or his estate, because he died uh, shortly after, sued uh, to get back pay uh, for uh, this uh, illegal firing, as he claimed. And the Supreme Court actually held for Humphrey, uh, upheld the for cause removal restriction in light of the functions of the agency. And we'll talk, we'll talk a little bit about that. That case has been uh, reconsidered recently, or at least has been uh, four square in the sites of the court, Supreme Court, in some recent cases, in particular SELA law versus the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, where the court struck down a four cause removal restriction for a single director agency. And then again, in a case called Collins versus Yellen, uh, having to do with the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which also had a single director with four cause removal. In both cases, the court struck down the four cause removal. Uh, interesting things on relief, which we'll, uh, we'll talk about. So the question then, in light of those cases, is what's the future look like for the FTC? Uh, what will, uh, what's the future for independence uh, at the FTC? And we have a great panel uh, today to uh, address this question, and I'm going to introduce them quickly and get right into it. Uh, to my immediate right, we have Svetlana Gans. Svetlana is a partner in the Washington DC office of Gibson Dunn. Uh, she focuses on consumer protection, privacy, competition proceedings before the FTC and other agencies and other public policy issues. Uh, she previously served, uh, most important for our discussion today, I think, as chief of staff to the acting chairman of the FTC, Maureen Olhausen. And as chief of staff, uh, Svetlana helped manage and oversee really all the FTC operations. She was a key advisor on consumer protection and competition enforcement matters. And uh, she directed major initiatives for the agency, including process reforms, regulatory reforms, and initiatives to promote economic liberty, data security, and agency transparency. And we have, uh, to her right, Jen Mascott. As everyone knows, I think Jen is an assistant professor of law and the co-executive director of the Gray Center uh, for the study of the administrative state at Scalia Law School. Uh, her academic work focuses on administrative law, constitutional law, and the separation of powers. Uh, she serves as a public member of ACUS, that's the Administrative Conference of the United States, and as a vice chair of the Constitutional Law and Separation of Powers committee within the ABA's section of, any, of administrative law and regulatory practice. During the last administration, Jen served as a deputy assistant AG in the Office of Legal Counsel of the Justice Department and also as uh, what's known in 
DOJ lingo as an ADAG, an Associate Deputy Attorney General under the Deputy Attorney General uh, Jeff Rosen. She clerked for Justice Thomas uh, on the Supreme Court and for then Judge Brett Kavanaugh on the DC Circuit. And then we're pleased to have uh, joining us the Honorable Paul Verkeil on the big screen. There you go, big brother up there. Uh, Paul is uh, a distinguished senior fellow with the Gray Center. Uh, he served as the Senate confirmed chairman of the Administrative Conference of the United States from 2010 to 2015, where he worked to strengthen uh, ACUS's bipartisan governance structure and the objectivity of its research and recommendations. Uh, Paul's currently a senior fellow of ACUS and the National Academy of Public Administration, where he focuses on civil service reform and government reorganization. He's an active administrative law scholar, a co-author of a leading treatise on administrative law and process, and the author of several other books, including most recently, Valuing Bureaucracy, um, as well as more than 65 articles on public law and regulation. He's the President Emeritus of the College of William and Mary. He's a former Dean of Tulane and Cardoza Law Schools and was a faculty member at the University of North Carolina a Law School. So I'm very pleased to have this whole panel with us and Thanks. let's jump in uh, to uh, what I want to consider as topic one and turn really to, to um, to Svetlana, and I'd, I'd like to have a discussion about what do we mean, what does independence mean for the Federal Trade Commission, really, in the real world? So as a, as a practical matter, how does independence play out? Uh, I described what the structural limitations in the statute are, but what I want to ask you to sort of focus on, Svetlana, is uh, how does that structural independence really play out as a practical matter you know, from the perspective of the chairman's office at the FTC. Uh, great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the organizers for having me here. Very um, humbled to be on this esteemed panel. Um, so in response to the question, there is some interactions between the White House, OMB, and the FTC. Um, there is coordination on major policy initiative, initiatives given the breadth and extent of FTC's jurisdiction. Um, there has been policy coordination in the past on consumer fraud issues, do not call, consumer education, and competition policy. Such policy discussions were historically initiated by the FTC rather than the White House. In addition, many executive orders recommend that the FTC join working groups with other agencies to lend its expertise on consumer protection and competition issues. Generally, the FTC budget goes through OMB because it is the president's budget, and senior appointments typically go through the White House Office of Presidential Personnel. However, as we'll discuss more on this panel, there has been a shift in this administration where the policy initiatives are more aligned, especially with the addition of the White House Competition Council coordinating activities among the agencies. What about uh cost-benefit analysis for major rulemakings. I know President Obama uh, amended the executive order governing cost-benefit analysis to tell those independent agencies like the FTC that you should submit your major rules to OMB for cost-benefit review and coordination. I don't think they all do that. I don't know if the FTC does that, uh, but that's a major area where other agencies within the executive branch have a lot of interaction on uh, sort of wh what's being proposed for rulemaking. Yeah, well, typically the FTC is not a rulemaking body. Um, historically, it's an enforcement agency, so there has been um, limited coordination on the rulemaking side. Most of the rules are pursuant to um, APA rulemaking authority um, with respect to congressional mandates and specific statutes. So it will be interesting to see you know, what we'll talk about, the major focus right now on FTC rulemaking, um, how OIRA will be playing in and, and kind of what the um, interactions will be between OIRA and the FTC. The FTC right now does do a cost-benefit analysis or the statutes at least require them to do a cost-benefit analysis with its rulemaking, but the proof will be in the pudding mm -hmm. um, as we'll be looking at several upcoming rules to see how that actually will play out at the agency. Well, let's talk for a minute about some of the initiatives of the current administration um, and the current leadership at the FTC under Chairman uh, Lena Khan. So uh, how much 
and I know you're not inside now <laughs> in this administration, but how, what's your sort of perception of how much direction uh, she's taking from the White House on some of these initiatives? And maybe you could talk about what a couple of them are and how they might you know, implicate the president's agenda and the question of independence versus close coordination and direction from the White House. Um, great question. So as you m mentioned, I'm not there, so I'm not sure what specific direction um, is being discussed, but kind of based on public information, I would say that most, if not all, of Chairman Khan's current policies and initiatives are, should be viewed as significant to the White House or implicate the priorities of the White House. So if you compare the, the executive order on competition and the FTC strategic plan, its unified agenda, regulatory plan, recent policy statements, and speeches, the current policies and initiatives closely align with those of the president. Both the FTC, if you just take a step back, both the FTC and the White House have indicated a preference for rulemaking over case-by-case -case enforcement. They have prioritized the protection of workers and small business over consumers. Both focus on principles of fair competition rather than unfair methods of competition previously defined to align closely with the antitrust laws. And so let me just unpack that a little bit and give you a few examples. Um, on the policy side, we have the withdrawal of the unfair mess of competition policy statement, the withdrawal and rewriting of the merger guidelines, rulemaking on non-competes, revised antitrust guidelines for HR professionals, right to repair issues, rulemaking on internet marketplaces, rulemaking on occupational licensing restrictions, and rulemaking on corporate surveillance. The FTC has basically opened up the floodgates um, of rulemaking this past year, establishing a new rulemaking unit, issuing three consumer protection advance notices in the past few months. Uh, just yesterday, their agenda came out for the open meeting um, on October 20th. They will be considering yet two more consumer protection related rules. Um, and this is uh, quite significant because, as I mentioned earlier, the FTC is generally not a rulemaking body. And in fact, the FTC has not promulgated a new consumer protection rule since the early 1980s when Congress passed the Magnus and Moss Act, basically um, adding more stringent requirements to the FTC's rulemaking process and procedure. And this is all before you get to another key question, which is competition rulemaking. Does the FTC have the authority to promulgate competition rules? And do FTC competition rules and privacy rules implicate the major questions doctrine? So as you could see on the rulemaking side, um, the FTC is executing on the president's agenda as, uh, as discussed in the executive order. Um, when you go to the enforcement side, it is very similar. Um, July 1st, the FTC issued uh, or adopted several omnibus resolutions authorizing the commission to investigate key industries of particular focus to the White House. These include technology platforms, private equity, healthcare markets, labor markets, among others. So I guess there's probably no reason to think that anything Chairman Khan is doing in any of these areas uh, is inconsistent with what the president would like to see the FTC do. So we probably don't have uh, a field right there to uh, examine tension, you know, and, and the independence coming into play. But, but what if she were going in some direction that uh, president and his senior advisors decided was the wrong direction or was too expansive or was not expansive enough. As a practical matter, sort of in your experience, what, what kind of action can the president and the president's team take to try to change the direction at the FTC? None? Or do they get on the phone with her? I mean, the president does uh, designate which commissioner is the chair. So I guess in theory, he could say, Lena, you're no longer the chair. Um, that would be pretty dramatic. That would be kind of a public expression of failure, I suppose, so unlikely to happen, I think. Um, but is it practical to think that the president or his chief of staff or somebody would get on the phone with her and say, wait a minute, what are you doing, and go in a different direction, or does that just not happen? I mean, it, it, has, it didn't happen when I was there, um, but um, I would 
surmise that it would happen, especially on policy cases or policy larger policy mm -hmm. issues if the FTC is proceeding in direction that the, the White House um, doesn't agree with. I think the issue, um, the kind of the, the problem issues on enforcement cases, right? Because the FTC should be independent and there should not be any coordination or interaction between the White House and the FTC on enforcement matters. So I think that's where um, mm -hmm. it's more important to look at than the policy side because typically the chair and the um, and White House have aligned policy goals, especially yeah. um, with Tim, Tim Wu at the White House and his connection to both Biden yeah. and uh, Lena, um, it seems like they're they're uh, very much coordinated there. Well, before we move into the next discussion of uh, the recent Supreme Court cases, um, maybe Svetlana, you could um, just mention the Walmart uh, litigation uh, that FTC has has recently brought, and it, that's a case. Uh, you know, we don't have to get into too much of the details, but that's a case where. Uh, the issue of the application of the Humphreys executor decision from 1935 is at issue. I mean, it's being raised. Um, so what, what's, what basically is the FTC's claim or claims in the, in the Walmart case? So um, the Walmart case is quite interesting. It's actually a case brought under the telemarketing sales rule, uh, which has an assisting and facilitating liability provision. And uh, what the FTC is alleging is that Walmart uh, basically knowingly facilitated the uh, fraudulent money transfers um, and using with consumers using MoneyGram or Western Union or the Walmart uh, branded money transfer service in its um, in its locations. Um, what's interesting is that Walmart is not accused of fraud or underlying telemarketing. Uh, sales rule violations, it's really being accused kind of as a third party based on its knowledge or alleged knowledge of uh, fraudulent activities uh, of telemarketers somewhere down the chain, uh, not even uh, MoneyGram or Western Union. So it is, it, it's interesting as a, a legal matter under the telemarketing sales rule and obviously Walmart raised several constitutional infirmity arguments in its motion to dismiss. Um, what's interesting on the FTC relief is that the FTC is seeking a permanent injunction as well as monetary relief and civil penalties. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is that the FTC settled a suit against MoneyGram and, and Western Union and in those two cases had received close to uh, half a billion dollars in relief, um, which is interesting and perhaps begs the question as to what more um, harm is is on um, you know not not accounted for based on a half billion dollar um, settlement uh, in those I guess two a billion cases. dollars is better than a half a billion right I guess it could be five billion but it was a half a billion um, I mean I guess so it, it is interesting and we'll talk more about the Walmart case and I'll, I'll leave it to the administrative law experts to discuss the ramifications there but um, you know one other thing I just wanted to touch on if, if okay with you is procedural reforms. The FTC, as you know, I mentioned, is, is doing a lot of rulemaking, and it's very interesting when you look at the procedural reforms that uh, the, the FTC majority um, announced um, on July 1st. Um, and it's, it's also interesting when you take a step back and look at the timeline. Uh, so Chair Khan was confirmed on June 15th of 2021, and less than two weeks later, on July uh, 1st, uh, 2021, um, they had an open meeting where they were uh, right off the bat, um, they rescinded the UMC policy statement, they, um, they adopted the eight omnibus resolutions given the FTC, a single FTC commissioner their opportunity to, um, be, to uh, launch antitrust investigations. The, the prior procedure was to have the full commission vote out a, a, a subpoena on the antitrust side, and so now it's only one commissioner doing that. Um, they also um, passed procedural reforms to its Section 18 rulemaking authority, uh, which basically gave more power to the chair to um, make decisions on facts and the law as to potential rulemakings. And we may see those uh, challenges come out in terms of the, the, the new rulemaking initiatives that I had discussed earlier. So we may see some challenges there in terms of whether the Section 18 streamlining reforms adopted by the commission um, 
comply with constitutional principles. Um, one other thing just to mention as we're talking about independence, um, and the, other, uh, the prior panel mentioned this when I thought just for the audience in terms of kind of the full gamut of issues is that um, you know, the Supreme Court next month will hear the Axon case. Um, the Axon case um, raises the question as to whether a litigant can, uh, can challenge the FTC's structural structure uh, during the pendency of an investigation or whether the litigant must wait until the, FT, uh, until the agency concludes its investigation. So I believe uh, oral arguments on, are in early November, so that's definitely going to be a case to watch there. Um, and it has uh, implications now for pending cases at the FTC. I think Barry mentioned that um, the uh, FTC recently lost two cases in its administrative court, um, Illumina Grail and the um, Jewel Altria matter. In that case, the ALJ actually ruled against uh, the commission and the FTC staff, but both matters are being appealed back to the commission who initially authorized the complaint in the first place. So it will be interesting to see what the commission does in, in these uh, two matters, whether it's true that the commissioners rubber stamp their initial um, you know, authorization of the complaint or whether they will have a de novo review of the case um, as, um, as discussed and described by the administrative law judge who is an independent um, judge in the administrative law context at the FTC. And what uh, court is that case you mentioned before that's raising the structural, is that the? It's Supreme, Supreme court. court, yep. So that's, that, that'll be big. Yep. Well, let's turn to the Supreme Court and turn to Jen. Uh, if you could, Jen, really just tell us what the court was addressing in these two big cases I mentioned, Sela Law and then Collins versus Yellen, and um, what the court, you know, what, sort of why the court did what it did with uh, the four cause removal restrictions for single director agencies, CFPB and FHFA. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Steve. Um, yeah, so in both CELA Law and Collins, as you mentioned, the court was looking at agency heads, basically, who are subject to tenure protections, similar to the protections that cover the FTC commissioners. And you, as you mentioned, the um, Supreme Court in the 1930s upheld those tenure protections as constitutional on Humphrey's executor. You describe Humphrey's as being in the sights of the court. I mean, I think Humphrey's executor certainly has been in the sights of litigants who have brought challenges, but as Chief Justice Roberts tends to do, he um, is a master at employing doctrine. And so despite litigants in SELA law and Collins really urging the court to look at Humphrey's executor again, uh, the chief distinguished Humphrey's executor in both of those cases and really relied on the single director structure of the CFPB and then the Federal Housing Finance Agency in those cases to say, essentially, or I guess Justice Alito and Collins, to say that those, he was following seal law, to say that um, meaningfully, constitutionally, the single director structure is significantly worse and greater degradation of the president's executive authority than the tenure protections over the FTC commissioners. Query how many justices of the court are convinced by those distinctions. We also have different membership now than we did in SELA law with um, Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Barrett. So it'll be interesting to see how that uh, plays, plays out. Um, Justice Kavanaugh, obviously, admin law is his specialty, a lot of expertise. So I would imagine he might be looking at these cases uh, in a, you know, a slightly different uh, or more expert fashion even than some of his um, predecessors. Uh, so if the court is gonna continue to employ doctrine and stick with the single head versus multi-head distinction, um, you know, that's the way it sort of kept Humphrey's executor on the books. I think the question though um, for um, current litigants and for the court eventually and for the FTC and, and everyone um, involved is whether the agency that the Supreme Court of the 1930s found to be constitutionally structured in Humphrey's executor actually continues to exist today. So, I mean, the court, in, ad in, in addition in Sala Law and Collins to focusing on the single director structure, very clearly said that the president needs to be in a position to be able to take care that the laws are faithfully executed, meaning that he or she must command full authority, essentially over all of the executive branch. And if one rereads the Humphrey's executive opinion, which was fairly brief, um, there's a lot of reliance, in fact, perhaps dispositive reliance on the tasks that we're engaged in 
given by the Federal Trade Commission at the time, which were quite limited. Um, issuing studies, conducting some investigations. In fact, I don't think the FTC was authorized to conduct its first sort of enforcement or, or prosecutorial uh, steps until 1938, and then those were uh, modest in comparison to what it's doing today. And so if one looks at 90% of the court's language in the state law opinions and even um, when it talks about executive power in the back half of the Collins decision, I think the current FTC operations certainly seem to be falling within um, executive operations. And so if one thinks it's um, just as problematic for um, five commissioners to be execu exercising executive authority as one director, then um, to the extent that the courts persuaded today's FTC is actually carrying out executive functions, which it seems almost tautologically to, to be doing, if you look at its statutory authority, um, you know, I think one could say Humphrey's executor doesn't need to be overruled. It just the sum total of the cases need to be applied to today's agency, which would result in a finding that. Um, there are unconstitutional tenure uh, protections, perhaps on the commissioners, or perhaps the court would take a different route, and it would actually, for one of the first times, try to interpret what the statutory protections ensconcing the commissioners mean. So the commissioners can be removed for inefficiency, mal uh, malfeasance, I think it's neglect of duty, misconduct, those kinds of, kinds of words. So what do those stat statutory terms mean? Well, interestingly, at least at the highest levels of the judiciary, that question's not really frequently been tested because presidents or executive supervisors, whether it's with commissioners or whether it's with mid-level officials uh, subject to civil service protections, don't seem to frequently want to test what those provisions mean. But I think to Steve's point about um, the, the court currently, like the interest, some of the most interesting questions actually in Collins and Seal Law are what the conservative majority of justices today is going to feel comfortable with um, doing on the remedial end if it does in fact find that, uh, you know, agencies are exercising unconstitutional authority or unconsciously structured. And Justice Thomas, perhaps most intriguingly, in Collins actually says, look, there's not even any harm in this case because it's actually the case that these directors all along can lawfully be fired by the president because we can't even read these tenure protections to constitutionally exist. And so I think some of the most interesting questions could come up uh, if future um, administrations decide to take that at face value and instead of just bringing these more sort of ethereal or theoretical challenges on the outside by litigants, actually start issuing clear directions, trying to effectuate their policy considerations as Svetlana is suggesting the White House is now doing informally on the side. Just be confident about it, say what you're doing, issue instructions, either they're followed and the president in charge at the time his policy is, 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 is effectuated, or they're not followed, like we saw at the early days of the Trump administration the Department of Justice, and then there's some kind of removal, and that tees up a question for the court about what actually needs to be the constitutional structure today of executive branch operations. Yeah, I think that um, your description of uh, the differences between the FTC's authorities in 1935 versus the much more clearly substantial executive power or executive authority within the language of SELA law uh, that you see them exercising under statute today is uh, key to what I understand is the argument that, uh, that uh, interesting way of arguing it that Walmart is, is making in, in its case where it's in the lower courts, it's in before district court, so it's not asking the district court to overrule Humphrey's executor or strike down uh, the removal restrictions. It's basically saying, hey, you got to take Humphrey's executor as gospel, as, uh, that's the law, you have to follow it, and look at what Humphrey's executor said, and it, it focused on the fairly modest authorities at the time of the FTC, the quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial uh, authorities as the court described it then, and that's not what is happening in the case that uh, Svetlana described where they're going after monetary penalties and, and it's much clearer, it looks like a, a prosecution, it looks like a classic executive uh, type of prosecution. Um, 
So basically the argument would be the agency can't do that under Humphrey's executor. Uh, so in, in, interesting, but that does, you know, the, the question of trying to strike down the removal restrictions and what that might mean does get to these interesting questions of remedy uh, in the cases that you described, Jen, like in, in, uh, in the um, case having to do with the CFPB, CELA law, uh, first of all, the court severed the removal restriction from the rest of the statute, said it was severable. Um, and then it remanded to the district uh, or to the lower courts on the question of whether at, at issue there was a subpoena going after a, a law firm. And the question was whether the subpoena or the enforcement of the subpoena had been ratified by the acting director or by a later director who was operating under the understanding that she was removable at will by the president. And the court suggested that if it was ratified, that hey, mox nix, no problem then. Uh, there's, there's nothing to remedy. Um, and in Collins, the court pretty dramatically, I thought, went even further. I was actually a little shocked with their approach there. Um, they remanded on the question of whether there was any there there for the plaintiff uh, challenging, you know, the court had struck down the four cause removal restriction of the um, Federal Housing Finance Agency director, but said it might not matter uh, because he was lawfully appointed in accordance with the appointments clause. He, has, he could exercise executive power. Uh, and the question the court raised was, is there any evidence that the president opposed what he was doing in this case uh, or tried to stop it? And so we're gonna remand to the lower courts to undertake that inquiry. I don't know what kind of evidence you bring to bear. Uh, was there a phone call from the chief of staff at the White House? I mean, does it have to be a public speech the president makes where he, he disagrees with this action or whatnot? But it doesn't seem to be the case that the court thinks there's a you know, per se invalidity in what the agency is doing just because the four cause removal uh, restriction is is unconstitutional, and I, I just wonder what you think about that, Jen. I, mean, I was pretty shocked. At I, I don't. I, I mean, look. I think stepping back. I, I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think generally it's. Sh it's shocking in the context of these justices. I think having general concerns about the role that the judiciary is playing, and you know, in these cases, we you know we're not necessarily talking about national injunction questions, but there's been so much just generally with the federal courts of broad remedial actions in recent years that I think you see the real tr true constitutional conservatives, so it's like Justice Gorsuch, Justice Thomas, some of the others stepping in and saying, what is our proper role? Are we to be reinterpreting statutes? Are we to be um, effectuating what are really broad structural changes? Or are we supposed to be deciding concrete cases and controversies and yeah. enforcing the law? However, that said, I mean, if you read the cases and you take them at face value, it seems to me very clear that what is being teed up is presidents acting like presidents, which it sounds like perhaps President Biden is being willing to do here with the, with the FTC, um, and direct, give direction, and it's either going to be followed, and so we essentially have what will be op, you know, operating as an agency with an at-will uh, removable head following the executive branch direction or the president issues directions and they're not followed. And maybe now if the court's asking for evidence, I don't know, you write a memo. I mean, President Trump liked to direct by executive order, right? So it was clear. By cell phone. Was, well, you know, maybe people do it by proclamation, executive order, maybe they write a memo, whatever. But they give an instruction and either it's gonna be carried out or it's not gonna be carried out and then they take, um, you know, disciplinary or supervisory action. The other case, too, that I think it'd be curious to see if litigants or uh, presidents figure out how to um, apply and, and, and push out with more, um, with more relevance is the court's decision in the United States versus Arthrex, which I think gets lost in the shuffle, talking about executive supervision, because it was about sort of perhaps more minor, less grand decisions by administrative patent judges, and the court tried to say, we're only deciding now cases that are relevant in the patent context. But essentially, the court suggested that um, 
presidentially appointed Senate confirmed officers, and I would think ultimately the president have to be in charge on the front end with issuing directions, that you can't have final decisions, at least by these administrative patent judges, for the executive branch that cannot be reversed by a supervisor. And so if that's true in the patent context, how true is it in other agencies? Um, so I, I think these cases, to me, seem to be a call to the executive branch to manage more closely, more directly, and you know, let's see what happens. Maybe the answer for litigation now is people are going to start being removed or supervised rather than outside parties <clears throat> having to come up indirectly and challenge these individual actions. Yeah. Um. Well, I, I do certainly think that's a lesson from Collins versus Yellen is the onus is going to be on presidents going forward to exercise their supervisory control. Uh, um, can I just raise actually one other thing though? I mean, for current litigation, you, you, you and Svetlana mentioned the Walmart litigation, and it is true that's just in the district court, although Walmart has retained two law firms with two very um, well-experienced past executive branch litigators, Hash Mupan, who um, headed the appellate division under President Trump for really essentially the entire administration, and then Roman Martinez, who was an assistant to the Solicitor General, has argued a number of Supreme Court cases. And they are making the Humphreys executor argument that what uh, the FCC is doing in this case is constitutionally distinct from the agency that existed in the 1930s. But also on the remedy side, he's saying, look, if you take at face value the court's concern, or Justice Thomas and Gorsuch's concern with severability of four cause removal protections, they're saying, which part of the statute are we to assume Congress would have um, preferred? Do we really think Congress meant for these removal protections to be severed? And so th they are looking at, I mean, it's, it's just sort of, I think, in the initial stages of being fleshed out. But various scholars like Will Bode and others are starting to write about what does, what does this look like? What are the answers? If the court's uncomfortable with just general severability, what would it do in this context? It has, with Humphrey's executors, two um, functions, perhaps, that independently are constitutional. Um, maybe the agency can, can we, we found, or at least folks think, that agencies can engage in these enforcement actions. Sometimes removal protections can be constitutional, but you can't put them together. You have this unconstitutional convergence. What do we do? Well, in this case, uh, with the FTC, I mean, the removal protections and the smaller realm of functions were there on the books first. It was after the fact that the amendments expanding the FTC's power led to this constitutional problem. So in that context where we're sort of moving forward in time, would the court be comfortable or a lower court trying to faithfully apply precedent sever or find unenforceable the amended provisions and actually find it a problem that leave the FTC structure in place, yeah. but find unconstitutional the exercise of these powers. And how would these current justices uh, think about that argument? And I think we'll see. Yeah. yeah, well, there is a doctrine that the later amendments to the statute that create the constitutional problem right. should fall. Uh, and so there you that go. would be a, that would be a, an approach. So a less busy FTC. But uh, what we learn from Collins versus Yellen, just to get back to that, is that there's this now fundamental difference between appointments clause violations and uh, removal authority violations. Uh, in the appointments context, we take it for granted that if the officer was unlawfully appointed, inconsistent with the Constitution. Anything that officer does is potentially invalid unless it's subject to, as was the case in Arthrex, the court kind of rewrote the statute, I gathered, to make the decision subject to review uh, by a higher, correctly appointed officer, or it has to be ratified uh, after the fact by a correctly appointed officer. But otherwise, it's, it's open season, it's fair game to challenge anything that officer has done and that's, there was an assumption that that would be true if the four cause removal restriction was unconstitutional. That's what you see in the PAHH case in the DC circuit when they debated the same issue that went the other way in the Supreme Court on CFPB, four cause removal. And uh, the, the court seemed there to assume that all the actions of the CFPB would be invalidated if the four cause removal was struck down as unconstitutional. And in Collins, the court said, no, it's basically, he can keep, he or she can, the director can continue to exercise executive authority 
uh, unless there's evidence that the president, you know, is, is opposed to it or something. And it's a whole new realm, it seems to me. And that's a just, Justice Gorsuch in dissent, I thought, did a great job of raising all of the implications of that. Um, well, just on that point, yeah. um, the FTC filed their opposition to Walmart's motion to dismiss last week, and that's mm -hmm. exactly the argument that the FTC staff raised in its brief, that even if there is an issue with uh, the removal, um, because the commissioners were uh, appointed consistently with the appointments clause, they're citing Collins for the proposition that settled precedent confirms that the unlawfulness of a removal provision does not strip the officer of the power to undertake yeah. the responsibility of his office. So even if there is a removal question, the underlying enforcement action um, should stick given the Collins case. So this is being played yeah. out right now in the litigation. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting. I think sort of the cleverness or smartness of the Walmart challenge is they're not challenging the for cause removal sure. restriction and they're not they're not saying the FTC uh, that Humphrey's executor should be overruled. They're saying take it as a given and under the reasoning of Humphrey's executor, FTC can't do what it's doing because it's not doing what it was doing then. Um, anyway, let's switch, let's switch gears now and get kind of to the nub of the question uh, and um, look at how we think these recent Supreme Court decisions that did strike down for cause removal restrictions in the single director agency context, SELA law and Collins versus Yellen, how do we think those are likely to affect the independence of the FTC uh, going forward? Um, and so I wanna turn to Paul uh, for Kyle. Uh, and I guess before, Paul, before we discuss the future, <laughs> what does the future potentially look like for the FTC? Uh, why don't you take a minute uh, to share your thoughts on, because I know you have some, on the historical context of the Humphreys executor decision. Came out on a fateful day in 1935. It wasn't the only decision of that day. Um, and how did FDR respond to it? Uh, and then sort of what are your thoughts on the meaning of four cause removal restrictions for agencies like the FTC? Great, thanks. Um, so Humphreys has led a charmed life. And, and it is a favorite of all administrative law professors. Frank uh, Easterbrook even said it's the case that ratifies the administrative state by granting independence. So what happened on that day, May 27, 1935? My source is recently found notes from Robert Jackson, who was um, FDR's attorney general, in a book published by uh, John Barrett at St. John's called That Man, that man, of course, being FDR. <clears throat> So on that day, Jackson's job was to walk into the White House on a Monday and tell the president that he not only lost the biggest case before him, which was the NRA, demise of the NRA, but he also lost this little case called Humphrey's executive. That and other case, the, the other that, case was Schechter's poultry, right? Schecter poultry, yeah. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, I, I meant to mention Schechter. So it was Schechter Poultry, which of course is the great non-delegation case, killing the NRA, and then there is um, Humphrey's executor. Humphrey's executor, um, Roosevelt said, my God, this is personal. He was very angry about it. He accepted the NRA, but the NRA it was such a big deal, and this was, a, he said, look, they gave Wilson his, let him to fire his postmaster in Myers, what's, what's wrong here? So that's how it started. And uh, from there, um, FDR changed course, or I think with Jackson's help. And they, rather than becoming a statist organization and having monopolies run by government, the antitrust division came back in force. And in a few years, uh, Thurman Arnold became the chairman. Um, and um, it, that led to a change in outlook, which I think we, we would all applaud. Um, which allowed the uh, government to take different positions and use the FTC in a productive way. Um, William Humphreys himself 
was um, appointed by originally by Coolidge and then reappointed by Hoover in 1931. A lot of opposition in the Senate to him because he was a well-known corporatist who didn't believe in antitrust policy. So that's a good reason why Roosevelt wanted to get him out of there. He obviously didn't use uh, for cause because uh, he had Myers, he thought. Um, so when we go forward, um, when we end up with um, the present day, uh, we have um, Celia Law, I think, is the key case here because uh, the Chief Justice has said in his uh, opinion that there are two exceptions. One is the uh, multi-member commission exception and the other is the um, Ma uh, uh, sorry, Morrison exception for inferior officers. And, and he cites Morrison and he also cites Perkins, uh, which is a case, if we have time a little later, I'd like to refer to, because that plays a big role in the civil service uh, for four cores removal. So when he said it's different, um, it is true that political balance counts for something, and appointing the chair counts for a lot in terms of giving the president enough power to run the agency. Um, and now that those are the key factors maybe that would help uh, let uh, Humphrey survive. Um, but uh, Jen said importantly that the, he, he looked at um, Humphreys as it was in 1935, so it didn't have all these executive actions. And if you look at Dan Crane's paper for this uh, symposium, he makes it very clear. He charts every, the, over time the, the number of actions taken, and, it, and adjudication is a small part of it now. Um, it's mostly quasi legislative and legislative and a lot of uh, uh, executive action. Um, now maybe the, I'm thinking maybe the way to save it might be, if you're looking at that point of view, uh, make it more like a wiener. Well, a wiener, of course, is an adjudicative agency, and I think four cars removal in wiener would be approved just because of the need for independence and, and the kind of due process dimensions of adjudication. Uh, now it is Dan found 79 cases of adjudication in, in the period covered by the FTC, so maybe that would be enough. I'm, I'm not sure that's a, that would be true. Um, but it certainly is more in more jeopardy than, <laughs> than it has been for a while. Well, uh, yeah, the court, the court uh, clearly distinguished multi-member commissions like the FTC at issue in Humphreys from the single director agencies and really held that the current court made it clear they're not going to abide expansion or extensions of the Humphreys executor reasoning to these new types of agencies or different structures. Um, but getting back to Humphreys executor, sort of a core, as the Walmart case is, is highlighting, a, a core of the reasoning there was the notion that the agency, the functions it was exercising were quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial, and were not pure executive uh, authority. Um, to what, I'd like just to ask the panel, maybe Paul, we start with you, and then Jen and Svetlana, what, do we really think there's anything left of that concept? Uh, now, obviously, lower courts have to follow Humphreys, so, you know, they have to follow right. the Supreme Court, but if we were the Supreme Court, I mean, if, if, if it comes before the Supreme Court, if, if FT, you know, for purposes of what the future looks like, do we think that reasoning is just going to be thrown overboard, or does it still hold? Does it still make sense? Paul? Well, my, my feeling would be, in terms of quasi-judicial, it, if you look at it, I, I think the big question is ALJs. ALJs, of course, are inferior officers. But, um, we do think after Lucia that there is an issue about four course removal. Um, and if, if you, so in that sense, quasi-judicial has some continuing meaning. But in general, I agree with you. I think it, 
it's a distinction that's harder to, uh, to justify. Jen? I agree. <laughs> well, I guess quasi-legislative, you, you can think of adjudicate, you can think of rulemaking as quasi-legislative, right? I mean, we talk about it a lot that way. Has Congress given too much authority to the administrative state? Administrative state is really now being asked by rule to legislate effectively. Um, but isn't that pretty quintessential executive power now? I mean, I mean, the courts made it clear, I think, in these cases, like Paul and others are, are, you know, were saying and we're talking about, I mean, if one just goes back to see the law, and I think I agree with Paul, but that is the key case, and looks at what the court deems to be executive, it will find that the FTC is, you know, with regularity exercising those those powers, and I mean, so again, I think what's left is if folks want to say there's some distinction between a single head and a multi-member head, um, but that distinction hinges on this idea, I think, that these commissioners are not really having as much executive power because they have to work together as a team. And I just, I don't see any reasoning in the court's recent opinions to suggest that that is actually, if the court looks at what the commission is doing, is, a, is, a, is, is ultimately a, a meaningful distinction. Um, I think actually the Biden administration itself has been somewhat forward-leaning in applying the court's past precedent. I mean, after Collins, it was very, very quick to just on its own issue from its Office of Legal Counsel mm -hmm. a pronouncement, for example, that the head commissioner of the Social Security Administration could be fired and the Office of Legal Counsel's, you know, trying to negotiate itself and not bring down the FTC commissioners and everybody else who says we're confining this to the Social Security Administration because it's just one person, but they hinge on, you know, all the policy that's being engaged in and a billion dollar budget being managed. All of these things are happening at the FTC. So I think yeah. if you look at the Biden right. administration's own executive branch reasoning. It's authoritative constitutional law pronouncements. I really do not see meaningful distinctions with the FTC commissioners today. What about the Federal Reserve? That's the issue, isn't it? Well, I don't see as many litigants right now going after the Fed Reserve, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable sticking with the FTC. But no, there are all kinds of questions. You're right. And I love, too, that um, Paul is mentioning the administrative law judges. And that's actually an issue. That's the precipitating factor that's prompting the um, the Axon challenge, and then there's a similar challenge before the court from in Cochran versus the Securities and Exchange Commission, mm -hmm. and the court there explicitly declined in both cases to not take on the question right now of the constitutionality of the removal protections for administrative law judges. It's just taking on this more jurisdictional question that's what Svetlana mentioned. Is it really appropriate from a statutory standpoint even to say that you have to go all the way through the agency's own procedures that ultimately the FTC commissioners themselves, for example, are gonna be pronouncing on their own constitutionality before you can go to district court? You know, we'll see how the court answers that this question, this term, and to the extent the court says these challenges can be brought earlier uh, judicially, I think um, it's not too many steps down the line where some of these removal questions are going to be teed up again, whether yeah. it's with these lower-level folks, the administrative law judges, or the heads of the agencies themselves. Yeah, I could easily see the you know the court, the modern court, um, saying all these different independent agencies uh, are exercising executive power uh, uh, for purposes of the SELA law and uh, Collins reasoning, uh, unless you have some body that's purely advisory, like, well, like ACUS. <laughs> uh, right. You know, uh, I, I think that's fine because what you ACUS... You know, I, uh, may I just add a point about that? There is a D.C. statute in the tax field where you become a resident of D.C., if you have for cause removal. And so the question was when I became chairman, did I have, and it says, you know, I have a term, but do I have, it's no for cause removal. So I, fortunately I wasn't, but if I were, if I were an SEC or an FTC commissioner, I'd be subject to DC taxes. Of course, my job would be thought of as permanent as opposed to, you know, transitional or at will. That's well, those, uh, I love that. Uh, Officers with four cause removal protection, often uh, if, if the president does try to exercise that authority and remove them for neglect of duty and efficiency, uh, uh, they often will challenge that uh, in court. And, um, and a lot of those cases, probably for that very reason, <laughs> go to the DC circuit. 
Um, right. Let's say that the Supreme Court does conclude that the FTC is exercising, I mean, the case is squarely presented and is exercising substantial executive authority and the removal restrictions are unconstitutional. Because I think the court, it seemed to me in Yellen and, and Sela Law, the court made it pretty clear that the removal authority of the president is unrestrictable when it comes to agencies exercising executive power. What, what do we think that would mean for the FTC? I mean, Jen raised the question of um, remedy, and it seems pretty darn complicated. Uh, certainly if you think, for example, of a severability question, I mean, how do you sever the removal restriction from all the other uh, structural restrictions that Congress designed to try to keep the FTC independent? Uh, would the whole enterprise collapse? Um, or if not, how would, what, what would it mean going forward if the president at any time, for, for any reason or no reason at all, could remove a, a commissioner from the FTC? Svetlana, do you have any other? I don't know if it would have that big of an impact. I think wow, that, really? um, I think the commissioners are there to fulfill their mission and carry out the statute. Um, and I don't think they're, thinking like what, what will happen. I mean, at least, you know, we're, we're there to do our jobs, but, um, you know, but that could be wrong. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how it would play out. Just because there's really not a lot of direction. I mean, you kind of just fill out the mission that you want, carry out your objectives. Well, there could be know. a lot more direction on, in that universe, right? I mean, the White House, the president's team could come knocking on the door and say, hey, things are gonna change from now on. Everything you do, every major decision, you got to pre-clear with us, you know. Just like other agencies and departments, you got to keep us surprised in advance. We don't want any surprises. Yeah. You know, we want to be comfortable with what you're doing. Um, it, you know, it reflects on us, reflects on the president. And if not, if you're not comfortable with that, you know, today, tomorrow, the next day, you're out. Yeah, but I think that's kind of implied now that you're the president appointed you, so you need to interesting um, at least be consistent with uh -huh. with the with the objective, but, but with a seven year term, you know, that president may be gone pretty soon. Right, but then the, the party would, um, the chair is the party of, the, mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the president, so you would have a different chair yeah. at that point, but. How about um, other thoughts, Jen or Paul, on what it might mean practically for the FTC? Is it workable? Well, I think so, I mean, <clears throat> I'm sorry, did you say you don't think so? No, no, I, I think it's workable. It's, there are rare cases where there'd be a problem, but most, as uh, was said, Svetlana said, most uh, appointees do what they're told, and maybe they don't do it so well. Yeah. Um, but um, is that enough to fire somebody, you know, and then, again, then you gotta reappoint them, and then you gotta go through all of that, so. There's a, there's a hesitation to take that step. You can understand. Well, there might be less how hard hesitation. It is to get people confirmed, right? Well, do you always need to get somebody confirmed? I mean, if well, if, if you don't like the current constitution of the commission, uh, the income the new incoming president could just ask for the resignation of one or two key commissioners, and totally change the balance of power, right? I mean, I, I wonder if the change would come because, um, at least in theory, the president in that framework should be seen as more responsible for the determinations of the FTC. Absolutely. So to the extent that we think the president would be influenced to step in more or less frequently or would face some accountability based on the FTC's actions, that could be really interesting. Right? Like right now, I think the president's able to sit aside and say, oh, the FTC is just doing the necessary independent job to enforce the law. But if it becomes the president is pursuing a billion dollar enforcement action against Walmart, yeah. what does that look like? How does yeah. the administration respond to such? I think that's how yeah. it would be portrayed. I would, I would yeah. agree with that. On the enforcement side, it's definitely a bigger issue than on the policy side where yeah. coordination right now is pretty um, common. Okay. Well, um, given the time, why don't we uh, pause there and see if there are any questions from the audience in this fascinating constitutional discussion?
Anybody? Yeah. And we have a microphone for you. Hold on. Hi. Yeah. Uh, my big, my big uh, question was: I, I saw that like Chairman Khan um, was like reimagined the FTC and like has empowered the chair herself. Um, is that empowerment like now that the chair, that the president chooses the chair, is that more constitutional in the sense that if the chair has more more of the power, it's less of a uh, separation of powers issue? Well, I'll, I'll say a word and then turn it over to um, Svetlana and Jan, I think have something. Um, the court, I think the Supreme Court would say that's a factor in whether the kind of reasoning that was applied in the other two cases, the single director agency cases, uh, necessarily applies here. Because that certainly is a structural factor that gives the president more control over the FTC, the fact that he can designate who the chair is and has that close working relationship with the, uh, with the chair. But maybe Svetlana, you have a, or Jen? Go ahead, Jen. Well, I mean, I just, sure, I mean, the president's able to appoint the chair, I mean, but, you know, and I suppose, like we were talking about before, could remove or just, just redesignate, redesignate a different to a different, commissioner. To a different chair. I mean, look, we have a little bit of an example of how the changes in structure have played out with the CFPB. I mean, essentially, really what's happened is just that now the president can make sure that their individual is um, more easily in charge and not have to deal with sort of the hangover terms. Um, so I don't know, what would it look like if we still had the statutory restrictions in place on the political party diversity? Maybe just a more moderate person from each political party would be selected mm -hmm. to, to represent the opposing political party. Would that change the direction of it? Um, but I still think the court would find that the, um, if it's going to re-examine the structure in general, I don't think the whole designation of the chair would save the tenure protections necessarily mm -hmm. of the other commissioners. I think the question is just, is a litigant going to be able to successfully tee up the question in a way now where the court would be able to take on the issue without, and would it be willing to overrule Humphreys? Could it negotiate? with Humphrey still on the books, and what would the more conservative justices do on the remedy side? Yeah, and then on the enforcement side, um, you know, the questions will still, still remain as wh whether or not the appointment is, is um, constitutional in terms of the, the functions and the activities and the laws that they uh, decide to bring and the theories they allege, and so that those decisions also have a lot of constitutional dimensions in terms of um, the scope of authority, like rulemaking, for example, on the competition side, the Section 18 questions on the MAGMOS rulemaking side. So even if the appointments issue is resolved, you still have a lot of discretion of the chair in terms of pursuing uh, different cases and remedies. Jen, I think you, I'm not sure if you were referring to the holdover provision, but there is, you know, there's a holdover uh, statute it's been in the FTC Act since the beginning that uh, basically provides that um, uh, that a uh, sitting commissioner stays on even after the expiration of his or her term until the su successor is appointed. Um, interesting question I sort of kick around how would that would that con continue to exist too if the four cause removal were removed um, I tend to think it probably would not. I mean, the, the court seems to me to be taking the position that the president's removal authority has to be unrestricted. And that's a restriction on it in a, in a way. Uh, so, um, but, you know. Well, but isn't it still, is, does that provision though right now, is it interpreted to work in tandem with the tenure protections? I mean, presumably you can't, I mean, how would you have a holdover FTC no, commissioner if you discovered that the person was like stealing money? Right, no, I mean, you're right. It, so, it, it, the removal is immediate once it so, happens. So there. actually, if we, play, if we play it out, so let's assume that they're all, all subject to at-will removal at every time and a president's forward-leaning like President Biden was at the start of his administration, even with getting rid of people on these little commissions over here. So I assume the next Republican president will, will operate the same way. Um, you know, if, if everybody who is even held over from the other president's party is um, 
Well, well, actually, I think what, like if the party changes hands, right? Presumably, yep. the president would keep in place anybody who, at the time, had been appointed who was of his own political party, or maybe not. Maybe, maybe he would not. Appoint. Well, well, yeah. well. I think it, they have to be three-two. I think it depends. And but do they have to be three-two at the time of appointment or at the time that they're serving? Because if it's at the time of appointment, it's appointment, I think. Okay. But it depends on the, the president. If it's a Republican, yeah. then it's 3-2 the Republican and first, vice I versa. I think we would just see more, don't we, I mean, wouldn't the membership necessarily become just less really bipartisan because whatever president's in charge would just get the person from the other party yep. who is as close to their policy preferences. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, that was the possible. point in CELA law is like, are they experts or are they political? Typically, they're experts, but you know, if you add the political dimension, it might right. skew the decision making. Yeah, yeah. Well, particularly on the enforcement side, where in theory they have discretion, right? They don't have to bring any. I mean, they can execute the law faithfully and make many different iterations of decisions about who's going to be charged with what, subject to which penalties, right? right. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, audience questions? Over here, we have one. And this will, I think, be the last. We need to wrap up. Hello. Um, so this might appear naive, but I'd like to get your opinion on this. If we ever had a situation where we could run the deck where we had Congress red and the, and the president Republican, is there a way to circumvent what I see as this years of, of trying to change this through the judiciary, of trying to have Congress actually make changes? And if we had that rare window, which one just passed, who would lead that charge to get this done? Because that seems to be, that could hand strap some judicial opinion. Any thoughts on that? My, my thought is it should be the president who takes the lead in proposing changes. But. Well, I think you're asking whether Congress would actually statutorily amend right. the um, right. removal provisions and just make it at will. I mean, I don't know, do we still have a filibuster in the Senate or do we not, under your scenario? <laughs> in, in your alternative universe. <laughs> so that's, that may give me a chance to mention the case yeah. that was cited, and that's the Perkins case by the Chief Justice in his opinion. And the reason Perkins is important is because it's the case that validated the Pendleton Act, which is the act that created really the civil service, the tenure in office for civil servants, which at the time wasn't so broad, but by the uh, Civil Service Reform Act of 78, it is now consists of most of the government employees are in the civil service. So the fact that Pendleton Act was uh, connected to Perkins does at least make you wonder a little bit about what would happen if someone attacks the civil service because there's a full cost removal problem right there. Um, and I'm very hopeful that the civil service will survive based on Perkins and the fact that we're not dealing with, uh, you know, uh, inferior officers or, or employees. Right. Uh, but that's, so anyway, I just wanted to put, the, put a note out for that. That's a big note. Uh, and on that note, I think, unless there are any final thoughts, um, I think we should wrap up. And I want to thank the panel for an uh, interesting discussion.
what Dan the unmistakable mandate that Congress gave the agency is embedded in several of the committee reports that were generated during the development of the act that said we could try to write down everything that we regard as being inappropriate conduct. We've done some of that in the Clayton Act, which we are adopting in parallel. But as much as we would try to do it, we would be engaged in the same effort that fellow teachers of contracts regard as drafting the perfectly complete contract, which is completely impossible at some point. So we're not going to do it. We're going to deliberately give this agency the responsibility to use this broad framework and expertise to generate new norms of competition law and policy. That's what we're going to do. We're also going to give the agency extraordinary capacity to gather business records without connection to any specific law enforcement program. That's section six. We are importing the broad power that the Bureau of Corporations, the antecedent agency had, and we are augmenting it to give the agency, in effect, compulsory process, not only to gather business records, to compel businesses to prepare reports, and to use that information to inform judgments about how economic policy should be carried out. Both of those, as I'll say in a moment, had powerful political implications. But there was a trade-off, and here's the basic trade-off. We are creating a relatively weak agency when it comes to enforcement and implementation. We are giving it no civil penalty authority. It is not a criminal enforcement mandate. The remedy we have in mind for the exercise of the norms creation function is to issue prospective cease and desist orders. Don't do it again. Indeed, there is no machinery contained in the original statute about how the agency, in the face of an infringement of one of its orders, and it issued a lot of them, how that infringement would be challenged. And it became clear in the execution of the law until the 1930s to the period that Jennifer referred to before that defendants got several bites at the apple before they had to worry about any sanctions. Several different steps before ultimately an order would be embodied in a declaration by a federal court that the order was mandatory and then a subsequent infringement of that order could be treated as contempt. But firms knew in their experience with the commission that you could transgress the line being drawn at least twice before anything bad happened to you. That is a decidedly weak implementation framework. In fact, it's so weak that one begins to wonder about the sincerity of the declaration of policy in the statute when combined with the thin staffing that accompanied the creation of the agency is this what a number of political scientists would say is nothing more than credit claiming for symbolic gestures that are not followed up with adequate implementation measures. So it's a broad, elastic norms creation mandate, but it's going to be implemented with very light touch remedies. And indeed, I agree entirely with Tom Merrill's assessment, which you'll hear later today, that there was no power embedded in the original statute to adopt substantive competition rules. And by the way, it was only competition. As we'll see in a moment, there is an immediate expansion of the practical mandate through the implementation of the statute. Now, Congress knew that the original grant of authority was extraordinary. The norms creation function was breathtaking. And Albert Cummins, who's one of the chief sponsors of the measure in the Senate, is asked during the floor debates, do you realize what you're doing here? You're basically telling them they can establish new standards of conduct. Where will that go? What boundaries are there imposed upon it? And Cummins says, yeah, yeah, I know that. It's very broad. And then comes the powerful lack of political independence. He said, the agency has been entrusted with the mandate, but if it doesn't use the mandate as we intended, we can do something about it because, his words, Congress created the commission and it can destroy it. That's a cheery opening note for the beginning of a new agency. 
that is the Congress that created you can obliterate you. And it's obvious from the expression of Cummins and others that they meant indeed to do that and were willing to threaten it over time. And it's important because the mandate itself is politically explosive. Notice what you get when you get the norms creation function. You are, by design, doing something new. You're doing something that's unprecedented. You've immediately opened the door for affected commercial interests to say what they've done is new and unprecedented. And you can answer by saying that's just what they had in mind in drafting this, but you're immediately exposed to the argument that you're going into an unknown realm which has been described by many critical commentators as Star Trek law enforcement in the modern era, going where humans have never gone before. Well, that's right. And this was a deliberately experimental process with enormous political risk, because we know in the modern era there is a political feedback loop, which also could be seen as a cynical element of original design. Go do bold, important things, Business complains, comes back to us, and give us electoral resources. Oh, we didn't mean for you to do that. But go do more of it in order to keep this unvirtuous cycle going. And the other element that has breathtaking features is the data collection. Section 6, go gather business records using compulsory process. Make them give you reports so that you can dive into the innermost ingredients of business decision making in a way that no agency has had a mandate to do before. A number of political scientists in later years would say both of those mandates are packed with political dynamite. And you add to it the expectation that the FTC would leave to the Department of Justice the cut and dry stuff. Anything criminal, that goes to them. Anything that involves in this nascent regime of competition policy that's cut and dried, the early cartel offense, that goes to the Department of Justice. You're supposed to operate in this band of discretion that surrounds the rest of the antitrust system, doing new things, and by the way, we expect you to take on some of the hardest challenges that one finds in the economy, and if you're not bringing cases, at least you're writing reports and bringing to the attention of the larger policymaking community what's wrong, what's going ahead. So is it a surprise that there would be presidents and legislators who would be keenly interested in how this function was carried out and that they would develop a host of mechanisms of political control that, save for the removal power and the limits on it, involve, in many instances, intrusive political oversight. So the notion that at any time during its history, the FTC has been a rogue running around without effective political control and oversight is a fiction, because those mechanisms of control have been built in from the beginning. What changes after 1914? This is the original mandate. It stretches. And the stretching of the mandate bears directly upon the excellent discussion that we heard in the previous panel and relates to the policy developments that our first panel talked about this morning. First, what happens? We see the development of a consumer protection mandate that was completely unanticipated. If you'd asked legislators in 1914, what about the development of the FTC Act as a method for controlling dishonest advertising? They would have said, that's not this law. This is all about competition law and policy. But what happened? What is the largest segment of complaints addressed by the FTC in its first decade? It's this scenario. I'm an honest business person. In that most excellent casebook, we use a coffee shop example. I'm an office co honest coffee shop owner operator. But Andy and John, my beloved co-authors, they are dishonest as can be. They promise wonderful health effects. They say drinking their coffee will make you beautiful. You'll lose 20 pounds. It'll have every positive effect you want, and it's the best damn cup of coffee in the world. I tell the truth. I say, I sell a good cup of coffee. You'll walk out with a smile on your face, but you won't have any of these other attributes. But these guys lie. 
And because they lie, there's a big queue outside of their shops. They are using their dishonesty to divert trade away from my business. And that is an unfair method of competition. The FTC is besieged with these complaints from the word go. And it says, yes, this has a competition policy implication. It's what we would now call dishonest advertising, and we'd put it in another policy-making basket. But the FTC starts doing consumer protection that has to be linked to competitive injury. It starts doing it from the word go. And it's not until the late 30s that that is recognized as a formal, separate enforcement mandate without the requirement that competitive harm be shown. That's the Wheeler, Wheeler Lee Act. But later on, there comes the recognition that if the FTC is going to be the principal advertising regulator, and it's going to deal with serious consumer fraud, that you can't exercise that mandate effectively unless you can make bad guys give the money up. If the only thing that happens when you enforce a law against fraud is that you tell, a court tells, my beloved colleagues here, cut it out, what have they been told? They've been told they get one shot, one free shot. I can cheat, steal one time, the FTC issues a cease and desist order and say, ah, I can't do it again, but I'll try something else out. If you can't get an order that makes them cough the money up, you've got a problem with your consumer protection regime, and that is what unmistakably pushes the FTC in the 70s to developing over the next decades until AMG Capital the restitution and disgorgement remedy. So an implication of this mission expansion into consumer protection over time comes the inevitable demand for the development of remedies that develop effective deterrence over time. And I agree with the previous panel that every step you take away from that original vision of broad interpretive mandate but light touch remedies you're moving in the direction of an enforcement mechanism that takes you directly into federal court far more often. The march into federal court is expanded in the 1970s with Section 13B, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline Authorization Act, which is tossed onto the train of must-have legislation that says, literally written on, well, this is white, but they were yellow pages. Here, here's some other stuff we'd like for the FTC. See if it travels, it did. Independent litigating authority. Authority can be interpreted as creating a foundation for civil monetary recoveries outside of the scope of civil penalties. And then the Hart-Scott-Rodino Antitrust Improvements Act of 1976 that converts antitrust enforcement at the FTC from ex post review through the administrative process into ex ante challenges directly in the federal district courts. So that moves a massive amount of FTC work out of the Part Three adjudication process into direct actions in the federal court. And the consequence of all of these measures is to take step-by-step -step work streams out of internal administrative adjudication and channel them into direct litigation in the federal courts, which poses the problem that our colleagues mentioned before on the previous panel. And in all of this, what is the commentary saying? What's the baseline of commentary written by individual academics or by blue ribbon commissions like the 1969 ABA report? Every bit of advice they're giving is telling the agency to march into a more politically risky and difficult environment. And the ABA 1969 report, which is strong on bravado and short on any form of political judgment, says, go attack big firms involving unsettled areas of the law and leave everything that's straightforward to the Department of Justice. That's a formula for political collisions. And yes, indeed, as you try to exercise it, you get lots of political oversight. Does losing Humphrey's executive matter? My qualified answer is not so much as one might think. And I think Paul Verkyle's comment earlier and Svetlana's comments about right. Why? Let's look at the mechanisms for political control now. Uh, using the wonderful framework of the political science text, two ends of, both ends of the avenue, let's go to 
the easternmost end of Pennsylvania Avenue up to Capitol Hill. What can the Congress do? Well, it can exercise oversight, and it can exercise it in a way that just takes your life away from you. They can run you up there every week if they want to. They can get documents. They can subpoena the records of the agency right down to, but maybe not including the communications of attorney advisors and individual members of the board acting in adjudication mechanisms. They can carry out budget and oversight functions. It astonishes me how blasé lots of the political science and administrative law literature is in saying, oh, budget oversight, appropriations, shrug, not important, not effective, breathtaking all written by people who've never had to justify a budget. The FTC's budget, plus or minus, is about $300 million. Do you know what it means if Congress threatens credibly to take it from 300 down to 295? You can get by with that. It means that people are gonna to have to bring in their own writing instruments. Ah, Hilton Hotels, yes. Elegant, one of my favorite brands. Capsis out of the blue, a notepad from a hotel and no hot water in the restrooms. Okay, five million, you can cut out the travel. If they go down to 290, you have to fire people. And if you take five million, the addition five million out, you're probably gonna fire about 20 or 30 people. And you know who's gonna fire them? It's ultimately gonna be the chair of the agency who brings them in one by one and says, thank you for your loyal service, you're gone. And no public official looks forward to doing that. The ability to move the budget in one direction or another is an extraordinary source of oversight. And if they call and want to chat and you don't do it, and then you sit before them begging, which is what you're doing, you're begging, they say, I remember you. You're the person who wouldn't take my call. Ah, 300, that's awfully tough, 290. It's a powerful lever to use with the agency if they don't like what you're doing. And I can recall, as a junior case handler, on two occasions in 1980, getting the famous banker's box, filling up everything in my office and taking it home, because Congress, in approving an omnibus continuing resolution, had a clause that said the federal government is funded at a pro rata rate for the next six months, except the Federal Trade Commission. You've run out of money. Two times. You don't have to do that very often to catch the attention of a public agency. So there's budget and appropriations, and then there is the political feedback loop. What has happened on so many occasions where the FTC has exercised this norms creation function? Business says, ouch, that's unprecedented. That hurts. Where do they go? Especially in the modern era, they go to the legislative committees and they provide them with electoral resources. Respect, money, respect, money. They go to the Appropriations Committee, they go to the Oversight Committee, and they hand it out, and through a variety of conduits, they bring pressure to bear on Congress. And what does it do in many instances? Up comes the Federal Trade Commission. Why are you doing that? Whoever told you you could do that? Let's see, Section 5, Unfair Methods of Competition. You told us. Who said you could do that study? Well, you did. It's in section six. The political pressure that comes back at you is so intense that an agency that does not have a fair amount of political science represented in the board to build a strategy and anticipate challenges is walking into a minefield wearing a blindfold. Let's look at the executive. How much did Humphrey dis Humphrey's executor disable the executive? I'll acknowledge that there is some power in knowing as a decision maker that you can only be removed for a cause. I didn't care. I had another form of tenure. I knew that if I'd been sacked in 25 minutes, I would be back in my office at GW getting ready to write the article about how I was sacked and what a war crime it was. <laughs> I'd be ready to do it. They'd have given me better material and they would have made my book so much better than it would have been otherwise. Thank you for doing that. I didn't care. But in what ways can the executive make you care about its decisions even if Humphrey stays in place? 
Our previous panel mentioned a couple. One is that they get to appoint you. And I assure you in the screening that goes into the selection of FTC commissioners, there is an arduous effort to get an idea of whether you understand who appointed you and what your job is. And if you have political loyalties, what do you want? Maybe I'll get reappointed. Maybe I'll get to be the ambassador to Australia. Maybe I'll be the head of the mission in the European Union. Or even better, maybe I'll get to be the ambassador to New Zealand. And I'm so far away, nobody's going to pay attention to me. And what a great place to be. I want to be able to go to parties so that people don't turn their back on me because I'm not doing what the president wants. I want to be seen as a loyalist. Now, can that wear off over time? Yeah, but your tenure as chair, median, three years at the FTC. And there's going to be another chair around, too. So you're not going to have that job for very long. Uh, the appointment party power, the screening, is intense. Very few people slip through there by hiding their real colors. You don't get many pirate ships that get through by flying the flag of the Red Cross. It doesn't happen. And then you move into... The 1950 Reorganization Act, which means I have the ability as president to say, Josh, great job as chair, but by signing a letter, why Andy's on the board, Andy's now the chair. But thank you, Josh, for your loyal service. In the desk of every federal trade commissioner is the gavel of a chair. Every federal trade commission non-chair commissioner thinks they would be a better chair than the chair. I know I was one of those people. And I know my four colleagues all would look at me at meetings and say, I can do the job better than that guy. And if they get the call, they'll take it. And an interesting implicit threat that the White House has, if they're not happy, is, let's see, who are the other same party people? I've got two choices. I've got Andy, I've got Josh. And Andy and Josh aren't stupid. They're sort of raising their hands saying, I'll take it. They're signaling in speeches, writing articles. I'll take it. I'm available because Bill's a loser. We will do what you want. Give it to us. Uh, that remarkable power created in 1950 to move the chair's designation around is a powerful pressure point of political control. You don't have to use it a lot. In a football match, in global football, if the referee sees something they don't want, they just have to reach for the pocket. You don't have to pull out the red car. You see the hand reaching, and you know what's going on. Uh, is that the same as being able to simply cast somebody off the board and say, no longer, you're not the chair, but you're no longer working at this agency? No, it's not that powerful. But is it weak? Uh, I love my time in the United Kingdom when if you're dealing with a superior individual in the hierarchy and they've said something they regard as being doubtful, the response is, really? So the 50, 1950 reappointment power, the power to move is ineffective? Really? What's next? Well, we've got the budget too. You don't submit your budget to Congress, it goes through OMB. And they look at it and they ask a lot of questions about what's in there. Now, can you play magic tricks to get through the program you want by OMB and then go up to Congress and say, by the way, those narrow-minded people over there, they wouldn't let us have this? We want a red bicycle for our birthday, and they're only going to give us uh, a used baseball card deck from last year. Here, I want the bicycle. Can you do that sort of work around? Of course you can. But OMB gets to scrub your budget request in the first instance carefully. There is, of course, the Paperwork Reduction Act, if you want to exercise that magical 6B authority. No more than nine before you need their approval. That means nine's the number you look at, but maybe you ought to be looking at 20. No, you're going to do nine. You're going to bump into the PRA. And, of course, in appointments, on the first item, you're picking people who want to serve. I urge you to go and look at the photograph taken at the signing of President Biden's executive order for the whole of government competition policy. You have a group of senior officials. One of them is the chair of the FTC. President Biden is reaching back with the pen to give it to her. I urge you to look at that photograph and ask how much independence you see in that picture. Not much. So, how independent are the agencies? They're not. And it's by design. It's a horribly imprecise term to describe what takes place. So let's say Humphrey's executor goes. 
All these other mechanisms, of course, are supplemented now by the removal power. I'm trying to think of how often a chair of the FTC has been told by the White House, here's something we want, and the chair says, I'd love to find a way to do it. I'd love to find you 60% of what you want, 90%, but I'm not going to do it. The clearest example I can think of is when President Trump went to Joe Simons and said, I want the FTC to use its advertising scrutiny authority to scrutinize the truthfulness of political ads. Because many of my opponents are saying outrageous things about me, and I want you to use your authority to police that. Joe, after a couple of meetings, on both occasions said no, no. That will destroy us. We could be in that business for a couple of months, and we will be finished. I'm not going to do it. I don't know even there if the president said, you're now Commissioner Simon. Chair Simon is over here now. I don't know if he made that threat. Or if he would have carried through with that to say, you're fired. I'll get somebody who'll do that. Would there have been any recognition that that would have been the doom of the agency? Where would it matter the most if the president used this authority? And I think this would ultimately be an inhibition on how often it's used in the same way that it inhibits its use for the Department of Justice. The President of the United States could call up Jonathan Cantor now and say, John, you've done a great job. Uh, it's just about 1 o'clock. I want you out of here by 5. But thanks for serving the US public. The only thing John could say is, it's been a pleasure, Mr. President. And I wish you the best of success in the future. Like that. That seldom happens. Why doesn't it happen? Why would it not happen so much with the FTC? Because the argument you use to prevail ultimately has to go through the federal courts in our system. And what's the argument that agencies use to win before the federal courts? Why do you defer to us? I think Chevron, other doctrines are ultimately meaningless because they're so manipulable. I think you get the deference you earn. You first persuade the reviewing court that you did a good job, and then they can say the wonderful words that accompany deference. They can do that then. But you have to persuade them that you've done a good job. And one of the ways you do that is to show, in the case of the FTC, you've brought all of this awesome expertise to bear on solving the problem so that your problem is unmistakably the best in class. At that point, the courts will say, even a court of exalted experts that we have in the DC Circuit, remarkable experts, will say, good job, good on you, affirmed. You don't get the deference automatically. When I was general counsel, I told the board, never bring a case if you think that's going to be the margin of victory. That we couldn't win unless we get some deference, whether it's substantial evidence or some other wonderful ethereal doctrine that says you get the benefit of the doubt. I said, that's an illusion. In the desert of litigation, that is the mirage to which you can crawl, but it becomes another sand dune, and your case will die in the desert. Don't rely on it. What you do rely on is good professional work, which ultimately involves showing that your expertise is the foundation of the successful case. You used your expertise. If it seems that you brought the case not because of your expertise, but because you had a 32 at your temple, and the 32 was held by an elected official saying, do this, I think you get no deference at all. You'll bring your case, but it will die in the courts. And when we think of independence and autonomy, the autonomy, the measure of insulation that must be preserved at all costs for an expert agency is the sense in reality and in appearance that you acted on the basis of the superior expertise that's vested in you. And you did not act because political forces have directed you to do this. So I think the discipline that would make presidents hesitate to use removal power casually is the fact that agency action ultimately must go through the courts and the judges are keenly attentive to what you did and why you did it. A final thought on looking at this, this, this compressed history of the FTC's experience is I think if we think of the expertise that an agency can usefully develop, there's a gap in many ways, and that's history. I think an agency would be wise to have the small office 
maybe one person of the official historian, to know the history that Tom Merrill is bringing to bear in his, his paper on rulemaking, to know the history of how the power evolved and how the functions changed over time and to anticipate what happens, and this goes back to my work with David, what happens when you add new functions that pull you in another direction, make you use different tools, do different things? Uh, if you don't have that, and there's a tendency not to have it in a regime change when you come in, you miss the significance and side effects of decisions you're taking day in and out, day in and day out going ahead. So, independence, wrong word. What do you have to be independent? You have to show the court that you used your own judgment in bringing cases, and yet used your expertise. Does Humphrey's executor matter? Some, but does it really add another significant layer of oversight? I'd say the oversight is pretty damn powerful as it is. Thank you. Ever the professor, if you have got questions uh, for, for Bill, fire away. We can do it for a couple minutes before we, uh, we break and come back, if there are any questions. Please. <laughs> it doesn't have a demonstrated history of independence. Uh, I'd, say, I'd say it has been divergent in one notable respect over time with some variation, and that is the Section 5 mandate uh, to be used effectively and to be used in a way that Congress sees as being effective has to, by definition, go beyond something that the department's doing already. That is to pick up things that the department wouldn't do. And at a time when the system is contracting, Arguably, that makes sense, perhaps, contracting in a way that it shouldn't uh, in, the, in the sports world of, of, the, of the fall in the United States that the strike zone is collapsing too much and ought to be reset. Uh, that's when you might see the FTC doing things. But I would say even there, when it was moving beyond the bounds of what the department did, it did in a way that reflected, to use the language in the cases, the spirit of the antitrust laws. So. If the Department of Justice had established in a, state, uh, in, in a case clearly that an agreement to set output levels and prices was fundamentally illegal, and the FTC comes along and says, if you're a group of pasta manufacturers and you conclude that competition on quality is disruptive in the sector, and you form an agreement to say, we will not use high quality pasta, uh, uh, grain to make our pasta because that will tamp in competition the FTC brings a case that says that is just as bad as the price and output restriction. That's operating within the spirit of something the department had done. Um, now, in the modern era, the area where we've seen more divergence is a number of issues related to intellectual property. But I'd say, I'd say for the most part, uh, the, the, the Venn diagram over, over, overlaps uh, uh, substantially. Jeff. How important do you think the, the multi-member aspect of the commission is, and also the political party affiliation aspect? Would, if those went away, how important would that be? I, I, um, I'd like to think that it would give you more freedom to pick a better ensemble. And I think of my experience on the board at the CMA, which does not have um, Similar restrictions, the board fulfills a different function, but it does what the board really should do, which is set strategy, evaluate risk, reward. Uh, I look at every meeting I had, we'd had one monthly meeting with the board, every single meeting I had with the board in London was better than any meeting I had at the FTC. And it's in part because of the composition of the board and the kinds of people that were drawn to it and appointed through their appointment process. I despair that we could do that here, uh, the, the temptation in the White House and the Congress to pick people who are responsive to them. Uh, you can guess, if I asked you to guess, 
what is the what single characteristic beyond being a lawyer um, identifies the largest number of FTC commissioners? If you think a bit about this political control, they are former congressional staffers or members of Congress. That's the that's they want people they can talk to and regard as having similar values. The second group are people who came out of the White House. So from both political branches of government come the largest pool of members of the FTC. Maybe that would never change because they want that link to be in place, no matter what. But I'd like to think that you could step back and think, you know, what kind of expertise do we want on the board? About 100 people have served as Federal Trade Commissioners. Four economists in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in 108 years now, four. The original vision was there's got to be someone there all the time. You want to do a lot of tech? How about GASP? An engineer, maybe? Computer scientists? Wow, what an idea. Never happened. So I would like to think that if you dispensed with the political diversity requirement, you might be able to, you might have more freedom to look for a more diverse ensemble based on expertise and background than simply political affiliation. But I despair of that, Jeff, because I, 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 my concern would be no matter what the requirement is, it will all be filtered through an appointment and approval process that places such a premium on fidelity to a political point of view. Past background, please. The FTC will end up as a single-headed agency. It will be dissolved and reconstituted if this adjudication function is not brought back to life in a major way. And when I was a young person at the FTC in the late 70s, early 80s, and looking at trends over time, which were developing then, we had eight administrative law judges. There's one now. Uh, what we said again and again, from a narrow parochial view of trying to sustain the institution as a source of doing useful things, we said, if part three administrative adjudication does not become a centerpiece of policy making, this place is on the way out. And not simply on the way out in terms of Humphrey's executor saying, that's not the agency we looked at before. You don't need a board to decide to go to federal court. Uh, I, I, I think a, I think a, um, if you see the further attenuation of the administrative adjudication process, I think you're going to be, you, you might be headed to one. And a benefit of going to one is that it's more pressure on the Congress and the White House to pick someone of true distinction. You can't get away with parking people there who don't belong. One more question. Please. Yeah, um, I, I concur with what you Good, I think we're done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We have a concurrence. Good. You. <laughs> yes. I, 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 it took about eight years for us to get in front of an Article III judge where the FTC lawyer said, we can rule make in the, while we adjudicate, at which point the, the judges were like, well, thank you for that concession. Uh, because it took us forever, and we never got an answer about what we were doing unfairly, which I think was the foundation of the loss. But if we had not had to go through that administrative process, Hal, and had gone right through Article III, I think it would have changed things dramatically in my case specifically, but I think it happens a lot. And ah, that's where, that's where I'm, I'm just going to ask, yeah. as the academic, tell me what a lot is. Well, I don't, I'm not in court all the time. I, I, pay, I pay attention to the outliers and to those that are mainstream examples, but I don't know how representative your experience was. Right, uh, which 
which is what was our experience for years in health and human services. And we were in Kafka land with the FTC because they were Was Kafka one of the uh, it's name a parties? I like to okay, uh, yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Right. Um, I, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I, I take, I take the, the episodes uh, very seriously in my, in my current life. Uh, I guess what I'd be intrigued to know is to what extent um, your treatment there deviated from the guidance they put out on what unfairness is. That is, did it give you any sense at all about what they might be looking at? Well, you know, in the unfairness area, I mean, uh, uh, you know, here's, here's what a, a law office would do generally. I mean, you've got, you have a policy statement that's fairly detailed. Uh, it's a fairly elaborate statement uh, with notes about what they think is in and not. There are adjudicated cases. And cybersecurity. Well, that's, 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 that's new. Um, uh, but uh, in, in, in other areas, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm so accustomed to listening to the great bar in this city, which uh, sees themselves as being the smartest people on earth and great Kremlinologists. I think they tell their clients all the time, we know, we can tell you. Uh, and so often confidently saying, you know, we, we give people guidance on this. You can go this way, this way. There's a little bit of danger here. Are they making it all up? Are they really that disabled? in providing guidance about what happens. I'm, I'm, I spend too much of my time with people who would not suggest that, that they do know what it means. They have a pretty good idea. And even if they can't say, here's a precise probability that this practice will carry you in this direction or that direction, um, they give pretty good guidance on this. I'm not asking you to change lawyers, but um, I, just, I just wonder. Uh, I guess uh, a fun, I, I would say that uh, a, a weakness for all policymaking involving these issues is the underlying expertise of the agencies. That's a global problem. There's only one agency on earth I know that's tried to address that in a meaningful way. That's the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK. But, but the problem of how you deal with highly dynamic sectors that have formidable technical features to them and understanding the technical features is vital to doing a good diagnosis, suggesting a solution and carrying it out. That's a problem that has dogged the system since 1890. And that's a chronic concern from the background and it wouldn't surprise you that if we go back and look at commentary at the time, it's the same critique about petroleum refining or aluminum manufacturing. It's the same basic concern. And it's a legitimate one. But part of what I'd say is we don't want to pay for that expertise. We do not want to build agencies that have that expertise. And every time I hear legislators talk about how we want bolder, better programs in this area, I say, do you want to pay for it? And in this nation, as you may know, we want to drive a Mercedes, but we want to pay for a Chevy. And uh, and, 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 and if, you're not, if you don't want to do that, or at least pay the same scale as the CFPB, which is about a 20% policy, if it's, why is that worth so much more? Not clear to me. I know because it's how they're paid. But, uh, but if we don't want to do it, at one level I say, no, well, we get what we pay for. All the way. But good point. Thank don't, you. Don't step back. No. Please join me again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will uh, turn to all things uh, Article 3 and, and Part 3 uh, in the afternoon, but uh, we will reconvene 1.30, so you get some time if you want to walk around, get some coffee, whatever you need. Uh, we will be back with Panel 3 at 1.30. Thank you.
think Josh said he was going to kick us off, but I don't see him. Josh, um, he's the head of the economic. Doing some housekeeping. So you go. Yep. Okay, on we go to panel three. Um, I will hand things over to our moderator, Chad Squatteri, who will get us started and introduce the panel. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, so for those that don't know me, my name is Chad Squateri. I am a law professor at the Catholic University uh, of America, and uh, it's great to be here today. Um, the morning, uh, this morning's conference got off to a great start, and I know we're looking forward uh, to the third panel today, uh, which is titled The FTC versus the Roberts Court, uh, The Major Questions Doctrine, Rulemaking, and more. So we're joined by uh, three expert panelists, uh, two in person, one virtually, uh, who have each contributed to this area of the law, and I look forward uh, to hearing what they uh, have to say. Uh, so first we'll hear from Professor Thomas W. Merrill. Professor Merrill is a Charles Evans Hughes Professor of Law at the Columbia Law School. Uh, pr previously, he served on the faculty at Northwestern and Yale Law Schools. From 1987 to 1990, he was Deputy Solicitor General at the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, Professor Merrill has taught administrative law for many years and has written extensively about many topics, including the Chevron Doctrine, uh, which he has recently published a, a spectacular book uh, just this year on. He earned his BA degrees from uh, Grinnell College and University of Oxford, and he earned his JD from the University of Chicago Law School. And I might add, keep that reference to Chicago Law as we go through the rest of the panel and see if we can spot a pattern. Uh, so next we will hear from the Honorable uh, Eugene Scalia. Uh, uh, former Secretary Scalia has a nationally prominent practice in both administrative law and labor and employment law. Uh, he also serves as a senior fellow at the Administrative Conference of the United States, and he has successfully challenged a range of regulatory actions, including those at the SEC, the CFTC, the Financial Services Oversight Council, and the Labor Department. From 2019 to 2021, he served as United States Secretary of Labor, having previously served from 2002 to 2003 as a Solicitor of Labor, uh, which is the Chief uh, Legal Officer at the Labor Department. He earned his undergraduate degree from the University of Virginia, and he graduated cum laude from the University of Chicago Law School, where he was Editor-in-Chief of the Law Review. Uh, last but not least, we are uh, joined by Professor Jeffrey Lubbers, Professor Lubbers is a professor of practice in administrative law at American University's Washington College of Law, where he has taught since 1996. He specializes in administrative law and related courses and has taught at various law schools in the US and abroad, including in Japan. From 1982 to 1995, Professor Lubbers was the research director of the Administrative Conference of the United States, where he is now special counsel. He is the author of numerous publications, including, as is very relevant to today's panel, a widely cited article entitled, It's Time to Remove the Mossified Procedures of the FTC rulemaking, for FTC Rulemaking. Uh, Professor Lubbers earned his AB degree from Cornell and earned his law degree, as you might have guessed, from the University of Chicago. Uh, so the way uh, today's panel will, will work is we'll start off with each of the, of the panelists. I'll, I'll ask each of them you know, maybe one or two questions, uh, and then we will turn things over to the audience for questions. So please, of course, uh, start thinking about what you might like to ask our panelists. All right, so Professor Merrill, we will start with you. Great. I hope you can hear me all right. Um, and I apologize. Uh, I'm happy to be here, but I apologize for having to appear by Zoom. Uh, so I take it the... Um, the topic of today's panel primarily is whether the FTC has authority to engage in what's called substantive or legislative rulemaking on, on questions of antitrust law. Um, and I'd like to address the question uh, from the perspective of uh, ordinary statutory interpretation as it's currently applied, engaged in by the Supreme Court. Um, I, I expect some of my co-panelists will talk about things like the major questions doctrine and maybe the Chevron doctrine. I'm happy to engage on that, but I think there's a clear answer uh, if we just approach this question from the perspective of ordinary statutory interpretation, so that's what I propose to start off with. Um, the uh, case for legislative rulemaking authority and antitrust uh, by the FTC is grounded in a provision of the original FTC Act adopted in 1914, 
So I think the appropriate place is to start with that. Uh, the 1914 Act uh, contained two uh, primary uh, uh, provisions of regulatory or, or of, of, uh, of authority for the FTC. Uh, one was Section 5, which gave the FTC authority uh, to engage in adjudications uh, to determine whether particular firms or in particular industries were engaged in uh, unfair competition. Uh, uh, th this was a quintessential adjudicatory uh, process. It started with a complaint. There were hearings. Uh, evidence was gathered. Uh, the agency issued a decision. Uh, the remedy was a cease and desist order. But even that could only be enforced by a court uh, uh, to whom the order was taken by the agency for, for a judgment enforcing it. The second regulatory authority of some uh, importance was Section 6. Section 6 authorized the FTC to engage in investigations uh, of corporations or particular industries and to issue reports uh, about what it found, uh, which would be uh, designed to illuminate uh, the conditions in these firms or industries for the purposes of, for the general public or for Congress. Uh, now, uh, buried, if you will, within Section 6 of the FTC Act uh, was a provision, uh, uh, subsection G of the Act. Uh, and subsection G included the language authorizing the Commission uh, from time to time to classify corporations and to make rules and regulations for the purpose of carrying out the provisions of the Act. So that provision, uh, which was in uh, Section 6, the investigatory provision, uh, is uh, the language that uh, Chairman Lena Khan and the other uh, majority members of the FTC are relying upon in support of the proposition that they have legislative rulemaking authority uh, over antitrust matters. Now, I think the structure of the Act uh, immediately calls that into question. Um, uh, Section 5 is really the only regulatory provision in the original Act, and there's not a single mention in Section 5 about rulemaking uh, of any sort whatsoever. It's all adjudication. Uh, the only rulemaking uh, provision is the one in Section 6, which, of course, is limited simply to investigations, not to any sort of regulatory action. Um, the Supreme Court, of course, is... Uh, uh, somewhat loath to engage in uh, legislative history or look at legislative history these days. Uh, but that's, I think, primarily when uh, somebody's uh, offering some kind of tidbit from the legislative history to suggest what the subjective intentions of the legislature might have been. I think the court is more willing uh, to look at large objective facts uh, reflected in the history of the evolution of a particular statute. In this case, I think that's quite significant. The, uh, the history uh, and this is quite objective, uh, tells us that the Section 5 originated in the Senate. The Senate wanted to pass a bill that contains a power to engage in case-by-case -case adjudication uh, with respect to matters of unfair competition. Uh, the House had a very different bill, which simply authorized the FTC to engage in investigations. The conference committee decided that the proper thing to do was to paste these two ideas together uh, and the final act then reflected both uh, with the Senate uh, proposal for adjudication and the House proposal for investigations. Uh, but it's significant that the, uh, the House proposal, uh, which did not have any regulatory authority in it at all, uh, was the one that contained the subsection uh, G of Section 6, authorizing uh, from time to time uh, the Commission to issue rules and regulations to implement the act. Um, uh, now, by itself, the word act would suggest that this authority extends throughout the statute to both Section 5 and to other provisions of the statute. But the history would strongly suggest that the reference to act was a holdover from the House bill, uh, which contained no authority beyond the investigatory authority. And so the reference to act, uh, which comes from the House bill, uh, was undoubtedly uh, there because of the uh, the act at that time of the House passed the bill uh, was limited to investigations uh, only. Um, so I think the structure of the act strongly indicates that this uh, general rulemaking grant was not intended to authorize any type of uh, rules having the force of law, as we call them. Um, this is strongly reinforced by some interpretive canons. Uh, one interpretive canon, uh, which has been around since the beginning of the American Republic, if not before, uh, is that uh, interpretations by agencies of the statute that they're authorized to implement 
which are contemporaneous or nearly contemporaneous with the enactment of the statute are entitled to significant weight. Well, from day one of its existence, the FTC uh, uh, indicated uh, repeatedly that it was only authorized to engage in adjudications uh, as a regulatory matter. It had no authority to issue regulations. And in fact, uh, in 1922, the annual report of the FTC admonished uh, various lawyers who might be reading the report uh, that they should avoid the common mistake of thinking that the FTC could give them uh, any advice uh, in the form of orders, rules, or regulations uh, unconnected uh, with any particular proceeding before it. In other words, the FTC's power was only to engage in adjudication, not to issue forward-looking uh, advice uh, that would pr apply prospectively. Uh, uh, another longstanding canon is that interpretations uh, uh, that have been around for a long time and have been consistently adhered to by an agency are entitled to significant weight. Uh, here, uh, it's significant that the FTC, for roughly the first 50 years of its existence, uh, never uh, regarded itself as having authority to issue legislative regulations. Uh, uh, this is confirmed by the Attorney General's uh, uh, report on the administrative process. Uh, there was a monograph prepared as part of that report about the FTC in 1939, which reported the agency's view uh, that nothing in the statutes administered by the agency makes any provision for the promulgation of rules applicable to whole industries. Uh, so uh, for roughly almost 50 years, the agency repeatedly interprets its authority as not to authorize anything that might resemble legislative rulemaking. In 1938, uh, the act was amended to uh, specify that the FTC had authority not only over uh, uh, co uh, unfair competition, i.e. antitrust issues, but also uh, unfair and deceptive practices, i.e. something like uh, false advertising. Uh, and so the uh, agency's authority was expanded in that sense, but it continued to proceed entirely by adjudication. Uh, it, there's good evidence that Congress accepted this understanding. Uh, 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 Congress passed several narrow grants of rulemaking authority uh, in, in the latter part of this uh, first 50-year period or so, uh, but always uh, very narrowly delimited to particular industries. Uh, there was something called the Wool, Labeling, Wool Products Labeling Act in 1940, the Fur Products Labeling Act of 1951, and the Flammable Fabrics Act of 1953. These were, I think, primarily uh, oriented toward deceptive, uh, false and deceptive practices, uh, uh, but they were rules, uh, but they were authorized by very specific legislation that Congress passed, again, suggesting that Congress understood that the agency had no generic rulemaking authority. Uh, the only discordant element uh, in the interpretive process is this uh, decision by the D.C. Circuit in 1973 called uh, National Petroleum Refiners versus FTC. Uh, the, this was a, a case was generated when the FTC, as part of, I guess, the first energy crisis, uh, promulgated a trade regulation, it was called, requiring uh, gasoline stations to post the octane rating of gas uh, on each pump uh, at the gas station. Uh, uh, this was challenged as beyond the, by the petroleum industry, as beyond the authority of the agency because it had no authority to issue a regulation like this, and the district court agreed. But when the case went up to the D.C. Circuit, a panel of judges that would have to be characterized as an all-star all panel of activist uh, D.C. Circuit judges uh, reversed, uh, and the D.C. Circuit held that subsection 6G, uh, the section that was buried in the provisions authorizing investigations by the FTC, in fact was a general uh, grant of authority to the agency that included the authority to pass, uh, adopt legislative regulations. Uh, basically, uh, it was a kind of a faux plain meaning interpretation. The court uh, said that the statute, the Victoria grant of authority for rules and regulations was facially ambiguous. Uh, Section 5 did not say it was the exclusive source of regulatory authority, uh, and that uh, lots of recent decisions by courts indicated that rulemaking was very helpful and advantageous, and therefore the ambiguity should be resolved in favor of giving the FTC this broad regulatory authority. It kind of flipped. Uh, the standard assumption that, you know, agencies only have the authority expressly given to them by Congress uh, to say that if there's an ambiguity, we presume the agency has broad authority unless there's something expressly di disclaiming that. Um, uh, a couple of interesting things happened after uh, National Petroleum Refiners in 1973. Uh, 
Uh, at the same time that the D.C. Circuit was uh, revising the authority of the FTC by judicial interpretation, Congress was considering uh, whether or not to uh, expand the FTC's authority in certain ways, including uh, granting uh, express authority to engage in legislative rulemaking. And in the FTC Improvements Act of 1975, Congress did adopt such legislation. Uh, the rulemaking grants was interesting for a number of reasons. One was that it, it was different from ordinary rulemaking under Section 553 of the APA, which is just notice and comment, because it imposed some additional restrictions on rulemaking. The rules had to be submitted to the House and Senate before they went into effect, for example. Uh, the rules uh, also had to um, uh, be uh, determined in a hearing before the ALJ, not before the Commission. Uh, they had to be supported by substantial evidence. Uh, and so on and so forth. So this is a more restrictive grant of rulemaking than Section 553's uh, rulemaking provision. Uh, the statute says explicitly that this is the exclusive authority uh, of rulemaking of, by the agency with respect to uh, uh, false and deceptive practices. Uh, uh, and so uh, by implication, uh, the, the, any rules in that area, which has been the one area where the FTC has been most active in promulgating sort of forward-looking guidance, have to comply with this new uh, grant of rulemaking authority. Then there is a sentence which is I will call the savings clause. Uh, uh, and after saying that this is the exclusive source of authority for rulemaking, uh, the so-called savings clause says, in proceedings, in the, the preceding sentence, I mean the one that says that it's exclusive, um, shall not affect any authority of the commission to prescribe rules, including interpretive rules, and general statements of policy with respect to unfair methods of competition in or affecting commerce. So I think that uh, the FTC leadership will undoubtedly cite this sentence and say that, well, what that means is it preserves the National Petroleum Refiner's interpretation that the FTC, uh, with respect to uh, unfair competition, i.e. antitrust matters, uh, has authority, the authority that the FTC, that the, excuse me, the DC Circuit recognized to promulgate legislative rules. Um, I don't think that holds up but, uh, on, upon closer examination. Um, for one thing, if you look closely at the language of the so-called savings clause, uh, it only mentions two types of rules. The APA has a whole uh, a cluster of things that are rules, including not just legislative rules, but also procedural rules and policy, general statements of policy uh, and interpretive rules. And the only things that are mentioned in the savings clause with respect to competition are interpretive rules and policy statements. And I think that probably what happened, by the way, the savings clause was added by the conference uh, committee uh, with no uh, explanation. Um, I think what probably what happened was that somebody pointed out that well, since 1968, which precedes this whole period of controversy, uh, the FTC and the Justice Department had uh, promulgated so-called merger guidelines, uh, which were being used by both the uh, FTC and the DOJ Antitrust Division uh, to review uh, proposed mergers. Uh, and so you wouldn't want to have this uh, language of exclusivity about rules uh, uh, to be interpreted as suggesting that perhaps uh, these merger guidelines are impermissible. So in order to save the merger guidelines, uh, this, uh, uh, this sentence, in effect, was written the way it was. Now, the merger guidelines are not legislative rules. I would classify them as a policy statement uh, informing the public as to the kinds of factors and, and conditions that the two agencies will look to in deciding whether or not to take a position uh, in, in a future adjudication, either in court or before the FTC, as to whether a merger should be approved or not. Uh, they're not binding in the way that legislative rules are thought to be binding. So I think that the savings clause, for that reason, really should be interpreted as being limited to interpretive rules and policy statements. Another thing to keep in mind is that ever since 1914, with the passage of the Clayton Act, both the FTC and the, and the Justice Department have had concurrent authority to enforce uh, most of the antitrust laws. The Justice Department has always proceeded by adjudication in enforcing the antitrust laws. It goes to court, it files a case, it argues that something violates the antitrust laws, and it either wins or loses. It would be extremely odd, I think, for Congress to grant the FTC, the other agency, which also proceeds by adjudication, authority to promulgate legislative rules about uh, antitrust policy, 
uh, when the DOJ does not have authority to promulgate rules about uh, antitrust policy. I, I don't think this would go down very well with the DOJ, and I don't think that it makes any sense uh, to give uh, one entity uh, this authority but not the other. Um, I think probably, therefore, that the, um, uh, the Improvements Act properly interpreted means that uh, any authority, the reference to any authority in, in matters of unfair competition refers to any authority as correctly interpreted, not the authority as construed by national petroleum refiners. After all, if this case does get to the Supreme Court, as I think it might, well, if the FTC carries through on its threat, um, uh, the uh, Supreme Court's not bound by anything the D.C. Circuit might say 50-some uh, years ago. Um, uh, about statutory interpretation in this area. Um, the last point I would make is that there's another statute which is also relevant here, which is the stat a statute that was passed one year later in 1976, which is essentially codified uh, the pre-merger approval process. Uh, uh, and this, uh, this is uh, 45 U.S.C. 18A. Uh, subsection D of this new statute uh, in effect, is a grant of rulemaking authority to the FTC and the DOJ concurrently uh, to promulgate certain rules about the pre-merger approval process. Uh, these, this grant is rather interesting. It's basically a grant of procedural rule authority. They're supposed to they have authority to promulgate procedures uh, for this process. It also contains uh, an authority to uh, uh, create exemptions. Uh, uh, one clause says that the uh, rules uh, the, the DOJ and FTC can jointly uh, decide to uh, exempt classes of persons, acquisitions, transfers, or transactions which are not likely to violate the antitrust laws. They would be exempt from this pre-merger notification requirement. I think it's significant that Congress, even after this turmoil over the National Petroleum Refiners and the Improvements Act and so forth, passes a statute that basically confers specific rulemaking authority, very narrow rulemaking authority, uh, on the FTC uh, in this area. Again, the assumption of Congress would have to be uh, that there was no pre-existing authority to promulgate such rules under this ancient provision of subsection G of section 6 of the original act. So in other words, I think that um, uh, if the Supreme Court gets its hands on this, and it, it, it very likely will, this has got to be considered an important question. Uh, considerations about the structure of the act, uh, about its uh, interpretation over time uh, by the agency, consistent interpretation over time uh, by the agency, uh, about the um, uh, understandings of what generic rulemaking grants like this were understood to mean in 1914, uh, and th the fact that Congress has repeatedly legislated on the assumption that the FTC does not have generic uh, legislative rulemaking authority would all convince the Supreme Court, not just uh, those who uh, adhere to the major questions doctrine, but maybe even the entire court, uh, that the FTC does not have uh, this authority. Uh, so uh, that's my confident prediction. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for that. So I assume the folks online can hear me uh, with just this mic, but someone will correct me if that's wrong. Uh, Professor Merrill, I have a, a question regarding uh, the interpretive framework that you lay out. Uh, and, the, and the final third of your paper. Um, specifically, you refer to the various canons, and I just want to wonder if you could flesh those out a little bit. Uh, the, the one is the uh, contemporaneous uh, interpretation by the agency. And I'm wondering, is that important because just because the agency is closer in time and has a better semantic understanding of maybe the original public meaning of the statute, or is it because the agency has some type of special insight into what Congress was uh, attempting to accomplish? And then the other canon you referred to was, you know, looking at how agencies interact with uh, later enacted statutes by Congress. Uh, and there you cite uh, Brown and Williamson, of course. And, and Brown, Brown and Williamson is... Um, uh, Chad? Yes. Can you, can you hear me? I can't hear a word you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> if that's directed to me. This is a problem that we were having earlier today when we checked this out. I can, couldn't, uh, can, can you hear me now? Uh, I, I couldn't hear what was coming from your end. All right. I think we, uh, if you can't hear me now, Professor, I think we might just switch over to uh, former Secretary Scalia. Let's, let's try that. We'll turn, we'll turn things over now to uh, former Secretary Scalia. Thanks, Chad. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you and a pleasure to be back at the Mayflower, by the way. I'm 
hoping that uh, I can have uh, as much fun uh, with you all today as I did just a week ago when I was here with uh, 300 people, a rocking band for my son's wedding reception. <laughs> so this will be a different kind of fun, but hopefully in its own way it'll measure up. Um, I thought I would start with the court side, the Roberts Court side of what our panel is about, which is the uh, Roberts Court and the Federal Trade Commission. And, you know, I, I, I think in some ways of what I call the, the, the new Roberts Court, which is to say the Supreme Court under uh, Chief Justice Roberts with the addition of the three appointees by President Trump. Because I think with those appointments, uh, the court is a substantially different court than it was uh, prior uh, to the, the Trump administration. And I think one way in which uh, the court is really uh, pretty remarkable right now is it appears that administrative law is an area where uh, those three justices and the three Republican appointed justices who are, were already uh, on the court are particularly like, likely and successful to achieve uh, six justice uh, majorities for different propositions. I think there are indications that uh, each one of those six justices cares uh, you know, greatly uh, about issues of administrative law, which is a little bit unusual to have such a large number of justices who do. And of course, others on the court uh, do as well. Justice Kagan, uh, in particular, had uh, been a professor of administrative and constitutional law. Uh, before becoming Solicitor General. Um, and, and then when you examine uh, each of the justices, I think it's fair to say that the three appointed during the Trump administration, each of them is more interested in, uh, than the justice he or she preceded in identifying appropriate limits on the power and actions of administrative agencies. So to take them one by one, uh, I think plainly uh, it would appear that, uh, uh, that Justice Barrett is more interested than uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, in uh, a constrained view of the administrative state, uh, uh, Kavanaugh more so than Kennedy, and, and even, uh, and this might surprise some people initially, but even uh, Justice Gorsuch more so than uh, Justice Scalia. And just to take that example, uh, my father, Justice Scalia, was for most of his career uh, in, uh, uh, as a judge, a very strong uh, proponent of Chevron deference, uh, although in the last few years you saw that that uh, uh, confidence in deference doctrines waning. And also, uh, Justice Scalia was skeptical about uh, aggressive use of the non-delegation doctrine. He wrote an important opinion in that area. Uh, saying that it was a, a difficult doctrine to apply and not one that he was inclined to give great weight to. Uh, Justice Gorsuch is distinguished in part by strong views absolutely to the contrary on those two issues. His uh, probably best known Court of Appeals decision uh, before going uh, on the Supreme Court was a, a pretty strongly worded criticism of the Chevron doctrine and he's also been a strong proponent of a reinvigorated non-delegation doctrine. So it's a different court. Uh, it's a court uh, with a number of justices very interested in administrative law uh, and a constrained view of the administrative state. And I think that this is one of the principal areas where this court will make a mark and where a large number of justices will be able to achieve majorities. Another area appears to be religious liberties, uh, but certainly administrative law is a foremost area, I think, of likely agreement uh, among not just a majority, but perhaps at times a a supermajority of the court. So that's the court. Uh, let me uh, return to the Federal Trade Commission then. And you know, I, w particularly when it comes to the question that uh, Professor Merrill was addressing, which is the rulemaking uh, authority of the commission when it comes to uh, unfair methods of competition. Uh, you know, the Federal Trade Commission is a really good law school exam on current issues in constitutional and administrative law. And let me start with the two issues I mentioned earlier, deference doctrines and the non-delegation doctrine. So um, Professor Merrill gave, a, I think, a very good, very uh, thorough explanation of why the uh, Federal Trade Act is best interpreted not to confer 
substantive rulemaking authority on the FTC over so-called unfair methods of competition. It gave the agency investigative authority over that. Uh, it can bring actions over it. Uh, but I think that by far the better view, despite that DC Circuit decision, is that as enacted, uh, the law did not give substantive rulemaking authority in the area. Uh, now, uh, I think National Petroleum was wrongly decided. Uh, I, I think that you shouldn't get to Chevron step one if you were inclined to apply Chevron. But I think, and Professor Merrill, uh, I think disagrees on this and uh, may, might address that later. My view is that this is an area to which the major questions doctrine will apply. Now, I think most of you are familiar, the major questions doctrine uh, applied in the West Virginia EPA decision last term, also applied in the decision regarding the OSHA vaccine mandate, uh, holds in so many words that if an agency is gonna do something really big and consequential, and, and let's add controversial, uh, it ought to have clear authority to do so. That's the nub of the idea as it's been expressed by the court in one decision it's based on the view that Congress does not hide elephants in mouse holes. So if it's an obscure, uh, vague provision and being used to do something seismic, uh, the major questions doctrine is likely to come into play. Now, there are uh, additional considerations the court has cited. Uh, if, for example, uh, an agency is finding an interpretation in such an obscure provision, which for decades it did not, uh, the courts indicated that would be another reason to invoke the major questions doctrine. Uh, as Justice Gorsuch suggested, if an agency is acting in an area traditionally the province of states, again, uh, major question doctrine more likely to come into play. But I think that uh, as the doctrine has been put forward by the court and given its rationale, it's a major question uh, whether the Federal Trade Commission in fact does have substantive rulemaking authority with respect to unfair methods of competition. As the Supreme Court itself has said, and I'll uh, give an excerpt of this in a moment, uh, what's an unfair method of competition? The court has said that's an elusive concept. Uh, that's a, you know, bro those are broad words, could uh, encompass a wide variety of things. The Supreme Court has already said this is broad, uh, big stuff. And it's not limited to a particular industry. It's you know, sort of you know, um, American commerce generally. Uh, so I do think that it's a, a broad authority likely to trigger the major questions doctrine. And then when you go and examine the statute, uh, even if you were applying the more traditional approach, or at least what today is the traditional approach laid out by Professor Merrill, the FTC loses. Uh, wheel out the major question doctrine, and it's just, it's not even close, I believe. Uh, and the FTC will have a very difficult time establishing that it can adopt a uh, unfair method of competition substantive rule. Let me then come to the non-delegation doctrine, which as you all know, is the principle that uh, it's Congress's job to legislate and Congress cannot wholesale uh, delegate that responsibility to administrative agencies. It's gotta do the big work itself. There's an obvious relationship with the major questions doctrine, which itself is premised in the view that Congress addresses the big issues and agencies uh, play a more interstitial role, uh, non-delegation doctrine is explicitly uh, constitutional. Uh, so in what I call the New Roberts Court, you now have five justices, at least, who are interested in uh, reviving the non-delegation doctrine. The court has not used that doctrine to strike down a statute uh, since 1935. Um, but you've got five justices who've said uh, that they believe the doctrine should be uh, reinvigorated and actually made more demanding than it's been articulated by the Supreme Court uh, for, for many years. That's in the Gundy case with uh, Justice Gorsuch dissenting and joined by the Chief Justice, which I think is notable that the Chief Justice joined that dissent. So you've got a Supreme Court today interested in revisiting uh, the non-delegation doctrine and uh, go back to 1935 when they last wielded it to find a statutory delegation uh, unconstitutional. And it was actually a delegation that looks a lot like what the FTC would be trying to do now. That was a case, Schechter Poultry, under the National Industry, Industrial Recovery Act, where uh, authority was given to adopt uh, 
standards of fair competition, standards of fair competition. So, you know, let's compare that to uh, 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 rules regarding unfair methods of competition. Seems like just sort of a mirror image, other side of the coin. Um, very similar language. Now, a couple things about Schechter, Schechter poultry. It is true that in Schechter poultry, the court uh, bent over backwards to explain why unfair methods of competition mean something different than uh, uh, fair uh, uh, practices, um, uh, fair, fair, fair competition. Um, so they did draw that distinction. It's, it's, it's a little bit weak, but very important to the court in that case as well was this. They were distinguishing the FTC Act. They were saying, you know, this National Recovery Act is a problem. FTC Act, no, but, you know, but why? And so let me just read this, this passage, and there are others to this effect. Um, the court said, we have said that the phrase unfair methods of competition has a broader meaning, uh, that it does not admit of precise definition. See, they're, they're saying it's pretty broad and loosey-goosey. Uh, it's scoped being left to judicial uh, determination as controversies arise. Uh, what are unfair methods of competition are thus to be determined in particular instances upon evidence in the light of particular competitive conditions of what is found to be a sub specific and substantial public interest. Um, and then they say, to make this possible, Congress set up a special procedure, a commission, a quasi-judicial body. A and then finally, they say uh, that in the, this Recovery Act, in providing for codes, the act dispenses with this administrative procedure and with any administrative procedure of an analogous character because it was about setting up codes of fair competition, setting up rules. So there you have it. You've got a court that is interested in revisiting uh, the non-delegation doctrine. Uh, you've got the last non-delegation case specifically talking about the, uh, uh, FT, uh, the, the, the Federal Trade Commission Act, and you've got it emphasizing how it was judicial, case by case in nature. Uh, that, I think, also is real trouble for the FTC if it now tries to adopt substantive competition rules. It's going to have to deal with this problem in the face of a Supreme Court and other courts, too, that are interested in the non-delegation doctrine. Let me uh, turn to the sort of third part of this law school exam that the, uh, the Federal Trade Commission's exercise in rulemaking, uh, and actually its activities more generally, uh, would present. And that has to do with uh, the president's authority over uh, uh, federal agencies and specifically the removal of authority. The Supreme Court, in another extremely important 1935 decision, Humphrey's executor, again addressed the Federal Trade Commission and held that it was not uh, an unconstitutional intrusion on the president's authority over the executive branch to restrict his ability to remove the commissioners of the Federal Trade Commission. This is a very important separation of powers decision. It's regarded by some as really foundational to the modern administrative state. And what was crucial to the court's holding was the view that the Federal Trade Commission was, as the court put it, a quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial body. Um, and because it was quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial and not exercising executive enforcement powers, the court thought it was OK to in, you know, limit the president's ability, and that would not intrude on his constitutional oversight of, of, of law enforcement. As my, uh, my law professor, David Curry, put it, uh, who's a wonderful uh, prof uh, constitutional law professor, he said, you know, this is the Supreme Court decision that says that it's OK to violate Article I of the Constitution as long as you're uh, also uh, violating Articles two and three. Um, and, and, but so that's Humphrey's executor, controversial case about the Federal Trade Commission. Fast forward now, you've got a court that is obviously not enamored of Humphrey's executor. They've made that clear in a number of decisions, including most recently uh, Celia Law. Uh, but you've got a Federal Trade Commission that is now a pretty vigorous enforcement agency. What the Supreme Court said in 1935 in explaining why it was not unconstitutional to restrict the president's ability to remove commissioners cannot be said of today's Federal Trade Commission.
So, you know, just to wrap up, um, as we talk about issues like uh, the, you know, the administrative state, the, the, this administration's agenda, we focus a lot on what the agencies are thinking. What do they want to do? What's their agenda? But it's really important in these circumstances to look to at what the courts are saying because uh, in, in the most important cases, they do get uh, the final word. And especially when it comes to the FTC's supposed substantive unfair method of competition rulemaking authority, uh, there are very, very strong reasons to believe that aggressive action by the commission in that area will uh, not be upheld by the court and actually may set back the FTC's authorities more broadly. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is regarding uh, the non-delegation doctrine and, and the Schechter poultry case that you mentioned. Um, so. In 1935, we have two non-delegation cases, and those concern uh, the development of you know, fair competition rules in one instance for the petroleum industry and one instance uh, for the poultry ind industry. Um, but just to use an example, FTC Commissioner Phillips, uh, in his recent report, uh, has spoken about how the current FTC you know, is seeking to essentially develop these uh, fair practice rules for the entire economy rather than just you know, one-off industries. So my question to you is, um, what implications do you think that type of you know, economy-wide scope has for the non-delegation doctrine and maybe also the uh, major questions doctrine? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an important distinction too, that in those two non-delegation cases, you were looking at relatively uh, industry-specific uh, actions potentially. Uh, here, the FTC's claim is to regulate competitive practices across the economy. Non-compete agreements in employment, uh, perhaps the competition practices of uh, internet-based uh, platforms. Uh, those are very uh, broad claims, each on its own, never mind together. Uh, and I think it's part of the reason that the Federal Trade Commission, when both the major question issue and the non-delegation issue are pressed, the commission will have a hard time squaring what it's seeking to do here with uh, even older Supreme Court precedent, never mind with the approach the Supreme Court's been taking toward uh, these issues in recent years. Great. Uh, one other question I had regards uh, your comment on Humphrey's executor. So as you mentioned, the court there um, of course, uh, noted that the FTC had these quasi-legislative and uh, judicial authorities, but since then, uh, the FTC has been um, provided with uh, executive authorities. And just to use the example of the, com the competition rules as well, right, we have an executive order from the President of the United States, who uh, I believe is the head of the executive branch, um, and you know that's associated with uh, press releases and things like that, um, which with an executive order asking the FTC to do something, it at least seems to undercut the idea that the FTC is not exercising executive authority. Uh, so I, my question to you is, you know, do you see this current court uh, as willing to extend Humphrey's executor if the FTC is exercising uh, executive authority? I think when you look at uh, decisions by this court, and really going all the way back to the PCAOB case, uh, which, boy, probably 15 years ago or so now, uh, it, it's clear that the current court is not enamored of Humphrey's executor. executor. What's much less clear is what they might want to do with it today. And what they have said is, uh, we ain't going any farther. Uh, uh, you know, anything that extends beyond what we permitted at Humphrey's executor uh, is going to be a problem. Right there, you can say, well, the FTC extends beyond because post Humphrey's executor, it was given additional enforcement authorities which change its nature. And Chad, I, I mean, I agree with the implication of your question. When you've got the chair of the Federal Trade Commission there at, with, the, with the president at the signing of an ex, what's something called an executive order, which is, I think, urging or employing or, imploring or begging the FTC to do certain things, but I kind of figure that the FTC actually wrote parts of that order anyway. Um, you know, I, it, it, that proximity toward uh, the executive branch's uh, agenda might become another, certainly a colorful fact that gets added in to litigation over whether the Federal Trade Commission should now be uh, more under the authority of the president. 
Great, well, thank you very much. Uh, now we'll turn over to Professor Lubbers, who I understand will be responding to both of our uh, first two panelists. Um, so Professor Lubbers, over to you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Um, I'm really honored to be on this panel with uh, Professor Merrill, who's certainly one of the leading scholars in the nation, and Jean Scalia, who's certainly one of the most effective lawyers in the nation. Um, however, one thing that I did learn in Japan was that if you go to the same university as somebody, <laughs> the younger graduate, the kohai, is supposed to give great respect to the elder graduate, the senpai, <laughs> and also to serve the senpai for the rest forever. <laughs> so I think I'm the senpai here. So <laughs> keep that in mind. Uh, anyway, um, since you both looked into your respective crystal balls as to what might happen if the FTC's activist agenda collides with the Supreme Court's activist agenda, I don't really feel like I can second guess your expert predictions. And I, and I can't disagree that both National Petroleum Refiners and Humphrey's executor would be vulnerable if this court took them up, especially if Gene argued the case. Um, Good idea. <laughs> but when Adam asked me to be on this panel, I think he was expecting me to provide a somewhat different take on these issues. So let me give you a few reactions. And I'm going to start with the major questions doctrine. Um, and I do agree with Tom's critique, I mean, um, yeah, with Tom's critique of the major questions doctrine in his paper. Um, because I think what started off in the MCI case and the Brown and Williamson case as a consideration that the court should use in statutory interpretation and in undertaking the Chevron two-step analysis has, during the pandemic, morphed into an Omicron-like variant that has the potential to swallow up not only the Chevron doctrine itself, but any significant effort by an agency to use existing statutory authority to do much of anything of significance. I say potential because we don't really know what major means yet in this context. The court really hasn't spelled that out, although they've talked about it. Some of the decisions limit the doctrine to questions of vast economic and political significance, while other formulations seem to leave out the word vast. Now, Professor Merrill well explains the term majors indeterminacy and the difficulties with trying to factor in political significance and comes to the conclusion that I agree with that, and that Gene disagrees with, that an exercise of the FTC's rulemaking authority over competition matters should not be deemed to fit the paradigm of the major questions doctrine. I would also add that any doctrine that depends on Congress to provide a, quote, clear statement also suffers from the indeterminacy of the word clear, not to mention the dysfunction that prevents Congress from passing most bills, at least those that are not part of the budget reconciliation process. Now, in other regulatory realms, we know that major means regulations with over $100 million of impact on the economy. That benchmark was set by Jimmy Carter in Executive Order 12044 in 1978. In today's dollars, that would be $455 million. But in the ensuing executive orders on rulemaking, that figure has not been indexed to inflation, and it remains at $100 million. Would any rule that has over $100 million of impact thus be within the major questions doctrine? I would hope not, because I think that would be debilitating to health, safety, environmental, and consumer regulation in our country. Secondly, we've kind of glossed over the benefits of using rulemaking instead of case-by-case -case adjudication to make policy. Even though rulemaking tends to be more time-consuming, the notice and comment procedure allows broad public participation and forces the agency to respond to public comments and is generally better geared to producing the factual and policy data needed to decide questions of legislative fact and policy. Rules are also more accessible to the regulated public than adjudicative orders. And agencies can provide a more holistic policy in a single rule as opposed to numerous case precedents. Of course, case by case adjudication does have some advantages of its own. And that's why some agencies like the NLRB have tended to rely on it. But the Supreme Court early on in the Chenery II decision in 1947, reaffirmed in the Bel Aerospace decision in 74, 
that, quote, the choice made between proceeding by general rule or by individual ad hoc litigation is one that lies primarily in the informed discretion of the administrative agency. But of course, the agency has to have the delegated authority to issue legislative rules. And most regulatory agencies have that authority. And in numerous cases in the past, the Supreme Court has interpreted general delegations of rulemaking authority to encompass the power to make binding regulations. Many statutes, while not explicitly authorizing legislative rules, contain language authorizing agencies to say, say and they say something like, to make such rules and regulations as may be necessary to carry out the provisions of this act. And numerous past decisions of the Supreme Court and DC Circuit have shown judicial willingness to find legislative rulemaking in such language. For example, in Thorpe v. Housing Authority in 1969, the Supreme Court interpreted HUD's statute granting it the power to, quote, make, amend, and rescind any rules and regulations as may be necessary to carry out the provisions of the, this act as giving it the power to make regulations with the force of law. And the court stated that such broad rulemaking powers have been granted in numerous other federal administrative bodies in substantially the same language. In American Hospital Association versus NLRB in 1991, the Supreme Court upheld the board's rulemaking authority in connection with bargaining unit determinations based on its statutory authority, quote, from time to time to make, amend, and rescind such rules and regulations as may be necessary to carry out the provisions of the act. The hospitals argued that another provision in the act requiring the board to determine the appropriate bargaining unit in each case undercut that authority, but the court unanimously upheld the board. And as recently as 2011 in Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research versus, versus US, the court stated that the question of whether Congress, quote, delegated authority to the agency generally to make rules carrying the force of law does not turn on whether Congress's delegation of authority was general or specific. Now I realize that this may contradict Tom, Tom's forceful 2002 article with Catherine Watts, and I hesitate to do that because I'm on thin ice if I try to debate them on this, but their thesis that the general, that general rulemaking authority must be accompanied by enforcement power to give rise to the power to issue binding rules has not yet gotten much traction in the courts, with one, one exception. And the Supreme Court has never cited the article. Of course, that may very well change. Um, and a lot of courts have recognized the virtues of rulemaking. Now, my own ad law professor, Kenneth Culp Davis, once famously stated that the procedure of administrative rulemaking is one of the greatest inventions of modern government. He might have been biased since he was one of the inventors. But he wasn't wrong. Notice and comment rulemaking has spread around the world. A 2016 World Bank study showed that over 110 countries engage in some form of notice and comment process uh, for rulemaking. As to whether antitrust is an area of the law, that requires case-by-case -case adjudication and is antithetical to rulemaking, I would point out that in United Airlines versus CAB in 1985, Judge Posner upheld the CAB's authority to issue antitrust rules in an opinion in which he also mentioned some cases upholding the FCC's power to issue similar rules. Professor Pierce has suggested that the Supreme Court would be receptive to an FTC campaign to outlaw most non-compete clauses. So I guess I don't buy the idea that rulemaking should not have any role to play in FTC regulation and anti-competitive practices alongside guidelines and case-by-case -case enforcement. Finally, I want to say a word about FTC rulemaking in the consumer protection area under the Magnuson Moss procedural requirements. We know that in 1975, Congress added Section 18 to the FTC Act to ratify the agency's power to issue trade regulation rules but in so doing, also added a bunch of additional procedures to the APA's rulemaking process. And they had added even more in 1980 and 1994. Some have pointed to Section 18 as a reaffirmation of the DC Circuit's National Petroleum decision that the FTC did have rulemaking authority under Section 6G. Others have suggested it was a reaction to the decision intended to constrain the Commission's rulemaking authority. Both things could be true. And we should bear in mind that National Petroleum upheld rulemaking authority for the FTC on any subject covered by Section 5 without differentiating between unfair and deceptive practice rules on the one hand and unfair method of competition rules on the other. On the other hand, Section 18 only applies to the Unfair and Deceptive Act rules. In fact, it 
specifically disclaims any effect on any authority of the commission to prescribe rules with un respect to unfair methods of competition. And I, I would say, um, with respect to what Tom said on this point, it doesn't only, that section doesn't only mention interpretive rules and policy statements. It says rules including interpretive rules and policy statements. Now, te technically and maybe textually, that means that unfair competition rules, if authorized, are only subject to the APA's rulemaking pr provisions. I admit that that result seems a bit odd, but given the difficulties presented by the Section 18 Mag Moss procedures, which added 15 <coughs> additional procedural steps to the APA's process, I wouldn't blame the Commission for reading it that way. Now, in an earlier article, I documented the long delays in FTC rulemaking that occurred after the Magnuson Moss procedures kicked in, especially after the 1980 amendments, when compared to the pre Mag Moss rulemakings or to the dozen rules that were issued by Congress's permission under the APA. The delays were so lengthy, lengthy that the FTC basically gave up on issuing new rules under Section 18 after 1980. Now, they're gearing up for another try, and the FTC is, has tried to streamline their internal processes for implementing Section 18, but such internal streamlining can only go so far. That's why I've advocated for legislation allowing the FTC to use APA procedures for issuing rules, as most agencies do. Congress also almost made that change in Dodd-Frank, but it was removed in the final stages of the bill's consideration. Moreover, and I'm coming to the end here, the fact that the Supreme Court cut back on the FTC's remedial power to achieve restitution for harm consumers and disgorgement of wrongful gains in the AMG case last year means that the agency is prevented from securing monetary relief in unfair or deceptive acts cases unless the act is covered by a trade regulation rule or a cease and desist order. So this accentuates the need for the FTC to be able to issue such rules under normal APA procedures. Finally, in closing, I guess I'll say, unlike Gene and, and Jen and maybe other, many others in this room, I'm disturbed by the Supreme Court's increasingly formalistic view of separation of powers. In my view, courts have sufficient powers of judicial review to overturn agency actions as ultra virus, arbitrary and capricious, or violative of required procedures. The Supreme Court doesn't need to tie the hands of Congress in how it structures government agencies. It doesn't need to undercut the independence of administrative law judges. Nor does it need to prevent Congress from authorizing agencies to fill in the, in fill in the inevitable gaps left in legislation by legislators who are either unable to solve the complicated problems of modern society or who prefer to let the expert agencies take the lead in figuring out how to do so. Thank you. Great, thank you, Professor, for that. So I believe before opening up to audience questions, we'll uh, ask our first two participants if they would like any response. But before that, I'm gonna take the uh, moderator's privilege of asking uh, one clarifying uh, question. Um, so in your, in your 2015 article um, that you reference in your, in your talk, um, you, you lay out all the extra procedural requirements uh, laid upon the FTC to issue uh, rules in the consumer protection space. Yes. So I guess my, my clarifying question is, um, doesn't that demonstrate that Congress, when, when they want to grant the FTC the authority to make rulemaking, to make rules in one space, doesn't it suggest that if they didn't do that for the competition space, that the FTC doesn't have uh, the authority to make rules in the competition space, or at least would have to be subject to those you know, supra APA procedural requirements? Well, I think Professor Merrill may have the better argument on, on this point, um, but, I, but I do think that um, they, they added that provision in section 18 that said this doesn't affect the FTC's, FTC's ability to issue rules, and then they said including interpretive rules and policy statements. So as he, acknowledges you could read it as saying that you know they were leaving that undisturbed now I, I think that is a little bit um, odd to read it that way but as I said courts have read general rulemaking uh, um, authorizations to allow legislative rulemaking so I think you could make that argument and if it's ambiguous enough then Chevron should apply <laughs> if the major questions doctrine doesn't. If I could briefly address that, 
Um, that's the way that argument runs. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's an example of once you throw the major questions doctrine in, how far more complicated uh, the FTC's case gets here. Uh, because at best, what Congress did in this legislation that followed the National Petroleum case, which Professor Merrill described, at best what it did was dodge the question uh, whether the FTC ha had competition rulemaking authority. Uh, once what you need from Congress is a clear statement, Congress evading the question, not wanting to deal with it, not being able to reach agreement on whether there was competition rulemaking authority is, uh, is proof positive that the agency does not have it. Professor Merrill, do you have a response? Uh, a couple points. I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, first, on the non-delegation doctrine, um, there, there have been, uh, uh, I think, uh, a number of uh, ways to give effect to this. The 1935 cases basically invalidated statutes for violating the non-delegation doctrine. That's proven to be difficult to replicate for the reasons that the great Justice Scalia articulated uh, in his various opinions about this. Uh, um, but another way of enforcing it um, was through something called non-delegation canons. Uh, and the idea here is that if a statute uh, seems to be giving uh, excessively vague or sweeping authority to an agency uh, in a sort of troubling fashion, uh, that the case, the courts ought to adopt a narrowing interpretation uh, in order to uh, obviate the uh, appearance that some kind of uh, unconstrained power has been given to an agency. Uh, and uh, I think that may be a more useful idea than the, than the major questions approach to non-delegation. Major questions approach um, seems to be in practice a kind of a, a statutory interpretation version of the invalidation strategy that has proven to be unworkable. The, 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 the canon approach, I think, uh, would fit better, certainly in the FTC case, for some of the reasons that Gene articulates. Uh, um, you, you could uh, go back to the Schechter Poultry case argument and say that, well, the antitrust laws are kind of open-ended, they, they're not very precise, uh, but we learn to live with them because they're applied case by case through this careful adjudication process and building up of precedence over time. Uh, and so that uh, a, a, a non-delegation canon approach would say that you know we should interpret the FTC's authority to be restricted to adjudications precisely to preserve that kind of restraining uh, effect on this uh, very va vague and, and sweeping, potentially sweeping grant of authority, uh, limiting it to adjudications uh, for the reasons that Schechter Poultry cited. I think that would be a helpful argument to make. Uh, if this is challenged, uh, uh, perhaps more helpful than talking about major questions. Uh, and Jeffrey sort of uh, alluded to some of my uh, problems with that, and I'll speak more about that in another session that we're having next week. Um, uh, on the uh, interpretation of general rulemaking grants, I have thought for some time that of all the things that has ha have happened in administrative law uh, since it really got going as an enterprise, that have uh, undermined uh, the separation of powers in our Constitution. Uh, it's hard to think of anything that's been more destructive than the attitude of courts like National Petroleum Refiners and a few other decisions uh, saying that any kind of general or vague rulemaking grant authorizes legislative rulemaking by the agency. So basically, if you think about it, legislative rulemaking is the most striking a form of transfer of power from Congress to the executive branch or to whatever you want to call these agencies. Uh, uh, they're basically being authorized to enact many statutes. Um, and to say that anytime Congress writes an ambiguous statute that makes some, waves its hand and says something about rules and regulations, that that means that the agency can enact many statutes as a sort of junior varsity Congress to adopt another uh, aphorism of Justice Scalia. Um, strikes me as a huge transfer of power uh, from one branch, from the uh, constitutionally delegated, designated branch to make uh, uh, laws for the United States uh, to another set of entities. Uh, and the fact that this was done without any serious thought by the courts uh, or any serious uh, evaluation of, of possible constraints on when this sort of interpretation was permissible, I, I think has done a huge uh, disservice. I, I, I think it should be permissible for Congress to 
expressly delegate this power if it thinks it's wise to do so. But if Congress hasn't thought about it and just passes one of these general grants that might just be referring to housekeeping rules or procedural rules or interpretive rules or something like that to say that all of a sudden this agency now has the power to enact legislative, enact legislative rules, uh, I think has really uh, uh, supercharged uh, the evolution of our system away from the one that uh, the Constitution contemplates. Thanks. But, but, but Tom, you do, you do allow Congress to do that if they also couple it with enforcement authority. Yes, rules. They, have to think, they have to think about it. They have to decide that they really want to do this mm -hmm. uh, before the courts can sort of uh, on their own authority say that, well, they must have done it uh, without thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one other point about the Schechter case, there, were, there are a couple other distinguishing points about it. One is that these these codes were industry-developed codes, yep. um, and that you know obviously has some potential conflicts of interest. And also, there was no notice and comment aspect to it at all. There were no public comments in the development of those codes. So I think, you know, it's it's somewhat, and that's why Justice uh, Cardozo went along with calling right. it a delegation running riot. Yeah, and if I are, could just make one more point about that too. Um, uh, Todd Rakoff at Harvard has argued that the reason why the delegations in Schechter Poultry in Panama refining were struck down was because the National Industrial Recovery Act was a trans-substantive act that applied to the entire American economy. Now, it's true that in those specific cases there were specific industries that were being uh, affected by their codes, but this was an attempt to regulate the entire economy of the United States. Uh, uh, and that may have given the court a uh, very great pause as to whether this kind of delegation uh, is something that we want uh, Congress to be able to make. And I, I think Gene's right that uh, effectively the, what the FTC is asking for, coupled with its, the, the vagueness of the antitrust laws, uh, is basically a tantamount to what the National Industrial Recovery Act did. All right, uh, we'll turn over open to audience questions. I believe we have microphones if you want to raise your hand. Any questions? As people question whether they have questions, looks like there's one here. Um, I just did want to commend to those of you interested in this topic, uh, Professor Merrill's, was it 2005 article with Catherine Watts. It really is an interesting history of congressional grants of rulemaking authority and uh, is something the FTC will need to contend with as these issues start being litigated. Um, the big question I think that uh, Professor Lubbers brings up about how rulemaking adjudicatory uh, rulemaking occurs worldwide, um, Your Honor and um, Professor Merrill, can you address like how the U.S. Anti how antitrust laws shouldn't why we shouldn't have that similar structure? Why is rulemaking a bad thing? I think it would be helpful. Or if, if it is. <laughs> well, you, may, you might find it hard to explain why it's a bad thing. Oh, he was asking you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, th I think it might be a good thing, although I do recognize that antitrust um, might lend itself more to case-by-case -case adjudication in some other areas. I, I, I'm not opposed to rulemaking. I think that rulemaking in some circumstances can be a very good way of proceeding. Uh, it's uh, a particularly powerful, transformative uh, tool, uh, more so than uh, obviously case-by-case -case adjudication. And that's why uh, people concerned about uh, violations of separation of powers, concerned about a uh, limited administrative state, uh, would say that well, if we're going to have rulemaking, let's at least have that authority uh, clearly conferred, first of all, because it is a big step. And then secondly, let's have it clearly defined, uh, because Congress needs to do its job, not punt its job to agencies which are less accountable. Um, and, and so I think when those uh, requirements are satisfied, rulemaking uh, is much less controversial. And I think Jeff, you know, he makes very good points. Uh, uh, about some of the benefits that it could exist when you have notice and comment rulemaking. He had to say that because I'm the elder. <laughs> <laughs> and wiser. I, I'm a big fan of notice and comment rulemaking myself. Uh, I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense in the antitrust context, however, um, largely because I don't think there's any evidence that courts really know what they're doing in this area. Um, uh, 
uh, you know, uh, we've had um, uh, many, many decades of experience here. We've gone from big is bad and little is good to consumer welfare is the answer to back to big is bad and little is good. Uh, this neo-Brandeisian movement that the FTC seems to have embraced. I think uh, but the, nobody really knows for sure exactly uh, what works and the economy is so dynamic and has a way of sort of uh, washing over practically every uh, stop that the antitrust laws seem to have uh, put in place. Uh, you know, Microsoft was going to be evil, IBM before that was going to you know, monopolize everything and technology just basically rendered all these things moot. So I think case by case is maybe good because it sort of acts as a kind of uh, uh, bump, many, multiple bumps in the road to letting courts uh, do things that turn out to be bad ideas. I think if you read the Posner opinion in that United Airlines case, he discusses that question and, and really frames it in terms of whether or not there had to have been, should have been a right to a hearing during the rulemaking process to to answer disputed issues of material fact. And he decided that there didn't have to be in this particular rule. But he talked a lot about whether antitrust was amenable to rulemaking. By the way, I, I, I'm not an antitrust lawyer. I've had some antitrust case experience over the years. No expert. But uh, as somebody who's observed the courts and the Justice Department and the FTC in this area, I, I will say that if the FTC proceeds with a kind of rewrite of the guidelines that's uh, been talked about together with the Justice Department, I think it'd be a very sad day because uh, Tom's right, and the courts do have uh, limited capacity to deal with uh, antitrust law. The guidelines have been a really respected uh, bipartisan effort for decades that have guided the courts. Uh, but I think it's a grave mistake for the administration to believe that uh, the guidelines can continue to command that kind of respect and deference and yet depart so sharply from the method and consensus which has uh, underlain them so far. It's precisely because they were not uh, perceived as uh, politicized, aggressive, but rather consensual that courts were comfortable uh, giving them weight. All that changes when it seemed to be the exercise of a particular movement coming out of the academy at this moment. Great, any other questions? Right there in the back middle. Yeah, hey. Um, recently there was legislation that has been proposed that would, uh, among other things, um, require certain large social media companies to submit uh, evidence of any harms that the algorithm might cause to the FTC for review. Uh, now, you know, the sort of thing where you give that sort of discretion to an executive agency, um, in addition to things like broadening the rulemaking authority, seems to me to be an opportunity for political incentives to enter into the system and to kind of undermine the notion of consumer welfare, which we've upheld until now. Uh, so, so to what degree do you see this expansion of rulemaking that they're kind of lobbying for uh, resulting in, you know, concerns that really don't have much to actually do with consumer welfare creeping in and changing the way we do antitrust. I mean, if they're just asking for information and to review the information, that doesn't seem too worrying. I mean, there's kind of Paperwork Reduction Act concerns about that sort of thing, but, <laughs> but I mean, other than that, you know, the FTC does engage in a lot of information gatherings so they can figure out, figure out what, what to do. We heard about that this morning with respect to hospitals. So information gathering itself doesn't bother me, what they do with it. And I think the FTC should take some interest in, in, in artificial intelligence, you know, algorithms that are, that are being used because they might be unfair. I guess the issue is that uh, they also have this question to determine exactly what harm is. Um, and that's, the, that's where there's a problem, not in the review of information itself. Yeah, I mean, I would want to know that there's some significant uh, harm, uh, some notable market failure uh, and the like before signing on to something like that. And the, I, I will also say that uh, you know, we've got some internet economy uh, companies that don't have a lot of friends on either side of the aisle right now. 
but I think that ends up being a bad reason to further empower an agency that uh, already raises constitutional questions and, and that uh, is threatening to raise more. On, on the consumer side, the FTC has announced an advance notice of proposed rulemaking under Magnus and Moss procedures, and it's called the Commercial Surveillance and Data Security Rule. It's just a, not even a proposed rule yet, but that's the first one that they've launched in quite a while. All right, well, we are right on time, so everyone please join me in thanking our panelists for coming today.
driver's license, and your permit's going to expire. We're going to get your road test. So literally, we've got a driver's license the day before he went to college. All right, well, I was gonna, I'm moderating, so I don't know if I introduce myself to sit down, but I'm gonna use this mic while, while I can. Um, we have got a, a, a great closing panel to talk about. Uh, so I'm just gonna sit down since I have a mic. Uh, since we've got, uh, we've teed up throughout the day uh, quite a bit on the high level issues of agency structure um, and touched on lots of the issues I think this panel is is, is purposed for uh, up to and including what's happening in part three litigation, um, the sort of big sixty-four thousand uh, dollar question in front of the Supreme Court now at least puts some of the the future of administrative litigation at the FTC into play uh, and, and acts on. Uh, but you've got a whole host of issues I think that both uh, are standalone issues in terms of part three litigation and its sort of cost and benefits on its, on its own, as well as how they fit into the broader uh, structural issues we've been discussing in terms of agency independence um, and some of the constitutional issues raised uh, in the earlier panels. Um, administrative litigation has been, at the FTC, has been a great topic of interest of, of, of mine since my, uh, my old days at the FTC uh, when I learned and then later published that the FTC's win rate, um, and for those of you who are admin law people who follow the SEC cases or the administrative law judge cases from other agencies, this will sound a little bit different, but with the FTC win rate in front of its own agency is, a, is 100%. Um, the agency issue faced in some of the others is the ALJ sort of rubber stamps the, the commission, not, not so much at the FTC. Uh, FTC's win rate in front of now just Judge Chapel used to be eight administrative law judges not too long ago, is uh, above 50, but not much. But when the cases get up to the commission um, where the ALJ has ruled uh, for FTC staff, uh, the commission affirms, where the ALJ has ruled against, the commission reverses. And so you get a situation where um, you know, it's, uh, it's nice to be the FTC staff in front of, uh, you know, home, home cooking's always good. Um, but, but does raise some issues, important issues, uh, where people have paid attention to uh, what's going on with part three process. And you've got a conflation of issues now. You've got Axon about the ability to get Article Three review, sort of independency of um, part three litigation. You've also got two agency losses in specific cases in front of Judge Chapel um, in part three litigation in both Illumina Grail and uh, Jewel Altria. So very, very different cases and uh, we'll talk some about those as well and how they relate to the larger issues of what's happening on the FTC's litigation agenda. And then finally, um, the FTC does what its sister agency does and it goes straight into Article Three court sometimes and tries to win cases the good old fashioned way. Um, and it's got lots of those ar around too. So plenty to discuss in a, a sort of big broad landscape and we've got a wonderful panel we've brought together sort of immediately uh, to my right is my good friend Howard Shalansky, uh, who's professor at Georgetown, partner at Davis Polk, the administrator of OIRA, BE chief economist, all the things, uh, BE chief economist, FCC chief economist, uh, and uh, if you wanted to have somebody here to discuss both competition and administrative law, uh, you, could, you just uh, couldn't do better. Uh, Ashley Baker, Director of Public Policy at the Committee for Justice, uh, on her docket always both antitrust and Supreme Court cases, uh, and we are grateful to have uh, her with us. 
and uh, Gus Hurwitz down on my uh, far right, who I think has been thinking about the administration of antitrust and administrative law for, for a very long time, um, some of his earliest, earliest scholarly work, and now a uh, professor at University of Nebraska School of Law. Um, let's get started, guys. Uh, Gus, there's a lot on the landscape. Uh, from part three to federal court to constitutional issues. Um, would it be unfair to ask you to make sense of all of it for us as an opening question? Let, let's, uh, let's do it because I'm going to cheat and uh, just say you all can uh, go home. You can just watch the recording of Bill's uh, lunchtime talk <laughs> because that's what, how I'm going to frame my, uh, uh, my thinking uh, and my uh, comments to kick things off. Um, because everything that uh, uh, we heard uh, over lunch is exactly right, and I think that's the right way to think about uh, a lot of the uh, litigation challenges. So uh, over lunch, we heard about the agency's relationship to uh, the executive and Congress. Uh, well, in the litigation setting, we're really uh, thinking about the agency's relationship to Article Three and the courts. Um, and we, we have all these terms that we use. Are we originalists or textualists or uh, 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 realists? Or how do we interpret the law? Are we formalists? Um, I think the overwhelming answer is we're pragmatists. When we're talking about the administrative state, the relationship between um, agency I, I, agency adjudication versus Article Three uh, litigation. Um, the reality is the agencies and the courts both know that neither of them is uh, the most institutionally competent in any given case, and it's a balancing act uh, to have the courts delegate agencies to act reasonably, bring reasonable cases, enforce those cases reasonably, uh, and uh, use congressional authority reasonably. And so long as the agencies are doing that, the courts are going to say, good job. What you're doing is reasonable. You are helping keep government functioning. This couldn't work if we, the courts, had to micromanage um, everything that you do, if we had to review everything that you do. So if you're acting reasonably, if you're not abusing the power that Congress uh, uh, gave you, rubber stamp. Um, and over the course of uh, the 20th century, that is how the administrative state evolved and uh, developed. Uh, this was particularly true in the early years of the administrative state, uh, uh, the APA um, mid-century, the ascendance of the legal process school of thought uh, in legal academia. Um, we want to put the uh, decision-making authority in whatever entity is most best able to exercise that authority, um, and that's how the system works. Now, what's happened um, over the last couple of decades, we've seen this at the FTC, we've seen this at the SEC, we've seen this in many agencies, is agencies have started to realize, oh, wait, we've got all of this power that we could use not power that we need to use reasonably, we've got all this power that Congress has given us and the courts have given us this Chevron deference and the APA, we need to go through the entire administrative process before things can get to Article Three courts. We've got all this power, let's use it. Um, so we've seen uh, with the FTC uh, extensive use of settlements and consent decrees uh, to develop bodies of law. That's what uh, uh, Mike was asking about uh, uh, at some level uh, in his questions um, earlier. Um, we have the incredible win, win rate, uh, self-win rate uh, at the FTC. What's going on there? Well, we know what's going on there. Um, and because of the uh, finality requirements, because you need to exhaust all administrative remedies before you can get to Article III courts, um, it makes it really difficult for litigants to, uh, to overcome this great deal of power times deference that uh, the agencies have. So what happens when agencies start to abuse all of that great power they've been given? It's a balancing act. If they're not acting reasonably, the courts are going to start to say, well, we're going to need to tighten uh, our control over you, tighten in the reins. 
And that's what we're seeing with uh, the major questions doctrine, with uh, concerns about dialing in Chevron, and now with Axon. Um, and uh, uh, Jennifer mentioned earlier, uh, we also have uh, the SEC uh, uh, case, um, Cochrane, that uh, have been, they've been paired together uh, in the Supreme Court. Both of these cases go to this question of uh, can Congress by statute uh, uh, require uh, agency uh, parties to go through the entire administrative process before they can get to court to challenge the constitutionality of uh, a uh, agency action? Um, and the, the answer is going to be, I'm very confident in Axon, no, if a uh, agency is trying to exercise unconstitutional authority or possibly, this is how broad will Axon be, uh, uh, is a agency trying to uh, unconstitutionally exercise its authority, you don't need to uh, uh, go through this entire process before you can get to an Article III judge uh, that is, who is able to exercise as a check on the unreasonableness of the agency's conduct. It's all about maintaining this balance. The current system uh, is out of balance, and what we're seeing is uh, uh, we're, we're taking the agencies into the shop to get their tires realigned and rebalanced, um, and uh, the mechanics of the Supreme Court are going to be doing that. Um, I could say more stuff, but uh, that's boring, so back to you, Josh. Let me ask something before I, I move to Ashley. I'm used to, in the... Uh, I guess keeping with the, the car metaphor, in the antitrust world, the rebalancing, you know, the mechanic takes a really long time. Um, we get slow, gradual, sort of case by case uh, changes. And this idea, I think uh, Bill Kovacic said dur during his keynote, you get, you get the deference you earn. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a reading of these cases that makes me the recent losses, both in front of the ALJ and Jewel Altria. Um, the question teed up in Axon and Illumina Grail and I think six losses in federal court pretty fast. Um, and it's been a while since we've talked about a, w a win uh, for either agency. Um, there's an interpretation of those losses that is uh, the world is responding to the agency earning less deference, not in the, the, the formal administrative law sense of the word. But man, that seems like a fast adjustment to me, and so I'm, I'm left at a little bit of a little, little miffed at how quickly that adjustment has happened. Do you read the ALJ losses, the sort of challenges they're facing as a, as a response to something the agency is doing, or to secular sort of outside of our little antitrust yeah. world changes? I interesting question. I, I thought you were going to go uh, in a different direction. Um, I, I think my answer is no. I'd like I, you to ask the question you thought of too. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, I might have already forgotten it. Um, but my, my answer to uh, uh, the question is actually I think no. I don't think that uh, current, that the uh, uh, ALJ cases uh, certainly not, and I, I don't think that the uh, uh, judicial losses are responding yet to this. Um, I think that uh, the, the real judicial slapdowns will come from uh, the Supreme Court uh, primarily, uh, and uh, maybe some circuit court losses on appeal, but I, I think what we're seeing is overly aggressive enforcement actions where you're going to lose because you're bringing bad cases, not because there is uh, some recalibration um, going on. Uh, and I, I think if we look back to the Supreme Court, um, in the early uh, 2000s in cases like uh, uh, Trinco and Credit Suisse, um, where the court was talking about uh, the relationship between antitrust and regulation, um, the, the court kind of expressed two competing uh, uh, ideas, um, which I've argued summed together to be uh, this idea of why call administrative antitrust, that the, the Supreme Court actually would prefer um, the agencies uh, to be developing antitrust norms because there's some lack of comfort with the idea that antitrust is this one exceptional area of the law where we have 
ju uh, judicial federal common law developing these norms. Um, so some preference for agencies like the FTC to be developing uh, uh, new antitrust norms combined with, however, the idea that they wanted more uh, stability in the antitrust law is particularly important compared relevant to, uh, related to uh, all areas of law. Antitrust law, we need stability. Um, and uh, we should have slow incremental development. And that's part of the reason that the Supreme Court uh, had a preference or expressed some preference for regulatory approaches to um, antitrust law instead of having punctuated every five, 10 years, you have a really major court uh, case that gets up to the Supreme Court where something big might happen. We should have more continual, slow development of uh, antitrust law as economic knowledge, uh, the frontier of economic knowledge continues to move. Um, but that's not what the FTC is trying to do. They're not trying to do a slow frontier incremental uh, uh, movement in antitrust law. They're trying to uh, uh, show up and redefine what antitrust law is. And I think uh, the, the court's response to that is gonna be, oh, hell no. We said we trust you to do this slowly and incrementally, modestly. Um, the, the economy depends on stability in this area and you are just disrupting everything. So I think the uh, Supreme Court uh, has in previous cases kind of spoken to uh, the approach I think we're likely to see here. Ashley, similar question uh, to you, sort of with Axon coming, um, administrative apparatus sort of uh, uh, held up for question at the same time you've got the agency sort of running into federal court uh, and, and struggling. It seemed like a pretty important time to have the, the option to do in-house litigation when you're, you're getting beat up in, in Article Three courts and uh, the fight coming to a, a, a head. How do you see those trends running into each other? Well, I mean, for the purposes of the court, I think what's really kind of at the forefront of this is the fact that ultimately the court's deciding, you know, an issue that's related to judicial review, and that's a lot different than something more specific to, you know, what the agency should or should not do, um, even you know, what the statute says, I mean, for, you know, the purposes of Exxon is whether or not a constitutional, a collateral constitutional claim um, should be heard within um, the FTC or not. I, th I think the court will rule pretty clearly on that, and then, you know, you have have these mounting losses outside of the FTC, you have these other challenges, You've, it's become more acceptable just to you know, go straight to federal court and challenge the agency's structure or um, statutory authority, and that's becoming somewhat of a trend, and I can get that to that in a second. Um, but that's because there's going to be you know, more of a win rate there. That's um, a better option, it seems, for some of these companies um, when the alternative is to go in-house first and exhaust that process. And by the end of that process, by the way, there's often not really a company left. Um, if you look at um, LabMD, for example, that is one example of a company um, that was kind of killed by this internal process. Someone used the analogy to me the other day, and I can't remember who um, said it, but it's much like the um, when the Labor um, Secretary Donovan was um, acquitted of um, criminal fraud charges, and he said, well, which agency do I go back to get my reputation? <laughs> um, and that's much like what these companies are you know, um, put in that position of. It's the process itself that's the punishment. And more broadly, we see these issues of judicial review, and it looks more and more to the courts, I think, like the the in-house process is meant to circumvent judicial review um, under Article III courts. You have not only um, the facts and acts on itself, but you have um, outside of the court, you have the Lumina Grell merger challenge, you have the um, Jewel Altry merger challenge. Those are two instances in which the ALJ ruled against the agency um, until very recently. The, it, um, the FTC had gone, I think, 25 years before that had happened. Um, so that's, you know, as Josh was saying, the win rate is astronomical. Um, so the way the court is, is um, approaching this is a bit different. And I think the FTC really has, has underestimated where the court is on these administrative law issues more broadly. Um, I mean, the last time the agency really went full speed ahead in the 1970s with rulemaking, we had the Burger Court, which was you know, more constitutional conservative or whatever you know, label you want to use than the Warren Court, but they were still very reluctant to um, really go against or revisit certain past precedent when it, they had considered that settled law for a long time. Um, this court less so, and there are a lot of lawsuits for it to work with. Howard, let me um, give an equally broad and uh, not so, uh, well, 
two things for you. One, react to anything you've heard. Uh, one thing I've, I've not asked yet, but I think would be useful to put in the discussion is um, why part three litigation anyway? The, the, the story is, I mean, what's, what's the value of it? The story is FTC is gonna do norms creation. Uh, we're gonna be ahead of the curve and create some norms and uh, FTC's had that power around for a, a really long time and I think if you can think of more than one or two cases where the FTC has used part three authority to do norms creation and competition law, then you can think of one or two more than I can. And you can argue about the hospital cases, right? That's the example everyone gives. The FTC was getting, this is a technical term for the audience, but getting their behind handed to them in the hospital cases. They do a study, they fix it, they go to part three, they win hospital cases. You ask defenders of part three uh, litigation, come up with a second example in the room, Goes, goes mostly quiet. Um, the question I think is, is all this fight about part three litigation worth it? We've got the two cases pending now. The agency's not really using it all that much. Uh, maybe they use it in cases where they don't think they can win in federal court anyway. Uh, is all of this worth a candle and respond? Well, I mean, looking at Illumina Grell, which I just mentioned, I mean, it is notable that they filed the case first in federal district court, withdrew there, and then went back and filed it in house. Um, and I think, you know, with that case in the background, it's certainly easy to um, claim some gamesmanship there. And then you know, the FTC's own ALJ ruled that no, that this is not a threat to competition. So um, that didn't work out as they had planned either. Howard, what do you think? Uh, look, I, I think that the Part three structure, you know, obviously it, it's an old statute and there were some very clear motivations for putting the part three option in place uh, in 1914 and subsequently preserving it. Uh, just because there was a sense that antitrust enforcement um, by the Justice Department of the Sherman Act had been lax, uh, you know, in the, in the early days. So I think Creating a more administrative structure, particularly as pertains to mergers, sort of was an understandable thing for Congress to do when they did it. In terms of what the use of Part 3 has been, again, I think you know, there's a very theoretical argument one can make that it's for norms creation. It's for figuring out what that set of behaviors are that will violate Section 5 that fall outside of the Sherman Act. So this sort of, you know, um, ill-defined set of cases that are beyond the Sherman Act and within Section 5. But I think as Josh says, that's not really a place that the, uh, uh, where, where, where part three courts have played a big role. But, but let me just throw this out there as a possibility. The knowledge of parties coming before the agencies that there is this part three administrative option when the agencies are pursuing somewhat novel claims. And again, the list is fairly short. But if we think about invitations to collude, as an example, um, the norm against invitations to collude and the warning shot that parties doing this would be called into the FTC and investigated and possibly put through an expensive um, compliance process and then have to you know, sign a con some kind of injunctive consent decree was backed up by the knowledge that you know, the agency could, if you refuse to play ball, go to part three. So it's possible that part three plays an important role as sort of a last resort that has enabled the agency to do some of the things it's done by settlement. I'll give you another example beyond uh, the invitation to collude cases, which you, know, you can't get to under section one because you, know, you need a completed conspiracy. Um, so that's an area of a maybe true section five conduct. When the FTC was investigating Intel uh, you know, between 20 and 10 years ago, the kinds of loyal dis loyalty discounting issues were not well settled in terms of where they fell under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. And so it was good for the FTC to have the Section 5 authority to go in and look at these share-based loyalty discounts and to sort of push, uh, push Intel uh, to come to some kind of settlement, creating norms that share-based loyalty discounts were gonna attract attention. Again, that didn't go to court, but it could have gone to Part 3, a complaint was drafted. So um, I think that the part three courts may play a role beyond, or the part three process may play a role beyond what is evident from the results of actual ALJ hearings. So that's just 
one thing that I, w that I will throw out there uh, as a possibility. But I do think that the FTC has been very mindful of legitimacy questions uh, it, through a lot of its existence. Uh, there are times the agency has overreached, but it has largely tried to stay, and you know, I like Gus's formulation of this sort of you know, incremental push the doctrine forward um, by you know, putting out policy papers, pursuing initiatives that were very much in keeping with the evolving doctrine, evolving uh, economic thinking, um, and then occasionally you know, go, making some pretty aggressive moves in court, but, but actually being quite successful. You know, until this last run of sort of bad luck, I think there were something like 29 out of 32. I can think of three losses, mm -hmm. Steris, LabCorp, Lundbeck, I have to think back during the Obama administration, but, but not very many. So there was a lot of success in the courts because, things, because the agency was, even if sometimes pushing the boundaries, was staying within the boundaries. Now, I just want to say something about what I think is happening now. I, I don't view this as crazy, reckless overreach necessarily. I think if you were to talk to people making the decisions about bringing the hard cases that the agencies are bringing, and we have a limited sample from the FTC, but if I use the DOJ as an instrumental variable and their, their recent losses in court, I think what they would tell you is we're trying to actually push things back to something we've already evolved from. So we're not trying to push things forward too aggressively, we're trying to go back to a somewhat, we think, more sensible more proven way of doing antitrust enforcement. And they will anchor those, those arguments in the most recent Supreme Court decisions that they see as being relevant. The problem is there has been a lot of common law through the circuit courts and the district courts in the intervening you know, 30, 40 years, whatever time you wanna pick. And you can't simply back up over that. Mm -hmm. And so what is happening is they're running into judges who are saying, okay, but wait, we've got all this circuit law, we've got all this district law, we've got all of this precedent. You can't just back up over those, over those spikes. And so the agency is in a tricky spot. They feel like, the agencies are in a tricky spot. They feel like they want to go to a different mode of analysis. They have a limited time within which to do it, given you know, the way administrations can change. And they're dealing with a common law process that is extremely, extremely slow. Um, if Frank Easterbrook got one thing dead right in his 1985 Limits of Antitrust article, it's that doctrine locks things in and evolves slowly. Now his view was that markets would self-correct really quickly so we should not make doctrinal errors. In the view of the current agencies, and there are areas in which I personally believe them to be, to be correct, um, areas where I don't think they're correct, the doctrine has locked in some pretty uh, heavy burdens on plaintiffs and an anti-enforcement tilt that they want to correct, but what tools do they have? Either administrative tools at the FTC, let's resort to rulemaking, let's resort to novel cases in part three, or taking their chances with, you know, on a flyer with a very aggressive argument in the federal courts that, th that they're going to, to reject. And I think there's a very hard place for the agency to be because I think there just isn't a clear mechanism for the agency to shortcut the doctrinal evolution project process. And I think that's what they're running into with these losses. And I think if they try to do it by rulemaking, I, I don't have the benefit of having heard Bill's speech during lunch, um, so I risk saying something that sounds completely foolish and certainly not as good as what Bill would have said. But, but I think that the agency is walking on extremely, extremely shaky ground when they think that they have rulemaking authority for unfair methods of competition rules as a way of achieving through regulation the doctrinal shift that would take years to occur in court. I agree, and I, I would, for the most part, agree. And I, I would add that there's a big difference between what the FTC and the DOJ are doing right now, though, and that um, the FTC, particularly their focus over the past year, really has been less on bringing cases and more on, I mean, like you said, the FTC has over the years had to rein itself in every two decades or so. Um, they do something that pushes the boundary, and Congress um, kind of gives them a slap on the wrist, and they develop some internal processes and procedures that set some boundaries. And um, for the first year, of the Biden administration, the FTC seemed really focused just on taking down those guardrails, um, such as the 2015 um, Section 5 policy and other um, policies and procedures that they had kind of developed for the, you know, the safekeeping of the entire agency itself. So one 
thing that comes to mind, I'm going to say something that makes me very, very uncomfortable uh, from uh, uh, Howard's comments in particular. Um, one of the challenges that the agencies face right now is we're dealing with different types of firms and different economic theories that are competing in new, novel, hard to understand ways, multi-sided markets, the Yamex case, I expect that's one of the ones you were, you're referring to with the, uh, the, the burdens, um, uh, lots of conglomerate activity, and uh, add in the international competition to regulate and uh, structure these markets. And the thing that I'm gonna say that makes me uncomfortable uh, is I don't know that antitrust is the right lens to look at this sort of behavior um, and even this sort of competitive behavior. I think antitrust law is really good. We've got uh, really well-developed uh, understandings of certain types of behavior and how to deal with uh, clear vertical, clear horizontal uh, uh, conduct. And when we're getting into this more complicated stuff, I worry about uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater sort of concerns when the, the agencies start trying to regulate, enforce, regulate, I'm not sure what the right word is, uh, competition in these new markets uh, uh, that the antitrust agencies, that antitrust law is the right way to do it. And the, the reason that that makes me really uncomfortable is because that uh, kind of, op it doesn't kind of, that opens the door to the question, well, if we're not doing it through antitrust, uh, so, so Horowitz, you're telling us we should be just regulating these industries? And I'm not comfortable with that um, either, but uh, I, I don't know that uh, antitrust uh, that we will be able to get to where we want or need to be in these new markets through a common law or part three or mm -hmm. norms development sort of approach. So let me, I'll, I'll answer, it's, it's, it's a really important point you just made, Gus, and I wanna respond in a couple of ways. So, so the first thing I would say is, I'm not ready to give up on antitrust as being effective for new kinds of industries, new kinds of technologies and, um, you know, the economic activity that may be hard to detect or fully understand for a while. I, I do think that uh, there has to be a willingness to take some risks with antitrust that have not been the direction that the doctrine has gone, um, I would say, since, you know, the early 70s. And so we would have to reverse a little bit of our error cost uh, analysis and not worry so much about over-enforcement. Decide that as a policy matter, we don't know everything that these new technologies might do. We don't know everything about this new economic behavior. But we do know that it should make us more concerned about under-enforcement if we believe that these are going to lead to durable effects on the economy, whether it's durable monopoly, durable path dependency in technologies. And I think that part of what we're seeing the agencies do is actually take that view we are going to shift our presumption in favor of avoiding errors of under enforcement. So we see uh, cases of you know, allegedly nascent co competitors being acquired and challenges to those deals. Mm -hmm. uh, we see concerns about kinds of effects we don't fully understand, this amorphous basket of things called conglomerate effects which might have something to do with bundling or might have something to do with things that are hard to ferret out, but we're gonna worry about them and maybe block some of these deals even without a completely crisp articulation of exactly what harms will happen because we are making a prediction that there will be a substantial lessening of competition based on certain evidence that we might see, maybe it's intent evidence, maybe it's documentary evidence, and we're willing to make that, that prediction and live with our errors if we've made them. So there's a policy choice embedded in all of this that just says we need to kind of tilt antitrust in that direction. And if one accepts those risks and those losses, then antitrust can work. And then we may learn over time that we've made mistakes and adjust it backwards and forward. The other response I'll make is as to regulation, you know, I, I am not a great fan of regulation when there are good options for competition to perform the regulatory function. But I view regulation and competition as, and, and antitrust enforcement as complements. And my concern about regulation is not so much theoretical government centralized uh, intervention as 
just the practical and pragmatic drawbacks and the, the historical track record of rather poor performance of a lot of regulation, I'm speaking about economic regulation. So I tend to like to avoid it where possible. But I think that certain kinds of new industries that are evolving um, are ones where we might see a good complementarity between this antitrust enforcement that's trying to figure out how to gear itself to these industries and certain kinds of regulation. Now, this is where I'm a naive optimist, and you'll tell me I'm crazy, which is I do believe there's certain kind of you know, zero price, light-handed, interconnection, interoperability regulation that can be put in place. Um, I think we've seen that proven out in certain areas of uh, telecommunications regulation and other things. And I have faith that Congress, courts, and a responsible agency will avoid the slippery slope of overreaching and regulating everything, but I recognize that history may not be on my side with that. You can tell your employer is Georgetown, not George Mason, because you immediately lose tenure at Mason. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. the way, it's the way it goes. This is the only time you've ever been on my left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna steal Andy's joke. To them, I'm on, I'm on your right. Okay. Uh, let me, um, I, I like this point about uh, recalibration of policy and sort of what it means. M maybe these cases are, I won't say harder, but you know, different because of the technologies and so forth. And so we get a, a recalibration and you know, you gotta bring some cases and maybe you frame that in terms of the way I think about cost of errors. Maybe you frame it in, in a difficulty of ferreting out the effects because it's, it's, hard, it's hard to know. I think a really interesting but also challenging point for that view is, is the following. Um, there is a case in federal court against the, the every tech company that you can think of, and some you can't, uh, joined by 907 states uh, and suing you, you know, everybody for everything. Um, red states, blue states, the federal government, the FTC's in some of those, the DOJ's in some of those, um, against every tech firm. Clearly under the belief, I, th I think, that under current law, they think they can, they can win. Uh, now, now, those cases will be resolved sometime three Olympics down the road. Um, but here we are now, and I'm wondering what that, any of that means. So some of those are last administration, some of those are this administration. But I'm wondering what any of that means for, to sort of pull this back to the FTC, would the FTC, t t um, if it took its norm creation, sort of article, excuse me, part three process seriously about that recalibration, you would see any of those cases in part three. You don't. You have, um, Ashley made the point, you've got Illumina Grail that started in Fed court and is in part three, you know, on the rebound on accident. And then you've got, um, you know, Jewel Altria, which, which was always there. But they're not these types of cases. Uh, they came in and they, much to my chagrin, tore up the 2015 policy statement. It was like my fourth child. Uh, they, they tore it up on day one and they promised rulemaking and section five actions um, for the reasons we're, we're, you're saying. This is not an attempt at rulemaking. I think everybody paying attention, I mean, FTC came in, they said, we're gonna do a rulemaking. Um, and, and they haven't. We'll, we'll get one, it's late, it's late. Um, but you don't have that sort of action in part three. You don't have it in rulemaking. You got a lot of speeches and you have a lot of cases in federal, in, in, in federal court um, as if they were the DOJ. I, I think that as if they were the DOJ part is significant. Um, and one really significant, um, I tend to focus on kind of the, the non-tech um, cases more so with administrative law implications is the FTC's complaint against Walmart in which they're essentially trying to kind of take the like shoehorn section five into the telemarketing sales rule in order to say that Walmart by facilitating three different types of payment processors and because sometimes those transactions include fraud, um, hold them liable under the TSR, which is quite a stretch of a theory and it certainly not, um, doesn't align with what the, like what Josh said, what the FTC has been talking about, what they've been giving speeches about and what um, those cases are um, outside of the Federal Trade Commission. If you haven't read the Walmart's um, reply to their complaint, it's really a big shot across the bow in terms of saying, you know, the, the FTC couldn't bring this case in the first place. Um, the DOJ 
it has the power to do this. The FTC can't bring a case on behalf of the people of the United States, um, and that the independent litigation authority given to the FTC in the 1970s, that that was unconstitutional because the agency does not act as it did under Humphrey's executor. Um, a really big shot across the bow there that I think um, tees things up for further litigation and makes it more likely that some companies, instead of um, trying to go through the process um, and internally, will just go straight to federal court um, with claims against the entire structure of the agency. You all are looking at me as though you want me to um, say something. Yes, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually had had something they wanted to say, and I just uh, uh, blanked on what it uh, uh, was. Um, so I'm not going to say something until it comes back to me. All right, let me ask, let me ask the, the, the group. Can I, can I respond to your yeah. point, though, about, you know, look, I, think, I do think that the agency, let, let's be mindful that, you know, well, you, you say it's getting late. But you know they haven't they haven't been there all that long. And late in the, the sense on the back end, not the front end. Okay. Late on if they passed a rule tomorrow. Understood. The idea that they're in power when it gets through is tough. questionable, right? Mm -hmm. Understood. But I, I guess what I would say is this: first of all, I have more optimism on that front than you do. And the um, but the second point that I would make is um, uh, rulemaking is hard. <laughs> And especially if you're an agency that's doing a new kind of rulemaking that you haven't done and you realize that you've got the glare like that light right on you, right? So I have a feeling that they're gonna wanna make sure the first rule they put out there is a really good rule, that it's carefully documented, narrowly tailored, will survive all kinds of APA re review. And here's why I think they wanna be very careful about that. They know well that they are gonna get a challenge to their authority if it's a competition rule, even if it is the most sympathetic, well-wrought, rule against non-competes for unskilled labor or something like that, things that you know, deprive people of their livelihoods unjustly. You know, you're a sandwich maker, you get a 15 hour, jo hour, hour job and you can't work at another sandwich store, ridiculous, right? They wanna have a rule that's carefully documented, carefully analyzed and very sympathetic so that when it gets struck down on authority grounds, they can say this is absurd that we don't have the authority to do that. So I think they are being very, very careful and strategic at least I have no knowledge, I should be clear, like I have zero behind the scenes knowledge. I just speculate that there's some smart people at the FTC. We may disagree with many things they do, but they are smart people. I'm hoping that they are strategic in that way and that explains the delay. If that's not what's happening, then I think you're right. It's too late and they have a real problem. So I, uh, I, I thought, Howard, this is where you were going to go. I'm glad that you didn't because this is why I had wanted to say before. Uh, so what, one thing that I think we need to recognize uh, on the delay side is they uh, didn't have a three commissioner majority um, until relatively right. recently. Um, and uh, in the last couple of months, we've started to see stuff uh, uh, start to roll out. I expect, as Howard suggests, we are going to see uh, probably in the next month or so a UMC rule uh, a proposal on uh, non-competes. Um, the uh, agenda for the next uh, open com uh, uh, commission meeting was released today. It has three more ANPRs. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're definitely starting to push through a much more aggressive uh, rulemaking. Uh, uh, Going back to um, the uh, Howard's previous uh, points about um, the the commission acting as a normal entrepreneur and developing uh, uh, things in this area and more optimism there, I, I'm I'm not unsympathetic to that, but I think that the commission has a real problem, and this administration is a real problem if they want to have uh, respect from the courts uh, as they go through that process, which is they are fire-spitting activists on these issues, and they're not, uh, if you look at a lot of the issues that they're concerned about, they're not traditional competition-style issues, especially when we're talking uh, on uh, the, the, the labor side of issues. They want to restructure, reprioritize us away from the consumer welfare to some broader public interest uh, uh, welfare concept that's nebulous. And I, I expect the courts are going to, if they were trying clearly to be a, a good shepherds of the antitrust law and push into these new areas, um, they would be more likely to uh, uh, get a warmer reception. And 
Regarding APA challenges to rulemaking, I mean, you can tell that the agency is cognizant of the potential for APA challenges because, I mean, just look at the questions that are in the RFIs. They're a lot different than um, previous administrations. It's, you know, give us examples of why this is the correct policy um, and, you know, do we have the statutory authority to do what we are planning to do here? And it, that doesn't mean there would necessarily be a good rule coming out of it. Um, I mean, hopefully there would be. I, I have my own doubts, but um, it seems like they're certainly um, setting things up because they know that it will be challenged, and that doesn't mean that they're necessarily taking into regard all public input either. Howard, I, mean, I guess I would just respond. I, I, I do think that um, you know I want to respond to the fire spitting activist <laughs> comment. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, look, I, I think there's some truth to the fact that they are activists, whether what they're, they're spitting is fire or, you know, truth is, you know, in the eye of the beholder or, you know, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, I, I, I do think, though, there's a big difference between the activism in the speeches in uh, a lot of the uh, uh, policy priorities that are being announced and what you actually see when you read the complaints. Um, so first a disclosure, I provided legal advice to Facebook now Meta during the course of their FTC investigation. Uh, so I probably know too much about what went on behind the scenes, but if you read the complaint, it, it is utterly conventional. The, the only thing that's odd about it is it may be a bit underwhelming. Um, you know, these are kind of substantial lessening of competition from two mergers dressed up as a series of conduct that, con that constitutes a Section 2 violation. I, I don't see a lot of fire, um, you know, and, and Jeb Bozberg will decide, Judge Bozberg will decide how much truth. Um, but again, you know, I think that, you know, to the credit of the agency, I, you know, will not talk about all of the things they consider. It was a serious investigation that they undertook under relatively conventional criteria. Um, I think if you look at even some of the complaints in the cases that the DOJ and the FTC mm -hmm. have lost, like let's take Illumina Grail. You know, look, the, 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 the vertical foreclosure theories that were at stake in Illumina Grail were, were, were not crazy. They were boundary pushing because of the amount of speculation, of the amount of forward-looking prediction that had to be uh, sort of premised on that. Ditto with the sort of information, um, uh, abusive information theory on the vertical aspects of the DOJ's United Health Care change. And again, I just know what anyone knows from the outside on those cases. But, but I don't see, I see sort of pushing a harder line, taking some risk, but I don't see sort of the kind of crazy activism that I would expect to get a court really riled up. But where I do see the activism potentially being a liability is just this. In the atmospherics of how any court is going to think about the FTC's or DOJ's level of judgment in bringing a case. And there's always a little bit, especially at the pleading stage, of you know, how much caution, care, judgment, how well thought out is this? When you overstep sort of the norms by a large amount of what established doctrine is, what established precedent is, or just what is within the scope of what the agency should be thinking about. You know, all right, you, want, you care about the labor, you care about the environment, you care about diversity, equity, and inclusion. What, how do you pull those into an antitrust analysis? And when they start to think that you are engaged in not just mission creep, but mission leap, you really do start to lose, you know, it gets to the, the, the deference you earn point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They will step back and say, we're not gonna give you deference, not just on these broader, crazier things, but even on the things that are more narrow because we question your judgment. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think a lot of the sort of rhetoric about every antitrust agency before us has failed. Uh, the doctrine is disaster. Every economist who ever flew in and out of the city of Chicago shall hereby be banned and canceled. I mean, all right, I'm obviously way overstating, but there, there's a flavor of that. And that tends to lead to a question about judgment, about what you're really after. And just when it comes to the FTC, it's, one has to be very careful. When you move beyond the confines of what the statute tells them to do, you start to develop this impression of a five-member commission making decisions about how to allocate welfare or what values to be pursued, and people start to get the feeling that, okay, now you're not just being aggressive on antitrust. You're treading into the prerogatives of things that should be decided by demo representative democratic institutions, and that's just not a bunch of, you know, 
people with particular views on the Constitution, that sort of people watching an agency making decisions about their lives and about values that they actually want to make for themselves or have their representative electives make through the legislative process. And that's where I think the agency could run into real difficulty if that activism really hit hit the road in terms of some of the complaints they filed. This raises for me, I'm going to so steal creep versus leap, that's, that's happening. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but this raises for me a, a little bit of what I think is, a, is an interesting puzzle that I'm going to try to get you all to, to solve for me, which is if I were an agency wanting to move the law, um, I've got a couple of choices available to me. Run into Article Three courts, make circuit splits, sort of make law the old-fashioned slow way, a la um, John Liebowitz's FTC in the reverse payment cases, right? Slow, get it done. Um, maybe didn't get all they wanted, but got, got some of it. One way is the Article Three courts, and they're, they're, they're losing there. And I, I agree with your characterization of the complaints in entirety. There's, um, if they're, they're not losing because the complaints are wild and wooly, they're not proving the facts alleged in, right. in the complaints, mm -hmm. and you don't, you don't win that way. But Article Three is one route. Rulemaking's another, and, and we'll get some of that, but I, I, probably you're right. The first will be a, you know, sort of tamer rule to try to establish some authority. But what I was told in FTC lore since I was a young child was the purpose of, that's all we talked about at the table. Uh, uh, we, we talked about the Telecom Act. That's right. Was, was this was what part three was for. Part three was for, um, you, you want to stretch your predictions in these tough cases. You want to work in some, you know, not straight economic welfare, but sort of fuzzier thing. You write the opinion. You've guaranteed yourself 100% of the time you will win. That's nice work if you can get it. You, you write the opinion yourself. You use all of the expertise of the agency. You muster all of the expertise you can and channel it through the opinion and send it to a court of appeals in an attempt to persuade them. Mm -hmm. I'm a little bit, I think the puzzle is, why not? The other two are really hard. Doing it in court is hard and they're losing. Doing it in rulemaking is really hard, and they're going to lose. That's my view. Uh, your mileage may, may vary. The other thing is right there. And I don't like the other thing, right? I got in trouble as a commissioner for saying, we're ruling for ourselves all the time. This is stupid. Please, Congress, take the authority away. So like my bias is sort of fully on the table. But if I were giving advice to them on how to win, it would make me sad if they did this. But why not use part three? I'll just add a fourth option to the table, um, which is uh, learn lessons about the industry, either using a uh, whole other set of issues as 6B studies, or sure. just do your own studies, uh, or take the cases that you're bringing and losing, um, and go to Congress and ask for statutory change uh, in your authority. So just uh, going back to one of the original understandings, 1914, of what the commission uh, uh, was intended to do. Uh, we, we heard earlier about the, the compromise that altered this. Um, but uh, uh, investigate and bring uh, problematic conduct to Congress for authority to act. Um, I don't have a good answer for why they don't take that approach, because uh, I, I that is, I think, a approach that I would champion if you're going to be bringing cases that way. If you have that authority and you are going to use it, um, that's how you would do it. I agree with you. I think it's problematic authority and problematic uh, for the agency to actually proceed that way. But strategically, it seems right. I think that's a good point regarding 6B studies, um, which are, are a particularly useful and informative tool, um, and other tools they have at their disposal. Sure, as far as you know, going to Congress, I mean, hypothetically, sure, that makes sense, but if the bet is whether or not Congress is actually going to pass legislation, usually it's no, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't have a great answer for why the authority hasn't been used more, but I mean, I think there, there may be a couple of reasons. I mean, certainly if there had been a presumptive recourse to part three, particularly on conduct matters, 
the FTC really could have developed a body of what this Section 5 law of unfair method of competition mean that would have addressed a lot of really complicated kinds of conduct. Um, that, it, you know, whether it's unilateral refusals to deal or predatory pricing or, um, you know, how we treat sort of, you know, cross-network effects on platforms or bundling, all, all these are kinds of things that I think could have, that would have been a very useful thing to do. The, a couple of reasons that there could be concerns about, and, and if really good opinions then would have been effectively something for courts to review and decide whether or not to give deference uh, to those decisions because what you're interpreting is what section five means, not section one or not se or section two. And I would really like to have seen that very careful kind of development. Um, I think that a couple of the reasons that we, you know, and, and other than you know, going into court to get injunctions on mergers, maybe that should have been you know, where the agency did must, much, of its, much of its work. We, but when you think about, that takes a long-term kind of planning and thoughtful approach. You know, you have to pick areas of policy that you want to develop, you have to identify the cases, and you have to hope you have the commission that is going to have sufficient consensus to get the opinion out that's going to steer that law in the right place. And that may be something that within the incentives and time frame of a particular chair or a particular commissioner, um, you know, feels like a very difficult thing to do, but it really takes some very systematic, um, I, I think, thought and planning. And then, of course, you know, there's a, tendence, a temptation to say, let's take that out of part three and do it by consent decree or settlement. Because if we come up in front of the wrong judge, we lose it. And it could take a long time to find another case and hope that it winds up in another circuit. But of course, it's not going to, because once you lose in one circuit, the losing party is always going to take it to that circuit. Um, so I think that it, as a matter of legal development, it might have just been viewed as, as risky uh, in many cases. There's a, another aspect um, that uh, we, we can suss out from this. The Department of Justice is an enforcement agency. That, that is what their identity is. Um, the FTC, uh, as a independent agency uh, uh, governed by the APA and as well as the FTC Act, um, they have quasi uh, legislative and judicial functions. They have a mixed identity. And when it comes down to, when it comes time to execute your strategy for whatever it is that you are trying to do, well, what is it that you're trying to do? Are you trying to win cases? Are you trying to enforce the law? Are you trying to uh, uh, develop new law? Are you trying to push uh, the norms? Different uh, commissioners will have different views on what their personal goals are, what uh, the goals of the agency are. Uh, and of course, you'll have a changing cast of commissioners um, over time. Uh, so you're going to have inheriting priorities or inheriting things that have been queued up pursuant to previous commission's uh, uh, priorities. So figuring out how you actually want to dispose of the cases is uh, a really uh, a much more complicated uh, equilibrium than for a pure enforcement agency or a pure mm -hmm. legislative uh, entity. So we've got the three pending, sort of emerging out of that process now, right? At different stages, right? You've got Axon in the Supreme Court, you've got uh, Illumina Grail, and you've got Jewel Altria, sort of, with both with ALJ losses, sort of going to the, uh, coming to a commission near you uh, soon. Uh, we sit here a year from now. I mean, we'll get the Axon opinion uh, uh, well before that. But we sit here a year from now, we'll do this sort of as a two-parter as we get close to, to wrapping up. Um, we sit here a year from now, what's the state of FTC Part 3 authority with those three all sort of moving along? Um, and let me put as Part 2, and this sort of begs the question of your view of what's, what's at stake in Axon, is a you know, narrow or broader versions of what might, what might happen there. Um, but part two of the question is, if your answer involves a, a sort of shrinking of part three authority, um, we running into why have the FTC questions? If, you know, we've got, 
no, no rulemaking after a year or none, none you know, if they, if they lose that, that authority, um, are we running into the, the sort of oldie but goodie antitrust question? We've got two agencies. Why? One of the traditional answers is, um, and an answer I, I very much believe in, is the FTC has got and was intended to have this special authority to do um, part three. They've either abused it or not used it over the sort of 100-year experiment. Uh, they've got the Section 5 UMC authority. Maybe they'll use it for rulemaking. Maybe a year from now a court will say, no, you can't. Um, are we... Are we running it? Is that the subject of next year's, year's conferences? Rulemaking's dead. Part three is uh, dying. Should we just sort of kick the uh, antitrust authority into one agency? I won't make you tell us which one. I mean, I, I think what's going to come out of the court next on it, I mean, it is going to be relatively narrow. It depends on who writes a concurring opinion in Exxon and what it says, really. Um, I, I think there will be a lot of you know, conversations surrounding that. It depends on what sorts of cases the agency continues to bring. Um, I mean, if they keep going in the direction they were with you know, the complaint against Walmart, for example, which, I mean, that's not in-house, that's in federal court, but um, that sort of creative claim, I don't see this um, ending very well for them in a year from now. Um, but I, I don't think the Exxon opinion itself is going to be very broad in scope. So there are a, po a number of possible outcomes in Exxon. I'll, uh, mention a, a couple of them in a moment, but I, I think that my bottom line is I don't think it's likely to affect the part three question. So possible uh, outcomes, first uh, the court uh, could say, uh, no, Axon, sorry, you need to, we're not going to uh, uh, alter this uh, uh, statutory framework. There is no right to get uh, your constitutional challenges before uh, this, uh, Article III judge uh, uh, prior to exhausting your administrative remedies. Um, that certainly is possible. I think it's very unlikely. Uh, the court narrowest holding could say, yes, there is, remanded down to uh, the district court judge, and in another five years, we'll uh, uh, deal with Humphrey's executor. Uh, the court could uh, be broader, and the, the goal of Axon and uh, uh, several others in similar challenges is to uh, challenge Humphrey's executor and the constitutional structure of the agency. Um, and I uh, agree with the discussion earlier today. Uh, I don't think that Humphrey's executor uh, is nearly as magical or has the weight that we tend to give it. I don't think that we would mm. substantively see much change. Um, the another possible outcome from Axon, and this is where I think the most interesting possible uh, uh, set of developments would be, um, is uh, you do have the authority to uh, challenge not just the structure of the agency, but raise any constitutional challenges uh, to uh, uh, the agency's underlying theory and case in which case we are going to see a whole lot of folks uh, raising major questions doctrine uh, 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 issues before district judges. Um, and that has the potential, I think, to uh, be the most disruptive and would go potentially to limiting the overall scope of the agency's authority. Um, and yeah, the, the age old, the, the antitrust chestnut of um, one agency or two I, I think that that is a question that has been and is going to continue to be on the table. Um, uh, if, you, if the uh, commission isn't acting uh, as a norm entrepreneur or a research, uh, a de facto research arm of the antitrust establishment uh, and is really just an enforcement agency, it uh, doesn't make that much sense to have two. And now, of course, the, the real challenge, I, I do think that um, uh, on my, I started my career DOJ side of things. Um, I, I actually do think the commission is a better body for uh, antitrust enforcement. The challenge, of course, is the criminal side of antitrust uh, uh, is going to have to stay with uh, the DOJ, which means that you have uh, two separate agencies or you need to have some curious uh, interagency coordination uh, to address that. We are close to out of time. Let me give each of you a chance to uh, offer up 
uh, any closing remarks you would like or, or observations that you haven't uh, been able to get to, and then we'll maybe do, do one or two questions and um, run to the reception. I'll just uh, say Bill is much more eloquent than I am, so you should listen to what he said. And Howard is more eloquent than I am. I don't agree with him on everything that he said, but I'll, I'll nonetheless say you should listen to everything that he said. I'm just here. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, we can do a question. Anybody got a qu have a question? We've got in the back. It's hard to see through those lights. It really is. Uh, this is a question for uh, Professor Shalansky. Um, in the debate over whether the Democratic majority on the on the commission is, are activists or fire-breathing activists. You, uh, you pick the, the former uh, because they haven't really pushed the envelopes of the law much. Um, but do you feel the same way with regard to rulemaking authority, that they're, they're not fire-breathing because they're not really pushing the law, the, uh, law much? Well, and I, I don't mean a spe the specifics of the rule, but as to having rulemaking authority. Yeah. So I certainly don't mean to call into question the passion of the activism at the agency. I want to make that very clear. And just um, sort of the difference between the rhetoric and what's happening on the ground. Um, I think the jury's out. I think we have to wait and see what they do. Uh, I do think that they are taking a very confident view of their authority. Um, that, you know, in light of recent developments at the Supreme Court, West Virginia against EPA, but even really uh, a lot of the developments of the past decade uh, in administrative law is... I think a somewhat heroic view, but if they don't take that view, why even bother with the rulemaking? So again, uh, I think what they're doing is taking a strong view of their authority, but I, I predict we will see a careful and cautious um, and, and uh, more, uh, more of a steady approach and, and not something you know, crazy or, or really too bold when we see the first rulemaking, which, which I think is the right way to go. So passionate, confident, but not fire breathing. So. I'll also just I'll echo that point about, uh, I, I agree 100% uh, where the first rulemaking, UNC rulemaking that we see, I expect is going to be narrower and on a particular, particularly sympathetic topic. Um, I, I think that that is absolutely right. Um, uh, and strategically, it is the, the right thing to do. Um, and I don't know if it's a cooler heads prevailing. I don't know if it's a, a, a solid strategy. I don't know if it's truly reflective of the uh, scope of their ambitions, but th that's correct. I reserve and the right to, qu oh, um, you first. Oh, I, I was just going to say that I agree we'll see something more sensible first. It's also easier, it's just easier to write a rule um, of that yes. sort. Yes. Reserve the right now to uh, ask the fire breathing question after the first Robinson Patman enforcement uh, case that comes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, just to comment on that's actually going to be really interesting. Um, and if you read Commissioner Bodoya's speech on the Robinson Patman Act, it sort of calls up the whole, you know, he's not, he's a very smart, terrific guy, um, but not an antitrust person. And so he, I don't know how much depth um, uh, 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 Alvaro has in the history of Robinson Patman and why the doctrine has evolved as it has, but um, when you read his speech, it certainly is a, something of a throwback. And it's gonna be you know, very interesting to see where they go with Robinson Patman and how they negotiate some of the clear problems they're gonna run into when they realize that in some cases this is gonna mean raising prices to huge numbers of consumers. So that's gonna be a, an interesting test of the fire. I'll just add to that. Um, we've been talking about norm setting and pushing boundaries, uh, changing antitrust law, uh, updating and modifying it, however you want to think about this. Um, there's a, a real puzzle with this if uh, how whatever new rules are being developed aren't being reduced to rules, but you proceed through part three uh, litigation, mm -hmm. which is you're not getting the body of common law. Yes. You're ending up with all of these old Supreme Court cases and interpretations of old statutes and zombie statutes that are still out there that we've never done away with because the, the law on the ground has moved on. So then you can have people come in and say, well, there's, there's this 
really old statute that hasn't been enforced in 40 years, but it's still good law, let's use it. And that creates a lot of uncertainty um, for uh, uh, industry, it creates a lot of challenges and uncertainty for lawyers, and it creates real puzzles for uh, uh, lower court judges who their hands are tied by the law as it exists, not the law that's been developed uh, internally by an agency that hasn't been reduced to rules. Right, and that's also why the bipartisan um, antitrust modernization um, commission did um, recommend the repeal of Robinson Patman. Um, and unfortunately, I, mean, I guess this is wishful thinking that we can just repeal laws that are bad laws and not just kind of shelve them and hope that someone doesn't um, take it and run with it four decades later. But that seems to be the case here. Tad, you have the the rights to the last question of the day. Yeah. And particularly where the factual context would, would, would you know, contradict that approach better than almost any other case I can make. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, Illumina Grail, and again, I don't know all the facts, and you know, certainly the European Commission has come out differently, so you know, there may be facts that are more compelling that I'm, that I'm unaware of. But, but I would just say this. It, it does look on the surface like it was a, a risky case to bring because you're, you're trying to do two things. You're trying to push back on vertical where there's, there are more plausible efficiencies, I'll put it that way, and you're dealing with this almost sort of nascent technology that itself had some competitors, um, you know, th th in unrelated technologies for multi-cancer uh, multi detection. So, uh, so it seemed like they were biting off a lot there. Um, and it seemed risky, but I would just say this about vertical. The icon that they're smashing there is the presumption of efficiencies from reduction of double marginalization. And I think the argument that they would make is this has been too readily and reflexively presumed to allow vertical mergers through. We need to push back on that because there have been vertical harms that have been undetected. Clearly we're missing something by focusing on that efficiency. And so they're gonna overshoot the mark on some cases because, you know. It's true, there's a lot less reduction of, you know, elimination of multiple margins than has been presumed, but there still is sometimes elimination, maybe even often, of multiple margins, so that, you know, you can overshoot in pushing back. And so I, I understand the instinct to look more carefully at vertical. They just haven't found the ana full analytical picture that I think fills in and replaces what was there before. I, I don't necessarily begrudge them for trying to be more aggressive there, but agree with you that you want to pick those cases carefully. So you don't come up with a per se rule against vertical deals. And with that, a um, couple of things really quickly. Uh, thank you all of the uh, CSAS and GAI folks who have helped all day, uh, to Jen and uh, Mascot and Adam White, uh, and to all of our speakers. Uh, there is a reception I don't know if I'm pointing the right way, so ignore <laughs> the pointing or just feel like it's this way. Um, to the Chinese room, it is right now for an hour. You are all welcome uh, to come. And please uh, thank me, join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.